Hour brought to you by Cars for Kids. It's Pick 6 with Mully and Hall, where we debate the top six sports stories of the day and then open it up to you, the Chicago sports fan. Call us at 312-644-6767, or you can tweet your thoughts at Mully Hall. Pick 6 with Mully and Hall starts now. All right, based on Tuesday night's performance against the Diamondbacks, factoring in his previous three starts, what's the right thing to do with Kyle Hendricks now, especially with Jamison Tyone set to return? Well, I don't know that the right thing is to uh, sit him down, but I would skip a start. I think, you know, maybe create a false, you know, reason to put him on the 10-day IL and just let him kind of get himself together. But I don't know that you keep rolling him out there. And if you do, I don't know how long you keep doing that because it hasn't changed and hasn't gotten better. And he doesn't look like he's got it. And he's given up home runs and he's struggling. I I think it's all fine and well to kind of give a nod to how he's done before and to say he's going to be fine. And I heard Jed kind of do that. I just don't know how often you can keep going with it. And maybe it's different when you're back home. Maybe you feel more comfortable with it. But I wouldn't. I, I think he needs I think he needs to to kinda take some time. I don't think he's ready to go. No, he's not ready, unfortunately. I mean, who doesn't like Kyle Hendricks? You know, good guy, part of a great team always been kind of taking some hometown discounts if you will wants to be here you want him around says all the right things great with the media great with the fans but unfortunately you know father time is undefeated it just seems like it's time it seems like you know Jed Hoyer needs to walk out to the mound and take the ball away this is this is above Craig Council's head even and I think the first thing you do is he has a forearm strain or he's got a calf or he's got a something. And then our guest at nine o'clock, Tommy Hadovy, can try to work with him and get him right. The, the, the Cubs are fortunate that they do have some young arms, but right now when you're a team that's competing for this division, you know, that's a game that, that yesterday's game was the one game I was confident on paper that the Cubs were going to win. Now we've had two incredibly wild games the bullpens are completely taxed for both sides, not just the Cubs side. And you got Jordan Wicks today, who hasn't been exactly lights out. So it's going to be very interesting to see what they do. But I think um, we've seen the last of Kyle Hendricks, at least for a little bit. Two games on this road trip where they feel like they should have won and they blew the lead. First one in San Diego, now last night. You score 11 runs, you should win. Kyle Hendricks is a problem right now, and it's been... A while since you've had to say that, but it's reality they have to face. And whether it's a stint on the injured list or demotion to the bullpen, I don't know how you put him out there again. He's given up seven home runs in 17 innings. His career rate is one home run per nine coming into this season. Last year, he gave up 137. Uh, he gave up 13 home runs in 137 innings. Thank you, Tony and Drackey from Marquee. Those numbers summarized well that Kyle Hendricks doesn't have it yet. Maybe he'll get it. It doesn't matter. It's increasingly clear that it doesn't matter to Craig Council who starts games, when people come in, the victories in five innings, and all he wants is 27 outs to be gotten by somebody, the outgetters. Is Kyle Hendricks one of your 13 best outgetters in the organization? I think so. But I don't think it's a guarantee, especially with Jameson Tyon slated to make his season debut Thursday night against the Marlins at Wrigley Field. That gives you more options. Don't demote Assad. Don't do anything with Ben Brown. Shoda is doing lights out work. And then you get Jordan Wicks today. If he has a strong outing, you have a real issue on your hands with, with Kyle Hendricks. It's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. And it's why Craig Council came here to handle the uncomfortable but necessary decisions. As a leader, I think you shy away from those questions. 
That's the voice of Jed Hoyer. How much did Jed Hoyer's cautious assessment of Seiya Suzuki's oblique strain give you pause when evaluating how the Cubs will manage without him? Who will return first to contribute? Suzuki or the ace of the staff, at least going in, Justin Steele? I think the fact that this is even a question is a problem because 10 days on the I.O., we talked yesterday about, well, you know, it must not as bad as last year's and it's a different side and different circumstances. Last year it was a swing. This year he was running. And then you hear Jed Hoyer, and I didn't hear a lot of reassurance. I didn't hear a lot of, well, it's going to be okay. I heard a lot of I don't know, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of honesty, and that's a problem because Seiya Suzuki – Injured himself last year in spring training. This year, two weeks into the season, maybe he just doesn't do early seasons well. I'm not quite sure. And Jed was honest about that. Is it something they do? It is something about Seiya's makeup. What is it that's causing this annual occurrence, it seems? It's a problem. I wouldn't be surprised if Justin Steele is back before Seiya Suzuki is back. And while that's good for the bullpen, or it's good for everyone in the pitching staff, not so good for the Cubs lineup. So this is something I expected to have more answers to this morning, especially after hearing from Jed. But I think right now his cautious assessment makes you a little bit more concerned. That's fine. You know, be cautious, right? What do they say? Like <clears throat> under deliver, right? And, you know, let's get this guy back. He'll be back. I, I have faith that he'll be back. I just hope when he gets back, he gets back to where he was. That's that's the bummer, right? Like he was playing really well. We kind of kidded around yesterday about you know potential National League MVP, definitely Cubs MVP. Maybe is there a difference? Is there not a difference? Um, but yeah, you want Justin Steele back ASAP. I mean, the guy pitched what four and a half innings, and he was out. And that's supposed to be the guy that's taking the ball every fifth day, and he's he's your guy. And he's he's throwing some bullpens. So we'll hear a little bit. Here's the thing. We'll have a better gauge on this question at 9.05. Like, I think Tommy Hotovy can give us a better idea where Justin Steele is at because he's been out there. He's not. It's not like Justin Steele is sitting still. He's been working out. He's been exercising. He's been throwing bullpens. So I think he is closer than Seiya Suzuki. Yeah, I hope you are correct, sir. I hope he is. Um, it was really interesting to hear Jed because he said that last year uh, the time frame was such that it was like the first spring training game or uh, the first workout, whatever, where it was one swing and it was a significant deal where he injured himself. He had a moderate strain as he does now with one strain, with one swing. And he missed 48 days total, I believe. Um, and that would yeah i don't know that you can he, he basically was saying that because it was the start of spring training he you know he wasn't back it was the first swing and then all of a sudden he's out for a while and and that had to do with kind of would he have four games in iowa something like that he had to ramp back up because he missed all the spring training um this might be different you heard uh the manager craig council say four weeks I assume that's four weeks from today. I don't know if that four weeks would include a rehab start. I think, you know, being as if, if you're, you know, you, when you heard the thing initially and you heard the, you saw what happened, you, you kind of projected that maybe it would be June one, right? That, that he may miss time until June 1st, which you better have steel back by then. But I think I'm going to go with they got a four game set at Milwaukee starting on May 27th. I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with aiming for that one to try to get him back rehabbed and up and running for May 27th so he can do some damage in Milwaukee. I'll take your questions. I don't have, I don't have much to say about this. Ooh, okay. Which White Sox starter will fare better in the doubleheader later today at 35th and Shields against the Royals? Eric Fetty or Jonathan Cannon? And if Cannon excels after Nick Nestrini did Monday night, how long before the Sox go to the minors and call up another top pitching prospect like, let's say, Drew Thorpe? 
Well, I think what's fascinating is Nick Nostrini, the the um, the gift he gets, the prize that he won is a game Sunday at Philadelphia. He gets <laughs> he gets to pitch that lineup. Oh, that's nice. But um, that's kind of the that's the gift. You hope Cannon is good enough to stay up and remain in the rotation. That would be nice. And uh, as far as Eric Fetty is concerned, I think I think Cannon will do better just because this is his first MLB start. I think he's going to be shot out of a cannon. He had a weight, you know, ready to go yesterday. And I think he'll do very well. I don't think Eric Fetty has been god-awful. I think he'll remain in the rotation. I think they've they have solved their rotation issue for the time being, hopefully. If Destrini can hold up, and if Cannon looks good enough and can get another start, then I don't know that you need Drew Thorpe right away. So I might hold off on bringing him up and getting him into the rotation. You might be able to get through a couple rounds uh, with these guys. So I, I, I would postpone that a few weeks. Yeah, one, one step at a time. I mean, I'm I'm really interested to see Jonathan Cannon, as we joked about yesterday. What a great name to be a pitcher, right? Like Michael Stonebreaker. You, you talk about you play middle linebacker. Best name your for last a linebacker name ever. Stonebreaker, right? Exactly. How awesome is that? Brock Spack was pretty good. Which one? Brock Spack. Okay. Yeah. Purdue linebacker, coach of Illinois State. Yeah. I mean, Brock not, Spack. Yeah. It's not bad, pretty, but it's not Stonebreaker. Good. It's, it's Stone, not Stonebreaker. Yeah, okay. Stonebreaker is pretty good. Going way awesome. back for Stonebreaker. You know, yeah, I mean, he was on the same roster as the single worst name in the history of football, which is Lindsey Knapp. <laughs> Knapp, wake up! What about NASCAR di- driver Dick Trickle? Not good. People love that. Or, t- or Lions uh, tight end Harry Colon. <laughs> anyway, Jonathan Cannon, what a great name for a pitcher. Right, I, like that's the guy you want to see. That 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 that's the attraction. That's the reason to tune in. So um, I hope for the Sox sake that Cannon is good and Nastrini was good enough, and maybe they've got some pitching coming up. Maybe, maybe they'll develop a pitcher because they sure as heck can't develop a hitter. What is going on with the guy that I used to want the Cubs to trade for, Andrew Vaughn? I don't what know. What the heck happened? He's to a big question. Third overall pick. Big disappointment so far. Crochet, Soroka, Fetty, and then who? Maybe Jonathan Cannon, maybe Nick Nestrini. Soroka. I I said Soroka. Soroka, Crochet, Fetty, then who? And then... Nestrini, and then um, what's his name? Cannon. Okay. Uh, I'm saying that's five. (laughs) I know. All right. I'm just saying, yep, I think that uh, Drew Thorpe can probably have to wait and bide his time. Well, no, that's a good question. Uh, it was the voice of DeMar DeRozan. Let's move over to the Bulls. The Bulls listed both Io DeSumo and Andre Drummond as questionable for tonight's play-in versus the Hawks from Atlanta. Which guy is more needed in the game and why? And how about uh, Batim being out the rest of the season with a detached retina of the right eye? Yeah, that's a bad injury. I don't know how he got that. It sounds like it hurts. Um, I think that Io is the obvious answer, but I don't know if... Andre Drummond not playing could really hurt their rebounding and their interior defense. I, I think Io is the obvious answer, but it's also Trey Young is compromised. He's coming back and he played. Yeah, you know, he's not played uh, like he has before the injury in the final three games of the season. He's only averaged about 15 points a game since returning, and you wonder if he's going to be at full strength. If he's at full strength, you need Io. But Io's not going to be at full strength, so maybe they wash each other out. I think Andre Drummond could be a factor, and he makes such an impact in such limited minutes that I think he's he's the guy I would like to see. I mean, Io, they have options. I know, I know the, the defense is great, but I think of the two, if I had to pick one to play tonight of, or have available, I would pick Andre Drummond. Yeah, I would agree with you, David, on Andre Drummond because the Atlanta Hawks are awful at defending the inside. We say, well, just you know, go to Vooch. Well, the problem is Vooch doesn't really like to hang out inside all that much. I think Alex Caruso can do what Io does um, on defense, so I think you could get away with that. But I think Drummond would be more valuable against the Hawks because I think he can make the Hawks pay with an inside presence. 
I think the problem that you have with Atlanta is the fact that they can knock down threes. And the Bulls, obviously, as a real kind of scary ability against the team like the Bulls. So they've got to defend the three. Uh, I'm not saying that they can't do that, but they do it better with Io. So it is the obvious answer. Uh, Io DeSumo trying to help out on Trey Young. It's as simple as that. They've got other guys that can make shots too. And the, the only game that they lost against Atlanta this year, I think Atlanta took like 40 trays and hit a fairly 20 or something. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they knocked down three-point shots and shot well from from three-pointer uh, on three-pointers. And I think that's going to be a major problem. I'm looking forward to talking to KC Johnson later and get his take. He's been breaking this thing down. Um, you know, it's a play-in game. It's a big game. You want to have all hands on deck. I agree with what you're saying about how much stronger they are in the middle with Andre Drummond. And I, I wouldn't argue that. It'd be great if they were both in. As far as the team's concerned, you know, he was no longer really a part of the rotation, but that sucks. A guy like that making, you know, jumping on a team like this and showing a lot of energy and then he gets poked in the eye or whatever it is. He apparently needs surgery. Too bad. I've answered this question, you know, a lot, obviously. With one game left in the Blackhawks season tomorrow night, that's Thursday, out in L.A. versus the Kings, what's the right way to evaluate a season in which they were the second-worst team in the NHL but felt like progress at times due to Connor Bedard's arrival? I believe they are 13% now to get the first pick in the draft. That is, they, We don't even know when the draft is, but we know – that they have a 13% chance. So that's great. I mean, if they could get lucky again and uh, and keep adding more talent. The 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 progress of Connor Bedard, the, the idea of seeing his first season in the NHL and knowing that he is on a trajectory to be like a very special player, I think that is the really only good thing about this season. It's the only kind of laudable thing that has happened you know they they tried to bring some veteran guys in who they might be able to flip and that didn't happen for them but they've got a lot more draft capital and they got another good draft coming it was great to see a couple of guys the kid from Notre Dame guy from Michigan added to the mix and show a flash here and there I think it it just makes you want all these players to continue to age and let's hit fast forward a little bit. Let's get these guys going. I, I hope they, I hope they also. Uh, I don't want to say try to win next year. I don't know that they need to go all in or anything like that. But I, I really hope that they improve the talent around Bedard, and and they'll do some of that internally. But they're going to have to go out and and make a couple of moves and make this team better if they really want to compete. And I think. For a player that wants to compete like Bedard, that's what they need to do. I think the highlight of the season is the fact that Bedard has come back and he's still played pretty well after that big-time hit he took. That he wanted to come back, I think, is also telling. And you got to like that. You got to like that in a young kid. I almost feel guilty. Like, I think I should stay up tomorrow night and, like, lean up against a post, old school, <laughs> when I used to watch Blackhawk Kings play in the playoffs tomorrow night even though the game means nothing but like do you want them like they'll lose six in a row to end the season if they lose last night yeah, tomorrow that's, a bad night. Way to lose. that's not a good way to go out yeah. but you want to keep the percentage going in the right direction to get a shot at the number one pick once again you would like that i think though people understand in hockey that the blackhawks are they're doing this right they're embracing the rebuild they identified a couple key veterans to extend in dickinson and Mrazek. They have a superstar in Connor Bedard, and that's not exaggerating. Now they got Frankie Nazer. Now they have Kevin Korchinski. Oliver Moore is on the way. This is real talent. You look at also guys who have emerged like Vlasic as a surprise. They've got two first-round draft picks in the next two years. They've got five second-round draft picks in the next two years. This is going to be a place where they win again and relatively soon, sooner rather than later. Young talent on the way. Kyle Davidson, Kyle from Chicago, is doing this the right way. 
Luke Richardson is a guy who's been through a lot, but he is, I think, the right coach to have that temperament. He's done a lot of losing. You hope he doesn't get worn down. But as the season ends tomorrow, there's not this hopelessness that exists around a lot of franchises when they have really bad losing years. There's only one team worse than the Hawks, but you couldn't tell it from watching. I was there on Sunday. The fan base understands, generally speaking, I'm generalizing, obviously, I think the fan base though understands what's going on here and is excited because every night you go to the to, to the United Center, you're, you're likely to see 98 score a goal in a way that you've never seen before. He's That's worth, he's worth the price he, of admission. He's worth it every no single doubt. time. So he is Kane and Tay's kind of uh, part two, and so this is the you know Blackhawks 2.0, and I think it's going quite well despite the record. This will be a pick six. There's your ball game. What do you make of reports that Caitlin Clark's WNBA debut will be May 14th? But there could be a conflict with a second round game five in the NHL playoffs. Would the four letter network move the hockey game to four letter network squared? Would Caitlin Clark supersede the NHL? Is she the bigger draw? Well, I think you only get one chance to have a debut. And if you are ESPN, you've got to recognize the moment. I love playoff hockey. I think that every playoff hockey game is an opportunity to be uh, dazzled, enthralled, whatever verb you want to come up with. Is, there's a chance you're going to see something very special. But there's only one debut, and Caitlin Clark's debut is a thing. If you don't believe that she's uh, that anything that she does is a thing, you're not paying attention. From her jersey sales to her appearances on national morning shows to everything that she does people want to hear and watch and listen and and say that they they were part of it let them be part of it if espn doesn't do something to make sure that her debut is a, is in front of as many eyeballs as possible they are badly missing the point well let me just throw this one out i i, I don't know that my dvr or your dvrs are you know and definitely there's no such thing as a tv guide anymore remember when you used to get the tv guide every week um What's on the three-letter network, ABC, on this date? I mean, if we're talking about David getting as many eyes as possible, which is what they should be doing, since mm -hmm. it is her debut, this game should be on ABC, hmm. not on four-letter network, and definitely not on four-letter network squared. Hmm. She, I mean, I saw a story yesterday on TMZ that Caitlin Clark jersey was like the greatest selling jersey ever, ever. People went crazy and bought like Indiana Fever jerseys with her name on it. That blows my mind. Is that gonna happen after the draft when uh, Caleb Williams shows up? Is is that what happened with, with Bedard? I think he sold out tons of jerseys. I don't know if he sold them kind of through Canada and, uh, and the United States, but he certainly sold tons of them here. It's crazy how popular she is. Caitlin Clark could be more universally popular than Connor Bedard. Oh, she's more, univer Jersey, she's yeah, more no universally doubt. popular, apparently, than LeBron, than well, anyone. I mean, right now, this week. I'm just saying, yeah. it's crazy. So uh, her debut, I can totally understand uh, why they want to move that. I think that they should have a commitment to the NHL, and they should figure something out, whether they move her on earlier and then have the two hockey games following. But I, I don't. I think it's it's really an insult to move the NHL off of uh, ESPN if you have a, a contract to broadcast the games because even if you move to ESPN2, even if you – whatever you might do, I agree with you. I think playoff hockey, literally anything can happen. And it's it's phenomenal to watch playoff hockey. And, and I really don't have a horse in the race this year. Because obviously the Blackhawks didn't make it, and I, I'm not going to be. I don't know that I would have been cheering for Kaner, but I would have been interested in following it. I don't know that I got a horse in the race, but maybe I'll go for a Canadian team just out of, uh, you know, wishfulness and hopefulness. Dustin, if it was May 14th on a typical Tuesday night on ABC programming, they would be preempting Will Trent or the rookie, or maybe a special edition of 2020. So or, how, or the Bachelor or Bachelorette, right? Well, you know what I mean. Listen, I, you but preempt I, I, all of that stuff. I, Tuesday nights, though, I think that's good all research, David. Will, nice job. Will Trent and the rookie. Now I want to see the rookie. 
I want to see Caitlin Clark. So maybe they can replace the rookie with the rookie. The Love rookie, it. I believe, is uh, Nathan, what's his name, Fillion, the guy from Castle. Who became a oh yeah police yeah, officer? Yeah, you got to be careful. The castle guy. You got to watch out for handsome guys. You don't want to take them off TV. I, but, but doesn't it, it make the most sense to put the game on ABC? It's a real simple. It's very simple. Yes. That just that. That's just, brilliant. Just put it on ABC. Good job. Would would um and I I mean this sincerely. I don't know the ratings of all the shows. Would Caitlin Clark outdraw Will Trent? Would she would she outdraw, um, uh, the rookie? Caitlin well, Clark. Maybe that show, though, in all seriousness, like if the rookie is doing well, yeah. okay, let's just say it is. The rookie could go on like right after Caitlin Clark's game, and, and then they could preempt the news a little bit, and hopefully they don't follow it all up. I, I, we, you guys weren't here. But we had a really fun discussion on Monday, the whole follow up over at CBS over the Billy Joel concert. Oh, that was awful. Oh, they what did they do? They cut they interrupted the last... in the in the encore, which was yeah. Piano Man. No surprise. I'm not spoiling anything. They literally went to local new in all the Eastern and Abruptly. Central Time yes. Zone so CBS was, local it was, stations. It was Sing Me a Half Song, Piano Man. It was the Heidi game? Yes. Yes. And so this Friday night, because of all the moaning and groaning, and I'm sure Billy, Billy's Billy Joel's back. camp very unhappy, they are re-airing it. On CBS. The entire concert? The entire, not just the last 90 seconds. It would be great if they just played the last minute or two. They are re-airing it. How do you cut off the piano, man? Uh, it's got to be some sort of automatic oh, cutoff, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. It's yeah. like when we break away, something cuts in. It's like When we go oh, over to Xfinity Sports Radio. Yeah, exactly. So it was definitely something that was noticed. And but how about, I mean, wow. I don't think they're going to have to lose a lot of sleep about an episode of The Rookie being preempted. No, no, but I'm saying just if, if that is your highest rated show on that particular night, just move that for like the 9 o'clock start going you know, from 9 to 10 going into the nightly news. Hmm. They come down the court. They find Caitlin Clark game winning shot from the pay and they start the news. That'd be awful. Well, no, they, play, the they start the intro to The Rookie. All right, uh, we got an extra point next. It's prediction time. Mully and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 6 7 at the score. Live from CBS, this is your news now. This is Chicago's number one and most listened to sports station. We're live from Chicago. Jerry Reinsdorf understands this. When I broadcast for the White Sox, I am actually an employee of the White Sox. And so you handle things a bit differently than you normally would. But Jerry also understands that when I go on the score, I'm an employee of the score. And so you can go in depth in various areas that you can't do on a White Sox broadcast. Fortunately, he understands that. As far as the Cubs were concerned, sometimes they didn't understand that. Sometimes they had a hard time uh, uh, differentiating between when I was on one of their broadcasts and when I wasn't. I was never, and people don't really understand the difference, but I was never a, a Cub employee. They hmm. never wanted me to work for the Cubs. I always worked for WGN, and so I felt a bit more freedom to deal with what I had to deal with. And for the most part, it worked out really well. 2004 was not the most uh, entertaining season because the Cubs uh, – did an El Foldo toward the end. We had a difference of opinion, and uh, both Chip and I left after that season. It hardened this Cubs fan, Stoney, because I mean, I, I'm in high school, you know, I, I loved the 03 team so much. I don't think in my lifetime there was a season that I anticipated more than 04, and I loved you guys in the booth, and I knew that I wanted to go and study broadcasting, so I'm watching you guys intently. And then they're blaming you guys. That was one of the toughest seasons for me as a fan. So I'm sure it was a little tougher for you. But just know you were not completely alone in all of that. Yeah, it was. It was a, a difficult year, and the, the reason is I thought they could have gone every bit as far as 2003 and maybe won it all. I mean, that pitching yeah. staff was outstanding. I thought the team was certainly good enough. Sometimes when you have homes that don't have mirrors uh, to look in and realize whose fault it is that you didn't win. I think that's a problem. But uh, 
I've never known broadcasters to beat a team ever. In all the years I've been doing this, the broadcasters never beat any team that I was on. And when I was in the booth, we never beat any team that was playing against the team I was broadcasting for. So I think it was uh, an excuse, and there's a lot of them. Uh, The winners win and the losers make excuses, and that really never changes. Will the three-point shooting and defense against it decide this one? If the Bulls win one, can they win two? Will they win a game versus Boston if they can get that far into the real playoffs? Don't really feel confident about this prediction. I don't feel like the Bulls have done anything to earn the benefit of the doubt. They're losing team that's that backed into the play-in round. We're going to call it the playoffs or the postseason. Technically, it is. But... I don't think that they're going very far past this week. They win tonight. I think they win tonight. It won't be easy. The Bulls have allowed the second most three-pointers all season to a team that's probably going to hit their share. I think the Hawks were sixth in the league in three-pointers made. So they're going to stay in the game uh, by hitting the three. Maybe Trey Young gets off. Maybe not. I hope Andre Drummond plays because they also are a good second-chance point team and they will rebound. But I don't think that the Bulls, in those clutch games, as they played so many of them, are pretty good. And DeMar DeRozan will come through, and I think they will eke this one out. They'll live to play another day, or play in another day. And uh, they'll advance to play the loser of the Heat and the Sixers. But I think that will be where it probably ends. We'll talk about it, and obviously moving toward that. But they win tonight. I don't think they're going to win more than tonight. It might be the last victory of the season. Even if they um, advance to Friday, I think it ends there. And I'm not even – the Celtics, that series, if they ever got to that point, it would be just Celtics in four, Celtics in five, Celtics in whatever because that's that's a, a bridge too far. All right, per our friends over at Circus Sports Illinois, the Bulls are minus three. But this is the more interesting number. I am shocked by this number. The total – Two, two, two. 
222 wow. points. I mean, I know the Atlanta Hawks don't play a lick of defense, but I don't know that the Bulls are going to score 120 points tonight. I, I would be shocked by that. This is, you know, if, if if you're looking to invest, get involved for a little entertainment, you know, I, I would I would go under th- that total. That 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 seems awfully high to me. I, I hope the Bulls win. I think there's value in p- this game for them. I think there's value in winning, surviving, and advancing, playing again. Um, I think we should get into that more, Molly. I know you had said earlier in the show that you're not really revved up for this and you don't see the point. And I think that's a really interesting thing to talk about. But uh, I, I like the Bulls to win, and I like the under for what that's worth. Um, I, I honestly, I, I think heads or tails. You know, you could. I have no idea how this game is going to go. I don't feel very confident that the Bulls are going to win, but I don't feel very confident they're going to lose. I don't. I don't have the thing that surprises me is my lack of enthusiasm for the Bulls winning. And, you know, normally I would be of the mind of get into the playoffs. If you play the Bucks, you can steal a game because DeMar DeRozan is going to go in there and he's going to shoot shirtless shots into the middle of the night and come back. I, I don't know. I, I There is very little juice to this bull season right now. And I get it. They were 14 and five and they came roaring back and made the play in game. And that would be matching what they did a year ago. They're actually the ninth seed, not the 10th seed as they were a year ago. So if they win this game and then bow out, that apparently is a repeat. If they were somehow to win two games, then they'd be in a different, we'd look at them differently. I don't know that I'm looking at them differently. I, I'm very excited to talk to KC at 725 to get his take. on. I, you know, the one thing I'll say is the Bulls do play hard. They do fight to the end. You know, even that game in New York where New York's trying to clinch the number two seed and the Bulls are fighting like hell. I, I really am impressed with their try-hardness but I don't know that that translates to belief that what they're doing is going to work. I think if they had a different team, it might. I think if they had a younger team yeah. building towards something, it might. What they do, they have a lot of veterans who, you know, it's not enough to play hard. That should be the expectation. And I think they do play they do play like a team that uh, understands when they flip the switch sometimes. But the problem with the Bulls is that there's too much inconsistency with that. So you might think, okay, they're going to get it right now, and then they end up, you know, they'll lose a game to the Pistons. <laughs> and they're right. too up and down to trust anything, that, to, to believe in anything that they do. What do they do well? What do the Bulls do well after the regular season has now finished? I DeMar hits a mid-range jumper. They play to the level of their competition. You know, that's probably what they do most consistently. And... Maybe tonight that's enough to to rise to the occasion against a a team with the Hawks that's a little injured, a little banged up. Play the pick and roll, defend the three-point line, take your chances, hit your shots, then they can advance. What does it mean? We can talk about that, but unless they win a playoff series, I'm not sure that it means anything different than it did did a year ago. Yeah, I, I mean, the other thing is the future. When you stop and look at the future... I don't think it means anything toward the future. Yeah, that that that's a big issue. Is what what does the future hold? What is the plan for the Bulls? And um, how dramatic will this offseason be, or will be the same type of frustrating status quo that last summer was? That's a great point. Great point, David. I I got to tell you, um, the it I've never gone into a. I mean, even last year, I was kind of like, hey, let's see what they this this. This seems so hopeless because the best they can do is to get in the playoffs. But it would take like a series of of Achilles injuries for them to get past Boston. I, I see the Boston series if they get there, like losing by 18, losing by 20, losing by 17, coming close and getting shut out by 14. I don't even know if they can be within double digits of this team in four games. I don't. 
think we're going to be in a position to find out. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> but, enough. But that, but I, I don't I, disagree with that either. I hope to God yeah. we're talking about a victory tomorrow well, and we're predicting I, another victory. I do too. You don't want to be negative. I think no. that, you know, they, they get to this point and, and there are a lot of teams that are, are, aren't playing tonight. And I guess that is something you should, it'd be easier to celebrate if it didn't feel so redundant. And I think the I Bulls agree. heading into tonight feels like last year heading into those games. What does it really mean? This feels like the NBA created these games to create revenue and maybe interest, but this doesn't feel to me like the baseball's extra wild card team. No. This doesn't feel like it maybe is, in the Western Conference. Maybe. You got the Warriors and the and, you, you, and the well and the Lakers an extra game. They're attractions, but I think that with baseball, I, I, I think we've become conditioned because we've seen it happen. A wild card team that sneaks in is, is an extra team that oh nobody likes the baseball purists don't like the third team or whatever. Sometimes those teams, because of variance, can win in the playoffs. In the NBA, it's different. These teams that are afforded these extra games, does anybody really look at I know the Heat got to the NBA Finals last year. That is the exception. It's not the rule. The rule typically is you're playing to create revenue for your own organization and, and to keep interest high going into the real playoffs. Texter corrects me, 5-14. and 14. That's obviously what I meant. I knew they didn't start fourteen and five. And five and fourteen was was a yeah. tough start, and they're going to want to ex, they're going to want to be credited if they overcome right that start. So that's why you don't really want them getting to the playoffs. Eh, I mean, interesting. No, it, I, I don't. It's argue. not that I don't want them to get to the playoffs, but if they get to the playoffs, it's going to be a familiar refrain. Yes. Look how good we were after we climbed out of the hole we dug for ourselves. Right. Yeah, it's a great point. All right, 312-644-6767. You got any juice at all? Do you have any playoff juice for a play-in game? 312-644-6767. It's Mully and Haw on the score. So how do you take the Parkins and Spiegel Show with you? A patented Danny Parkins thought exercise. Well, maybe, but just listen on the free Odyssey app. It's live radio you can take with you on your mobile device, smart speaker, laptop, whatever. Didn't know you had the air horn in you. You're like the Michael Winslow of baseball play-by-play guys. Wow. You know? Yeah. Um, you did the Vuvuzela, too, which right. we thought was pretty yeah. good. Um, the air horn was okay. Oh, I, thought the air, I thought the air horn was really good. Actually, my favorite thing about the air horn is JD's response. <laughs> it's so... Dismissive? No, no. <laughs> yeah. There was affectionate approval of the air horn. He admitted, he said, that's a pretty good air horn. That's good partnering, isn't it? From Jim Deshays right there? There's always good partnering from Jim Deshays, 100%. So, what yeah. other sound I mean, effects do you have in the arsenal? That's a good question. That's a good question. Mm, <laughs> um, I feel like I could give a really good boo-boo-zela if just given just some time to warm up and i also sure. i do a decent uh one line sean connery impersonation that's kind of it well I, uh, well hold on okay, okay no it's a good point please you please please give me a pin with shelly one thing only please <laughs> He does these impersonations. Really I good. swear, you would think it was the real people. Yes, it's not bad. It's really good. May I suggest uh, some untouchables? <laughs> is that actually a decent adjustment? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, is that a good sign long term that that's the adjustment? Is to challenge him right down the the middle of the plate. Um, are you really asking me if the adjustment is to throw it right down the middle? I, I am. I'm asking if the adjustment is to challenge him more, because that seems to be what they're doing. Right. Um. <laughs> God. How? Boog, I'm going to ask you a different question. You guys just stink today. <laughs> I mean, you just stink. Wow. I, I think I've been great. I, I was going to ask mean, how you grade speed. You know, we've well, had you've been kind of stinky too, Danny. I'll be honest. With you. <laughs> really, really. Well, our audience thinks you're being very difficult. You're being difficult. We've had a great show. For your information, it's been a really okay. good show. Okay. Maybe we're bad now. Our it's audience possible. is biased, okay. but yeah. The, but yeah, they're they're on team right. Park Parkins and Speaks okay. on this one. Well, because they're live tweeting the the interaction. They text. Yeah, we have a text line constantly. Boog. Yeah. yeah, the text line. Boog is either a tough interview or there's something else going on. Love you guys always, <laughs> I mean, though. Boog I mean, is being like, difficult. I've been on the show before. But yeah, I don't know what I'm. 
I, I did a Sean Connery impersonation. How am I being difficult? Well, so how are we bad if we got you to do a Sean Connery impersonation? <laughs> yeah. Well, you didn't get me to do a Sean Connery impersonation. I volunteered a Sean Connery impersonation. Mm, I, I, I had the audacity to ask tomato, about tomato. Uh, about what I perceived. Uh, I'm sorry that my sports thought was bad, Boog. I'm sorry. It's beneath they, me. Should they keep throwing it right down the middle speed? That's, yes, I think that's a bad sign. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what? You listen poorly. You listen poorly, sir. You're 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 oh, you're, wow. you're busy. Go, Jim. You're busy go, talking. Tony. You have thoughts for America, and you oh. want to share them. changes time of game three hours and 38 minutes and a partridge in a pear tree <laughs> yeah i mean it was a long <laughs> arse game and the fight the, the end of it well played was god awful it was very funny the 12 runs of the diamondbacks yeah, yeah that yeah. was a long game three hours and 38 minutes as you heard dustin say that was from the pregame show and the Cubs blew it. It started weak with Kyle Hendricks giving up oh, yeah. two more home runs. Poor Kyle Hendricks. And ended with, uh, because of Albert Alzali's inability to shut the door and be the closer that he was last year. Third blown close of the season. Third blown save. They've lost seven games. That's not good. Not good at all. Let's get to our guy, Kevin. He's in Palatine. Hey, Kevin. Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, Dustin's partridge in a pear tree had me literally bursting out laughing driving to work. That was uh, that was quite amusing. Um, guys, I think that's another Jed loss yesterday. I do not put that at all on council. Adbert is not a closer. I, you know, I love the Cubs, but I think with the the one thing we got to worry about now is how do we delicately approach this Kyle Hendricks disaster? He's a legend. He won us a World Series. Guys, he looks uh, to be done to me, and yeah. you cannot sacrifice it every fifth day. And if you replay what Jed said yesterday, he told Parkinson Spiegel that he has another 27 starts this year. That cannot, that can't be the case. You want to be respectful to Hendricks, um, but that can't be the case. It's almost a guaranteed loss when he starts. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. I think the Cubs have a little history here. A little experience, not necessarily Craig Council, but Jake Arrieta was pretty bad at the end, wasn't he? And it was what to do with him. And Jake Arrieta was, you know, the dominant force in 15 and 16 and then slid into relative obscurity. It certainly wasn't the pitcher that that he was during that stretch. Kyle Hendricks has been the easiest Cub to respect since he arrived, essentially. And now... It is, a, it is a dilemma, and Jed said yesterday it's difficult to remove emotion from the equation 
and you can't do that realistically, but I think it also could help you appeal to his sensibilities. Kyle Hendricks knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. He's not likely to fight you. He's not likely to misunderstand what you're trying to do for the good of the team. But it's time for a very difficult conversation. I'm not arguing with anything you say. I just think as bad as he was yesterday, they were in a position to win that game and they blew a save. And the bullpen, to me, is the greatest problem that they have right now because they've lost some games they would have won if they could could just hold on and get through it. And it's great when they do that, but when they don't, it's hard not to look at the back end and say, how are they lining this up? Why is this not working? And how are they going to rearrange it so it does work? I think that's, I'm with you though. In fair. I, I'm with you. They, they I mean, could, they could have won 11 to 10. Yes, they and, were in position and, and, to win and, 11 and, to eight. If they if they won 11 to eight, if they won 11 to anything, we still would be asking this question this morning. Yes, we because would. the the Cubs have designs on winning the National League. They should win the division. The they have reason to believe they have enough talent, enough talent and resources to be a contender. You're not going to be a contender. If you're, if you're trotting out a pitcher that's throwing batting practice every fifth day. And so far in 17 innings, giving up seven runs, seven home runs, that's batting practice. I, I mean, honest to God, he needs like, he, they need to stop it. They He needs a break from himself, from the situation. Would it be the worst thing in the world to kind of create a 10-day IL a stop for it the wouldn't, guy. It would just, and then you don't have to cut him. And, and Kevin's right. You know, you gotta, you gotta come up with sort of a respectful. And you know, if this really is the end, and he doesn't come out of this, um, you you don't want to just chop the guy off at the knees because of how long he's been you here. You just extended meant. his contract, and you you just extended his contract in the off season. So that's what Jed is referring to, I think, when he's mentally penciling in twenty seven starts. If Kyle Hendricks makes 27 starts for this team, I'm not sure, number one, they would be in contention. And number two, something would have changed dramatically based on what we've seen in his first four starts. And if if they had won yesterday and they and we came in here and they'd won 11 to 8, what we'd be talking about would be the same thing in terms of Hendricks and how he wasn't good enough and they got to deal with it and what are they going to do and should they take a break from him, et cetera. But I think the the idea that they did blow that lead, and I know they nickeled and dimed. They had two outs in the ninth, and then boom goes the dynamite. I understand what happened. I watched all the highlights. I didn't stay up for the entire game because it's hard to get up at three if you're if you're going to bed at whatever that was, midnight one a.m. It was late. It was very late, and I think that it only made it harder because of people who stayed up for all three hours and thirty eight minutes worth of that drama. They were disappointed as a Cub fan. Jameson Tyone pitches Thursday night. Yeah. Jordan Wicks pitches today. Assad and Brown have been outstanding, and they nobody's have. been better than Shoda. There's five. There's five. Yeah. You've got to have a conversation. It might take a, a, a forced vacation. Um, go to Arizona. Work on your mechanics. Take, take a, a hard reset. Take a hard look. And then come back, and with Justin Steele, maybe, maybe Kyle Hendricks can reinvent himself at this stage of his career as a two inning reliever. I don't know. I would I really hope they find a way to make use of him. I hate the idea of cutting him loose. I really do as a Cub fan. I don't think that nobody wants that. But you can't you can't come in in relief and give up walks. And they were walking guys all night long. And it wasn't just him. I mean, Kyle Hendricks wasn't good. I'm not claiming he was, but god they were awful. And and maybe Dustin's right. Maybe the bullpen is just Hit too hard at this. Almonte was bad. He walked two batters, and you know he he's not been, I, he's not been as advertised. And certainly Luke Little couldn't find the plate and lack command last night. So Palencia walked too many hitters every night. There seems to be somebody else who lets you down. Bullpens work their way into a season, and it's the hardest part of a team to predict year in and year out. You can always find a spot for somebody who's going to throw strikes. If Kyle Hendricks come come back and maybe 
Maybe that's what they try to do, Molly. They put him on the IL, send him to Arizona, and prepare him to be a relief pitcher, a specialist. I, I don't know what the answer is. I hope it's not cutting him loose. Does Does anyone have an answer? I'd be very curious if anyone had like a sensible way of getting this done, or if you can think of someone who has been gracefully kind of taking a step back. And you don't know how the season goes and when you might need the guy, and you know he's not without value, but. They seem to have noticed, because why else do they get Julio uh, Tehran? I mean, there's got to be a reason that they're bringing people in. Maybe it's to help the bullpen. I don't know. 312-644-6767. And we're still asking you, do you got any juice for the Bulls at all? At all? Are you pumped up for tonight's game? 312-644-6767. It's Molly and Hall on the score. The Parkinson Spiegel Show on your ride home. Afternoons 2 to 6 on the score. Chicago Cub Nico Horner. What's it like in that dugout when Michael Bush homers? I came across a site. A perfect, only slightly mangled Giordano's 10-inch pizza. Maybe eight? I can't measure. And there it is in the middle of the street by itself. Just sitting there all lonely. So I walked closer to it as one tends to do to pizza, and I took a picture. And then I realized it was sitting on a cardboard box. Was it warm? Could you see any steam coming off of it? No. Okay. No, there was, it was cold like my dead heart. <laughs> and as I looked at it, I thought other people should share in this feeling. <laughs> so I took a picture, and I said, I found the person having the worst day today. It has since gone viral, which I am happy about, because I think we need a little distraction. What's the story behind a whole deep dish pizza sitting on cardboard on a street corner? Well, tragedy. tragedy. Well, it is right. tragic. But, 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 but many great stories and many writers start from that moment and then storyboard outward. What, well, what I was leads... lazy and took it to the internet and they came up with better answers. Well, what leads to that? And, and the bigger question, and this is the monkey's paw question, where you have just found a free whole Chicago deep dish pizza. That's 25 bucks right there worth of food. That's 25 bucks right there. Seriously, it is though. They don't I know. So then that that I know what things cost. Do you eat it? That's it. Pandemic street pizza. But the third piece of this is the other part of the internet who correctly issued it's a trap. This has got to be some kind of trap. It's a trap. <laughs> Doesn't it? Like it, there's, like, there's like a string attached to it that's going like, to... Or a trap door? It's an airborne virus, not a pizza-borne virus. We <laughs> solved it! And I w- So eat the pizza. But, is it, but aren't there things on the street that can make you sick? Never.
Chicago Sports. Chicago Sports is the score. WSCR Chicago. WBMX HD2 Chicago. Always live on the free Odyssey app. The score! This hour brought to you by Menards. Save big money at Menards. And giving him a little bit of of leeway and time to work his way through it, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I try to remember over and over that, you know, the things we think about in April and the things that we talk about in April, like so oftentimes by June, let alone August, seem so remote. So that's hopefully how I'm looking at this, this you know, rough, rough three starts that you look up and it, it, he's just it's clearly a bad patch and then he, he, got, he got going again and pitched really well. Mully and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 670 the score. So when when would he be scheduled to pitch again, if, if that's the case? If, if he pitched on Tuesday, so it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Sunday. And who are they playing? The Marlins. Could mm-hmm. that solve his issues? Maybe. Nothing like would Tim you give Anderson another at run the plate. No, maybe reason? Jake Berger could ruin another season in Chicago. Uh-huh. Send Kyle Hendricks <laughs> off to wherever. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Now that's that's interesting because that would mean they're giving him a chance at Wrigley Field to right. resurrect his season. They probably will do that, but I don't think I don't think we're exaggerating here. And here, here's a couple of reasons why. Before we get to the phone calls, because sure. people definitely want to weigh in. Kyle Hendricks, as I said, has given up seven home runs in 17 innings. Last year, it was I know he started late, but it was his tenth start before he gave up another his seventh home run, seventh home run. And it's not all just about giving up home runs. You can just see he's lacking something, lacking command. And Mully, he's given up, besides just the home runs, I mean, it's the earned runs. And it's at a historic pace. According to ESPN stats and info, Kyle Hendricks is the first pitcher in MLB to allow five or more earned runs in his first four starts of the season since 2019. Wow. The first cup pitcher to do this since earned runs became official in 1913. This is a bad start. We're not exaggerating. (laughs) Nobody wants to point out the deficiencies of the nicest guy in the Cub clubhouse, of the most consummate professional you could imagine. This is no fun in doing that, but it's also there, and the Cubs cannot ignore it. All right. We are going to be giving away three pairs of tickets to see the Cubs take on the the aforementioned Marlins on Friday. That's this Friday, April 19th. The game's at 120 at Wrigley Field. Stay tuned, and you can win your pair. That's an awesome giveaway. It's a great giveaway. It's also a fascinating team to, to go see in Chicago, given that the left side of their infield knows Chicago pretty well. Jake Berger, Tim Anderson. about the Marlins. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, they're not doing very well. No, they're not. And weren't they a playoff team last year? Yes, they were. Yeah, it's not the good. I believe the Sox are the only team worse than them, right? They're that bad. Boy. That's not good. That's really bad. If you're if you're even mentioned in line with the Chicago White Sox, even if it's hey, they got a couple of guys who played there, that's not good. <laughs> wow. That's how that's how bad things have gotten in Chicago. Uh, 312-644-6767. We got a lot of people want to check in. We'll start with Chris. Chris is in. Will, Matt. Hey, Chris. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for having me on. Uh, The one thing I noticed about Hendricks that he seems to have gone away from, and we know he can't fireball the ball, but his two-seam fastball, he used to run it inside on the left-handers and bring it across the inside of the plate. He hasn't had command of that pitch. I, I don't see anything wrong with his other pitches other than if he can't get his two-seamer across and in on the hands of a right-handed hitter, they're not going to bite on the other stuff. They're going to sit and wait on a fat fastball that's not moving, and that seems to me to be what the problem is. To have command of that one particular pitch will make all the other pitches significantly better. I don't know what you think about it or if you've observed that, but I'd like to hear your comments on that. That's a good point, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, You know, here's the thing. We call it a fastball. You know, this is a player that has never overpowered anyone. And that's one of the reasons I believe they, they were willing to give him a contract and trust in his ability to command. That's what's that's what the difference is with him than a lot of players. He's much more of a of a uh, of of a 
of kind of a painter, of a, of a guy looking for a masterpiece. He's a finesse guy pitcher. Overwhelming. He's always been a finesse pitcher. Always. That's why he's here. That's why they picked up the option. That's why he's making $16.5 million this year, and he's the longest tenured Cub. His ability to overcome these kind of blips and also regain command, and maybe it is a two-seam fastball. Maybe it's something else. Typically with Kyle Hendricks, though, he has pointed out mechanical glitches that he's identified that are contributing to his lack of effectiveness. Maybe it's as simple as that. Let's hope so. Tommy Hodge, you may have something to say. I think Kyle Hendricks probably knows what he still has and what the problem is right now. I would just give him 10 days to figure it out in Arizona, away from the team, fresh start, come back. And I think mentally, he's one of these guys that can handle that. You wouldn't want to do this with a young pitcher. You wouldn't want to just send him out to you know, a, a, an enforced vacation, maybe send him back down. You want to be more careful with his psyche. With Kyle Hendricks, I think you're careful and respectful because of what he's accomplished, but I don't think you're worried about damaging his confidence necessarily. 312-644-6767. Jimmy G is in McHenry. Is is that uh, Jimmy Football? Hey, Jimmy G. Hello? Yeah, I, Jimmy Garoppolo it's Jimmy calling. It's, 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 this is Philly, not Jimmy. Oh, Okay, I've got – it's Philly G? That's okay. Yeah, Philly, I talk – today, how are you guys doing? I, I spoke to you before. I listen to your show all the time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, hey, yeah, listen, I uh, – you know, I'm 57 years old. I love Kyle Hendricks. I love – the. yesterday was a great ball game. You see the Cubs come back. They were down 4-1. to one. Right. They come back. It was, it was exciting. Their offense is obviously not the problem. Kyle Hendricks, uh, you know, I, I remember when John Lester started having problems. Uh, when he says he started, uh, you know, John Lester, he's a finesse pitcher, as we know, with Kyle Hendricks. He doesn't throw hard. John Lester, Ariata, they always, those guys have a little more bite when they pitched. But you could tell when the time is coming, when these guys are done, when they're showing that it's that time, it's that time. And yesterday's game, unfortunately, yeah, I, I know they're pitching, the starting pitching's got some issues because of the injuries and things like that. But this is the time, this is a, it's a long season. And four games in, he's gotten knocked around this bad. I don't know how you're going to fix that. I mean, the guy, I just I just hope that, and, and Elzele, by the way, before I finish, has he, I don't know what they see in this, this fellow. I mean, he's, he's an average pitcher at best. I, I they want him to be the closer, and he's, this year's been what? I mean, yesterday, we should have won this game yesterday. As, as tough as that's hard to say. I mean, that, 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 was a, that, was a, that was a tough game to lose. And I would say to Jed Hoyer, if you're listening, take your car credit card and go buy some arms. <laughs> Thanks, Philly G. I, I think the fact that Kyle Hendricks has struggled maybe obscures the fact that they do have some arms. They do have, I think, a, an abundance of starting pitching talent. They do have, uh, frankly, the only reason we're having this conversation and it's steered toward what do you do with Kyle Hendricks and how can you get him out of the way is because there are other pitchers like Ben Brown and Javier Assad and Jordan Wicks, who have stepped forward, and you trust. If you didn't trust those guys, you wouldn't necessarily be so willing to give Kyle Hendricks an extended vacation to figure it out. I think that's fair. You I, need I help think... in the bullpen, but not the rotation. Jeff is listening on the Odyssey app. Hey, Jeff, what's up? Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, two questions, one for both of you and one David specific. Uh, first thing, when uh, Dustino asked about the uh, Andrew Vaughn, I think the White Sox happened to Andrew Vaughn because if I, I go back in my memory, I'm trying to think of anybody other than Frank Thomas, Robin Ventura, and Paul Canerco that were position players in the last 30 years that were either brought up through the system via trade or uh, free agency that did anything like an all-star for that was better when they got here. Um, so I'd like to know if you guys think of anybody else that's a position player in the last 30 years for the White Sox that played better once they got to the White Sox than those three. Um, and for David, spe specific to you, how was peanut butter and waffles? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I did not try peanut butter and waffles, but I am going to definitely get – I will definitely report once I do – I was disappointed because I did put the waffle in the toaster, my frozen waffles, and I went to get the peanut butter, 
and uh, we were all out. So you just poured peanut butter whiskey over it? No, I did not. Just maple syrup. Okay. <laughs> Very disappointing. A couple, a uh, couple uh, sliced bananas, some maple syrup. Yeah, I did not. I still you have to try. You ran out of peanut butter. Yes. What kind of peanut butter yes. do you get? Just out of curiosity. Um, What's it, your favorite? It, it varies. I, I'm a, I'm a jiffy guy. Yeah. But I, my wife gets a lot of other kinds that are. You know, what about the nut butters? Or, organic this and organic that. You don't like the crunchy. I don't like the crunchy. Yeah. No, not a crunchy guy. Mm -mm. What about the nut butters? No. No? No. But what no, the, why? The, why? The well, I just, when you why? said that your wife was picking some things up, because yeah, uh, that's like a healthy, my, my healthier wife, alternative. My wife will pick things up. doesn't mean I have to eat everything in the house. I, ah, okay. By the way, yeah. I think I have your coffee. I don't know if you have a real coffee. No, I have I have mine. I have soy okay. written on mine. All right. Yeah. There's no soy written on mine, but it tastes like kind of a, like a little sweeter than normal. I, I really am pushing back to this whole soy? idea. I'm being sort of uh, typecast here. Oh, that you like special That I like strange your, things. Um, Yeah. No, I, I don't think you like strange things. I think you <laughs> don't like some normal things. That's <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't, I don't even like, you know, pancakes or... Or um, French toast, or what was? Oh, it? I like French waffles. toast. Yeah, waffles. Well, it gets a little I, too sweet. I need to for try the, the the peanut butter, but we were all out of peanut butter, and um, got fine now. We got more peanut butter in the house, but I just haven't had waffles because I don't eat waffles at during the week. It's just too much going on in the morning to get out of the house. Yeah, no, it's hard to eat a waffle. It'd be great to come in here one morning and have maybe waffles waiting for us. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen anytime. <laughs> Serve during a break, maybe. Hint, hint. Um. Do you think the Sox have ruined Andrew Vaughn? Is that the idea? Um, I, I think the problem is, like, when we were talking off the air about Andrew Vaughn and how you handle him, we were saying, well, how, you know, how do you – whose bat needs to be in the lineup? And I think we agree that Aloy needs to be in the lineup. And Gavin Sheets has probably played well enough to be in the lineup. And we had a private conversation, like, could you put Sheets at first base so that he – and you know, because you you really don't want to take uh, Sheets and Alloy being what's the lineup his name out of, out of right field because yeah. he's leading off for you, and we'll see if he can keep walking. But he's walked a lot. Um, I just wonder, is Andrew Vaughn? You know, to me, Andrew Vaughn is almost in the being attendee kind of role. Can you have them playing if they're not going to be hitting? Well, put uh, Gavin Sheets at first base, make Alloy your DH, and platoon. Andrew Vaughn and Benintendi in left field. But see, that's what I'm saying. The, it was the Sox that moved him into left field, and he didn't look very comfortable there. But he played. Well, he played he, there. He got, I mean, he, he got into the he got into the lineup, and he, you weren't complaining about his bat when he was playing left field. You were worried about his defense. I don't think it's an ideal situation, but what is ideal about a two and fourteen start? Yeah, desperate times right. call for desperate measures. Andrew Vaughn needs to be saved. He doesn't have any protection around him in the lineup. Not that that would make the difference. He's but a click away. It certainly doesn't help. Well, <laughs> do, do we have Pedro? Fo I, I don't know why. He's a click away. I, I don't know why I listen to him because honestly, more need, often than not, my blood pressure rises. Need some clickbait then, because that's it. We need some clickbait for Andrew Vaughn. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with Eloy because Vaughn, Vaughn's um, playing time has nothing to do with Eloy Jimenez. Uh, it has everything to do with um, I'm going to give him an opportunity to settle settle down, uh, get some good quality work before, during the game with uh, Marcus and our hitting coaches, um, and just, just regroup. Uh, he's a tick away. When you look at his video, tick. it's just one click away from Six where click. he needs to be. Um, and they're making the necessary adjustments, you know, to, to get him where he needs to be. And today's a good day for him to to just take the day, whatever whatever you need, however, however much work you need to do, uh, go, go ahead and do it. But he's available for the game. And I and I will use him for, for a pinch that, hit appearance. That was yesterday before the game to explain – why Andrew Vaughn wasn't in the lineup, and Aloy was back at DH. I'd get him back in today. I'd play him both games. And they're not related. I, and and he did say tick, which is kind of a At first second, he said tick. But he then said click. Yes. So he's and clickbait. Just so you know, as long as we're rhyming, it all makes me sick. Okay. <laughs> I think you speak for many. All he needs is just he's just a click away. So click. Where's TMZ yeah. when you need him? Where's the, where's the clicker when you need it? Uh, Rob's in Lyle. Hey, Rob. Guys, 
Hey, Rob. Hey, I uh, wanted to take a little different tact on uh, the, the Hendricks discussion. Okay. Uh, two things we know. One is, over the last 10 years, you've never heard Kyle Hendricks make an excuse. And the other is, you've got all-star pitchers in the majors this year complaining about the baseballs being slick. I wonder if his particular um, throwing motion and uh, pitch selection is being affected by the baseballs, but he's just a stand-up guy and won't ever complain about it. Boy, I, I respect where you're coming from, and I want to give him every benefit of the doubt, but seven home runs in 17 innings doesn't really scream to me the bad baseballs. That's just bad pitching. And I know that there that's been a common complaint, or at least we've heard it a little bit louder this season, but I don't look at that as a reasonable explanation for how bad he has been. I I hope it was – I wish it were as simple as that. I don't think that it is. And, you know, you look at – previous caller had mentioned John Lester. Yeah. I, I referenced Jake Arrieta. When you go back and you look at when their decline began, their decline made the decision by the Cubs pretty easy. They were really bad at the end. So let's hope it doesn't get to that point. But it's trending in that direction. Let's get to Crowley. He's uh, Dustin's guy. He does the podcast with him and, uh, and always fun to talk to Crowley. He's got a solution. Hey, Crowley. Hey guys, how are you? Yep, Fly the W podcast. Uh, we got a new one that's going to be dropping tomorrow morning. But here's the solution here, man, guys, because we got a couple things. Number one, I hear people put him on the Phantom IL. Can't do that. Billy Epler just got in some big, big trouble from the Mets doing that. So you're not doing any Phantom injury. He had no trainer coming out, no issue there. Number two, you guys say, okay, well, you know, send him to Arizona, a little vacation. He's got five years service time, so he's going to have to consent to that. That he, they can't just send him to Iowa or Iowa or anything like that. Me personally, what I'm taking a look at is I would send Daniel Palencia down, and then I would use Javier Assad as a piggyback for Hendricks. Don't let Hendricks go more than two times through the order and pray to God he doesn't give up more than three runs. That right now seems to me to be the best decision. you got two guys in this uh, rotation right now with Hendricks and Wicks that are struggling to get through past four innings. And so you're going to need someone to be able to do some long relief, and you can't just rely on Drew Smiley all the time. So, Crowley, let me get this straight. Let me recap it for you. Your advice to the Cubs to deal with Kyle Hendricks is prayer. No. My, my advice is to have a – do not let him go through the rotation more than twice. Have a long reliever. Have Javier Assad He's an be opener. willing to cover three to four innings. You're, okay. you're, yeah, you're saying use him as an opener and then get to a bullpen game. Well, right. you, you can use him for, for three to four innings on Kyle, not just an opener of one inning. Right, but, I mean, he got through the first inning without an issue. Maybe he can get through um, twice around, as you say. Okay. that's. I mean, I suppose that's a way of dealing with it. I don't know how – I mean, it would depend on each situation. I mean, what you're basically talking about is keep him in the starting rotation just to give him a very quick hook and have someone ready to go. Yeah. By the third inning, ask him to get six outs instead of in, instead of eighteen or fifteen. I, five or six innings is what Kyle Hendricks should be giving you at the stage of his career, who he is and what he's getting paid. Crawley suggesting you know one or two innings as an opener, perhaps not yeah. ideal. Yeah, that's tough. I can't wait to see how Dustin answers that in the Fly the W podcast tomorrow. I've got a feeling there's going to be an argument. Hello, <laughs> buddy from the podcast. Let's talk Bulls. <laughs> well, we're going to bring in KC. We'll talk to KC Johnson next. Our guy Mullen Hall on the score. Dan Bernstein and Lawrence Holmes. Middays 10 a.m. till 2. Chicago Cub Ian Happ on Michael Bush. He's done such a great job for us. Um, just the, the quality of the bat, the ability to take balls and borderline pitches and get himself into hitter's count. George has the straight man dealing with the wacky talk show host. Here's a famous one. Two to nothing, Cubs in the bottom of the fourth. And it's Sosa's home run, a towering line drive in the first inning, a controversial shot. Third base umpire immediately pointed fair. And that's the George, only run for the game. Which was it? 
Wait a minute, hold on. Is it to towering or was it a line drive? Get some both. coffee and a towering you line drive. You can't say, have it both ways. Yeah, oh, yes, you can. No, you can't. Oh, yes, you, you can. can. You can't What's have it both ways. You? Gentlemen, it was a towering line drive. Oh, George, oh, you, want, God, you want Julie to foul finish ball. the update. It's either a, a line drive or it's a towering home. Gentlemen, I'll repeat myself. It was a towering Don't line make drive. Don't come out there. Come on out here. <laughs> Bank your little honey. I didn't deserve that. I'll give it by Ryan. You ask North and Jiggets, and even Arnie Harris, who was on, it was a towering yes. line drive. We standing by towering line drive, George? Yes, absolutely. Let me tell you something. That is now 28 years ago in May. And, you know, I never thought of the term towering line drive <laughs> until it happened. <laughs> I don't know why I said it, but I did. Yeah, you know, look, it's it's an oxymoron, but I try to explain to people, think about a really good golfer with a driver on the tee, okay? Yeah. The ball is hit on the line, and it's hit high. It's a towering line drive. <laughs> yeah, hey, this is the station of Malaprops. Spiegel, <laughs> Spiegel, Spiegel last week said that he was wrapping a situation around his head. Like a scarf, George. That's I, what I do. I, I said... That we were entering a double-edged sword of pain. Yeah, and then you said you were going to move the baton. I was going to move the baton. <laughs> Cody Westerland said we were moving. Or no, we were switching. We were switching goalposts. Yeah. Shane said that we were climbing up a. I was trying to paddle up a hill without a paddle. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So, the, like, I feel like you're in a, you're like the the godfather of the malaprop, maybe in some ways. You know what? It's still happening. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's great about that? I still get it on social media, and it's really great. People, will, you know, if I'm commenting on something or I put something out, and then there'll always be somebody, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, saying, "Was that a towering line drive?" I love it. It's 28 years later, and it, and the fun at the expense doesn't come without the respect. Like that's why. It's funny because Parkins says a lot of things well in 20 hours. Yeah, but no one, <laughs> that's the thing, George. No one ever remembers my brilliant points. They never come up to me, but it, it's, hey, you said something really dumb, you know? But, and, it, and it's not dumb. It's just, it's live radio. Nothing, you know what I mean? So that, it's what the score was based on from, from the beginning. You mentioned Terry, Terry Boris. Terry, and I say this with all due respect to, Everybody at the score and other stations is the best talk show host in the history of our business. Terry was, Terry is, what am I saying was for? Terry is brilliant, knows his sports, he's quick witted, and he's funny as hell. And he would make me laugh. But people will remember this to the point where I couldn't talk. I do remember. I, mean, it. I literally was, I was crying in laughter. He is such a he's such a funny guy. I loved it. when we do when we would go through these phases. It was I would be there like ten or fifteen minutes, and I'm just like in tears. And it's one of the great moments I think of the history of the station is when Terry, when the O.J. Simpson trial was taking place. Terry took on all comers. It was great, great radio.
so I can hopefully can play tomorrow. Mully and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 670 the score. That's our guy, KC Johnson, getting all the answers as usual, talking to Io there, and KC joins us now on the score hotline. You can read his stuff, NBC Sports Chicago. He's their fine Bulls reporter, and there's so much to talk about. I, I was saying to David KC, this is weird. They got a play in game tonight, and I don't feel the juice. I normally am very fired up for moments like this with the Bulls, but for some reason, I just don't have the same level of excitement. My fault, I guess. Are you getting that from people? Well, I mean, part of it might be that it's going to end after our bedtime, Mully. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. No, no. no. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a it's been a pretty. Uh, underwhelming season, you know. Um, I will say this: they they played a lot of dramatic games, but I think the fan base is more focused on big picture than actual. In, and this is generally speaking, this is not the entire fan base, but a, a big sentiment that I hear from is you know people focused on being stuck in the middle and the big picture, and so you know these exciting games and these strong performances in the clutch games, and now this playing game have left. A lot, some some segment of the fan base kind of just yawn, you know. So, um, but look, these, these playing tournament games are, are great. I watched both the West games last night. I mean, there really is a, an NCAA tournament atmosphere to them, and I, I do believe, uh, as usual, the United Center will be will, will be pretty rocking tonight. So, what's your best educated guess as to whether Io Desunmu or Andre Drummond play tonight, and which guy do you think? is more important to beating the Hawks? Well, the, the second question, uh, the, the, both questions are hard. And I, I've actually, if, if the Derrick Rose season has taught me one thing, it's to not predict injuries because it's just impossible. So, I I mean, just if you go off what happened this week, it, it doesn't look great for Drummond, but that doesn't mean he's not going to play. So that's why I don't like make predictions on that. I mean, just run through the facts, though. He... Bulls were off Monday, but had an individual work day, and he tried to do some things individually and then had swelling off that that kept him out of practice Tuesday. So that's just not trending well is the way I would say. With Io, it's trending a little bit the other way, but his injury is pretty was pretty significant. I mean, he's not he's still not able to sprint at top speed with that deep thigh bruise. So um, they're both listed as questionable, which is 50-50 injury parlance. As for which one is more important, they really kind of both are. But if I had to pick one, I would say Io just because of the way he's played against Atlanta this season and the way he's played against Trey Young historically and his presence in the lineup against Trey Young would allow Alex to, you know, take some minutes on Trey, take some minutes on DeJounte Murray, take some minutes on Bogdanovich. I mean, Caruso, as we know, is just a madman and wants to guard whoever's got it going the most. Um, but Drummond's played really, really well against the Hawks, and the Hawks are a very good offensive rebounding team. They they put, they do a lot of damage with second chance points. So, not having both those guys, that would be a problem for the Bulls. They, you know, the Bulls, as we know, need to control the three point shooting of, of Atlanta. Atlanta. And you just mentioned like three guys right there. They can knock down a three. That it is, it is frightening to think of the number of threes they'll launch, and it comes down to the percentage they hit when you start thinking about how this one's going to go. Hundred percent. And and they get up a lot, and they just constantly put put you in pick and roll and make you scramble out the three point shooters if they don't get something off the initial action. I mean, that's all they do. I mean, they just they just keep coming at you. They they take shots early in the shot clock. They, those create long rebounds, which is why they are fourth in the league in second chance points. I mean, it's it's you know exactly what is coming tonight from them offensively. Now, de- defensively, they're not a good team at all. So you got to hope uh, not only does Demar do his typical damage, um, and you know he's been to the line thirty times in these three games against Atlanta, and DeAndre Hunter is a good defender. Um, so you know he's been able to exploit that matchup. And, and still do his thing, but you need DeMar to score. You need Kobe to have a big game offensively. Um, so, you know, to me, it's going to be more of a shootout type game. I mean, that's that's Atlanta's 
style and really their best chance to win because they're not a good defensive team. Um, but yes, uh, controlling the three point line, which the Bulls have been poor at most of the season. Um, you know, they, they're 30th in, um, three point makes and no, three, the 30th in three point attempts allowed and 29th in, in makes. So, um, that's, that's going to be a big part of tonight's game for sure. Casey, you've watched this Bulls team all regular season long. You've watched a lot of basketball over the years. Can you get a read on this team in any given night? Will you be able to tell in the first quarter or the first half whether or not this is going to be a game that the Bulls are going to be in position to win? I mean, you'll have a little bit of a feel, but no. The answer absolutely is no. I mean, this team has uh, blown big leads, and they've come back from 20-point deficits. So, you know, um, they're a very resilient team. They they never feel like they're out of the game. They've, they've proven in clutch games how elite they can be. Um, which obviously also has some outlier stuff. I mean, clutch the clutch minute stats are loud because, you know, guys can miss shots for another team and all that stuff. But to answer your question, absolutely not. I mean, I've had so many people that I, I know, either friends or people connected to the league, say, I'm not going to be surprised if the Bulls win by 15, and I'm not going to be surprised if the Bulls lose by 15. And that's where this team is at. I mean, We've seen it so many times, uh, you know, the, the stirring victories over good opponents and then the, the home losses, to the Detroit Pistons and shorthanded Washington Wizards. I mean, the evidence is there. So um, you've heard Billy Donovan talk all season about the lack of consistency, and that's where this team is at, and that's why this team is playing a 9-10 playing game tonight. And if they win it, they get the loser of the other game, and if they win that, then they get into a matchup with the Boston Celtics. So, I, you know, it just feels like it's going to be difficult tonight and it's a flip a coin game. Then it's going to be difficult again. And it's kind of, I think, the coin's already been flipped. And then if you get, I mean, someone steals your coin. If you get to Boston, you're just going to be broken. You're going to be heavier kind of um, pants open up falling around your ankles, you're wandering the streets, you got very little hope. Well, that got dark in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> that got dark in a hurry. Uh, and, and, Rajon, and, and Rajon Rondo just announced his retirement, so he's not there to save you against Boston. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, look, that's that's kind of the, getting back to the first question, that's kind of the fan base that, I, you know, a, lo- a loud segment of the fan base sentiment is like, what are we doing here? It's like, even if we even if the Bulls win the play in, they're facing the Boston Celtics in round one. And what's that going to be? A four game sweep, maybe a gentleman's sweep like the Bucks were two years ago. And that's, that's what a, a, a large segment of the fan base is focused on is the bigger picture and the, the end game and kind of the futility of it all. Because yes, that Boston matchup is not a good one for any team. Uh, but I mean, you talk about three point shooting, my goodness. I mean, if if the Bulls were somehow to get in the first round matchup with the Celtics, I mean, that's what they did in the three game season series sweep was just launch threes and make a lot of them, and Bulls had no answer for that. So, um, hey, we'll we'll ride it out where it goes, and then we'll go to the extra meetings, and then we'll start writing our offseason. <laughs> that's that's how we roll. <laughs> Casey, the drama surrounding Billy Donovan and the flirtation or the Kentucky speculation, manufactured or not, kind of overshadowed last week, I think. DeMar DeRozan expressing a desire to stay in Chicago, to work something out. It seemed like that was his intention. It seemed like that's what he wants to happen in the offseason. Question is, do you agree that he's going to be very willing um, to try to work something out? And is that good, and is that the best thing for the long-term future of the Bulls? Um, so as far as the first question, it's uh, Adam, it's a 1,000%. I mean, he's he has said those sentiments before. My – my goal with that sit down that I had with him in, in Detroit uh, after a shoot around was kind of for him to expand upon why. And he went into great detail as to why really for the first time. I mean, he has said some of those things before, but not to this level, in my opinion, and not to this degree. And, um, you know, he just, he's very content here. He likes the city. He likes, um, he likes, and, and he likes his teammates. He likes his coaches. He likes management. He likes ownership. 
I mean, he went down the list, but the biggest thing to me, and he is, he said this to me when we sat down early in the season in Indianapolis too, when he was about to pass Larry Bird on the all time scoring list. He is not, he has a ton of really close friends in the league who have, you know, asked for trades or, I mean, Dame's the latest example. I mean, he's really tight with Dame, you know, tried to form a super team. That's not how DeMar DeRozan is wired. When he is signed to a team or drafted by a team in the Raptors case, um, and even when he was traded on, against, you know, his wishes or, you know, he didn't sign up for that one. He, he committed to San Antonio. When he does that, he's in, man. He's old school. He's loyal. And his point, biggest point to me was like, I don't like jumping ship on things. So this is not great right now. And my, my, the way I'm wired is I want to try to fix this. And that's not just, that's not just smoke. I mean, that's how he, who he is now. Yes. The bulls can pay him more than any other team. So there's an undercurrent to those comments of that. Um, and he is just content and happy here. And look, he's got a great situation. Um, but the biggest thing to me was kind of the old school loyalty that shown through that interview, you know, as for the, the is it the right thing for the Bulls to do? I mean, he he keeps their floor pretty high because that dude has saved a lot of people's butts in, over the last three years. Um, he's a very elite scorer and player, and he's a great representative for your franchise. Great character guy, great leader. The young players love him. Um, but you know, there's a certain se- member segment of that loud fan segment of the fan base that thinks they should everyone the Bulls should just blow it all up. So. Um, I personally think he, sh- he will be back, and I, I don't think it's an awful move. I mean, obviously, it depends partly on the price tag. Um, but, yeah, he, he, uh, he certainly raises your floor if he's back. So we'll let you go, Casey. I'm just curious. You start 4-15 and 15 on the season. We know what the, the disaster that was. They battled back. If they get in the playoffs, is that a success? If they win tonight? Is that a success match last year's accomplishment? Do they have to get in? Do they have to win? And I don't want to say a series because that would be dumb. A playoff game? I mean, what what constitutes success? To me, what constituted what would have constituted success is a top six seed and automatic playoff berth because that's kind of you know what we heard as the goal is to be a playoff team, and the only way you're a playoff team, I mean. To me, is if you're—I mean, the seventh to eighth seeds, yes, they're playoff teams. But to me, top six, you just lock it in. That—that's kind of the improvement that they were looking for. I mean, they're gonna—they're gonna say it's a success because of the amount of injuries they had to overcome, and, and also overcoming that five and fourteen start. I've actually enjoyed Billy Donovan's take on that five and fourteen start because he's like, you can't. Re- I mean, yes, you should give us credit for overcoming it, but you can't give us credit. Too much because we started five and four. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Billy Donovan. He's right. He's right. So he's the one who gets it. Great, Casey. Thank you, buddy. We'll be watching. All right, guys. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, buddy. Good stuff. Not taking credit for creating adversity. I I think you got to mention that they did start that way when we talk about how we figure out what's going to happen. And obviously, Casey's answer was correct, which is they already missed that boat. They already did. And that's bad for them. So tonight, the Bulls. Obviously, right here on the score, the only local broadcast of the game on 670 score and in, in the Chicagoland area on the free Odyssey app. And right now, you can be the sixth caller to the scores contest line. We've got two cup tickets to give away. Wow. See the Marlins on Friday at Wrigley Field. Tim Anderson, Jake Berger, and the Marlins against the Cubs. 312 540 0670. Win a pair of tickets to see the Cubs Friday. You call right now. Be the sixth caller. I don't get upset if Berger's not there. Someone said he's on the I.L. I oh, man. I know. Ruins everything. Go anyway. And we're going to have two more pairs of Cubs tickets to give away today. It's giveaway day. And we've got some uh, Aerosmith tickets, too. So make sure you stay tuned. It's Mully and Haw at Chicago Sports Radio, 6-7 to score. We are Chicago's number one and most listened to sports station. We're live from Chicago, talking Chicago sports. Listen on your radio, your laptop, your mobile device through the Odyssey app, A-U-D-A-C-Y, or tell your smart speaker to We'd like to publicly invite you to sing on our Justin Fields parody song album because, yeah. frankly, you're exactly as good as Danny Parkins. Like, exactly. And, and we, okay. th- getting you guys together, I think, would be yeah. a dream. It'd be magic. Yeah. I would love it. I'm in. I, uh, I, want them I, to I, hear, I, I want them to sing Ebony and Ivory, honestly. Can you guys <laughs> sing Ebony and Ivory yeah. together? 
I can sing anything in one Just day. Justin Fields forever. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 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 See? Benetti's really good, by the way. You guys have heard Benetti sing, right? You ever hear him him sing? He's, he's really good. Benetti, Benetti, sing something for us. Prove that accurate. What do you, I mean, what do you want me to sing? Uh, you could sing your part of the uh, Suddenly Seymour duet that you and I did during pandemic I'm not lockdown. doing more. I'm not doing more Little Shop of Horrors. I'm not. Okay. No. All right. All Desastre right. personal. <laughs> Tell Sorry, me why on your ain't show, by nothing the way. but a heartache. Tell me you why he... <laughs> oh, ain't like nothing it. but a mistake. Tell, Tell me why I never want to hear you say I want it that that way. way. <laughs> See? Hey, I love the song. I, I do. It's a, got a great beat and it's a lot of fun. I like the way they sing it.
for him. Um, really good, you know, playing out of the pick and roll, lobs, spray out for threes. Um, and then if he gets going, you know, obviously he has really deep range. So uh, for him, just trying to limit free throws, limit floaters, you know, limit the easy stuff for him. Make him, make him try to work for it. Molly and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 670 to score. That is the voice of uh, Alex Caruso, and he's going to defend whoever gets hot. Probably start on Trey. Um, Makes unless, sense. Unless maybe um, Ayo is able to go, but well, they don't know it, about that. Caruso, whoever he guards, is going to be a long night for that person. Ideally, he is going to be, uh, I think, another member of the all-defensive team in the NBA. Who's the all-defensive player? Uh, that's a good question. Wemby by a mile, right? Probably With so. All the blocks. Probably so. Alex Caruso is interesting though because he is the guy that does a little bit of everything. He'll be a big part of the reason why if the Bulls win tonight, you, you expect it's because Caruso will have done something to impact the game defensively, hit a big shot, made a big pass. He's always in the middle of everything. He's the guy that you really uh, like in these big moments. That's why he was a part of the pool of players that they looked at the Olympic U S Olympic team. Yep. And yesterday they announced the top 11. Now nobody's going to argue with that 11. Well, that's the problem. He didn't argue with. It. And I know he said that he understood he gets down to 11. They have one roster spot left. Maybe he's still eligible. Maybe they're looking for, um, something later. They'll know why they, I think Kawhi's the last roster spot already for They're waiting for him. No. I, yeah. I think, I think it's already kind of been reported that Kawhi Leonard is the last roster spot for uh, team USA. Okay. So that's a 12 K. He is the 12th guy. So here it is. LeBron, Steph, Durant, Embiid, Tatum, Kawhi, Booker, Drew Holiday, AD, Anthony Edwards, Bam, and Tyrese Halliburton. Not really any room there for chemistry. In, uh, a guy it creates chemistry, Mr. Defense. I mean, there's no shame in Alex Caruso. It was great that he was even considered, but I think he understands what's going on there. That's quite a, that's quite a team. Yeah. No arguments there. Yeah. That Caruso role is kind of like now, like Drew Holiday yeah, for their team. Yeah, right. That he's is he the, the the grit guy? Yes. Drew Holiday is the grit guy in that That's team. Exactly right. That's what he is. I don't know who else would Halliburton. He might be pretty. He a little grimy, but everyone else, you're talking about getting them all to agree is interesting. Nobody is opting out, and you'll notice. Oh, wait, let me look at that again. No James Harden. No James Harden. The beard yeah. is not going to Paris. Interesting. So that's Team USA. And the big controversy, not controversy, there's some question was as to whether the women's team will include Caitlin Clark. I don't know how you leave the country without her. I think it was Lisa Leslie that mentioned that. I'm with her. I'm agreeing with Lisa Leslie on this one. You can't have an Olympic team without Caitlin Clark. Do it for the basketball reasons, but also just merchandise. Uh, Imagine that Olympic jersey, how fast that will sell. God bless America. Capitalism rules. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I totally agree with that concept. I don't think, I just wonder how it's going over. And I wonder how the WNBA players and the other players on that team and whoever they feel They've got to cut to make sure that there's a college star and not just a college star, but someone's going to bring tons of attention to it. I mean, I, I for me, there should be gratefulness that you got somebody bringing that kind of fandom to your sport, that many eyes on your game. That's also a delirious comment by me because the way people operate isn't that, oh, this is great. I got more eyes on me. The way they operate is I'm better than her. Well, maybe so, show. but that I found it interesting, the video of the Indiana Fever players watching the announcement of Caitlin Clark as the number one pick the other night. They were ecstatic. They were celebrating. They were hugging. They were like, okay, we're gonna be we're gonna be part of this, part of something special. Two million people watched the WNBA draft. Two million people. They sold tickets for the WNBA draft this year. I don't think it was to see who 
the mercury we're going to take. And look at the jersey sales through the roof. I was online because I want to take my daughter to a Sky game. And it was before the draft. I was watching it. And I was trying to look for the fever game. I think it was around the cheapest ticket was the highest one was $123. Now I checked after it, after the Angel Reese and all that stuff. It's like $200 yes. for the cheapest seat. It is. $220, I think they said yesterday. Just call it in, man. Just let people know who you are, what you do, and get the free tickets on the floor. Do you recognize my voice? Do you know who I am? Do you know how bad I could make you look? <laughs> do you know what I do? You know what audio I can play right exactly. now? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's a dangerous man there, Brandon Fryer. That's exactly right. Yes. Here. But that is it is a real <laughs> thing. You know, 220 the the, the inflation in implies interest, which implies it's uh, the arrival. economics, right? Isn't yeah, that what they it call is it? Caitlin it's Caitlinomics. Re there's really a name for it, which is the price of the ticket and the Number of people that are spending on merchandise and all of the impact financially. A lot of these multipliers are nonsense, but one of them assigned, I think, $82.7 million in economic impact. Yeah. I think on the Caitlin Clark effect on the state of Iowa. I, I mean, listen, I'm sure there were a lot of jerseys. We talked about that. How many Prada outfits were sold? <laughs> right. Have you thought about that? Do you see what that was worth? It was crazy. Like $17,000. I mean, what? More power to her. Oh, Whatever she more can power do. To everyone. More power to everyone. This, it's a fantastic movement. It's something that is is cool to be a part of. And here in Chicago, the sky, I think, regardless of uh, how it was graded, I think the draft brought the sky back one step closer to a little bit more relevance in the city in terms of the sports landscape. Yeah. I mean, listen, God bless her. I think that's great. Uh, I'm worried about Canada, though. Is, is Shea Gilgis uh, Alexander the – Star of the Canadian, he's the best Canadian basketball player since probably Bill Wennington. <laughs> probably so. No, I'm just, I'm just making a nod. Hey, well, listen, Bill and Michael Jordan combined for 57 points one night. That's right. Yeah, just ask. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's pretty funny uh, when you think about that guy. I mean, if you're putting together an MVP list, where does he fit? Either first or second for the impact he's had Stop this year. Three. I mean, you know, Jokic yep. probably is going to win it. SGA's on the list. And, but he's definitely yeah. second, first or second. A lot to like there. That, that high. Ahead of Luca, who is also high on that list. That's your top three, those three guys. I wouldn't uh, argue with that. No. I don't think you can. I don't think I'm going to let you. Damn I it, could, David. but it's time to talk to Ozzy. All right. We got to get to our guy. Ozzy Gian joins us next. It's Mully and Haw on the score. He's a tick away. Mully and Haw, mornings on Sports Radio 670, The Score. Take them with you wherever you go on the free Odyssey app. It is funny, and it's so absurd. Oh. Where's the fly swatter? Miss something on the show? Use the rewind feature within the Odyssey app, or subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you both. I start work at 5.30 in the morning, and you guys are always there. I'm listening to Danny Parkins, and... They ended the show, you know, Friday. You know how we all are. Last segment of the week, you're like, okay, we're we're just done here. And uh, Tanny, Chris Tannehill, obviously, you know, setting setting Danny up for for an easy, a nice easy tribute at the end of the show with Meatloaf and Louie Anderson passing away. And Tanny set him up, and Danny might have missed. His name is Robert Paulson. Fight Club, R.I.P. Louis Anderson. Wait, Meatloaf? <laughs> Man, we were so oh, close to the no. finish line here. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Both are appropriate. I was reading about Louis Anderson during the break. <laughs> Fight Club, R.I.P. Louis Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell something was wrong when he was saying it because there was a little hesitation, but he followed through with Louis Anderson. Fight Club. R.I.P. Louis Anderson. There, that was Fight Club, and Louis Anderson did die. They, so they, technically, he's still correct. Yes, they aren't independently incorrect. It just one has nothing to do with the so other. Now we, so now we can just use R.I.P. Louis Anderson for everything. R.I.P. Louis Anderson. Yep. That's right. Are the we all accidentally RIP people. RIP Louis Anderson. Wait. <laughs> the best is is 
He's so smooth. The end of it is pricelessly good. Fight Club. R.I.P. Louis Anderson. Wait. <laughs> the the pause, like wait. the pause between <laughs> R.I.P. Louis Anderson and wait. <laughs> You're like, hold on. Like, you, you know Shane and Tanny lost it. Yeah, it's also the music underneath, the boogie-woogie <laughs> yeah. blues underneath. I don't know what, I, I I can't tell exactly what it is, but that sounds like some sort of Texas boogie-woogie. Fight woogie. Club, R.I.P. Louis Anderson. Wait. <laughs> he saw, yes, he, I, it, it, okay, he's sitting here, he looked through the glass, and he saw Shane absolutely explode, and ta and Tanny do one of his, like, hands in the air, like, whoa, and the, and the lean back in the chair. I, that's exactly what he saw. He knew something went wrong. It's like when you see the phones all light up, yep. and, I, and I know that I've misidentified something, but that is, oh my God, that's, that's. That's wonderful. Yeah, the wait is my favorite part. It's wait. not even close. <laughs> oh, that's Paradise by the Dashboard Light? That is that part of it? I don't know that part of it. I do I guess I don't know the song that wait. well. <laughs> that is, that's just so, the pause. Fight Club. R.I.P. Louis Anderson. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> the silence gets longer and longer the more you listen to it. Pre and post analyst for NBC Sports Chicago. La Pantera. My main is La Pantera. La Pantera. La Pantera. No. Pantera. La Pantera. There we go. 2005 World Series winning manager of the White Sox. Tying run at second. Two out. Palmero. Over the head of Jenks. Uribe charges throws. Out! And the White Sox have won the World Series. Juan Uribe with a play. Charging it. Throwing it. And the White Sox celebrate their first title in 88 years. No hold bar baseball opinions. Hey, I want to play myself. It's hard. Okay? It's hard to hit 300. It's harder to hit all 90. Ozzie Guillen with Mully and Hoff on 670 The Score. Mully and Hoff, Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. It's always a delight to talk to the man himself, and Ozzie Guillen joins us on The Score Hotline. Good morning, Ozzie. How are you? Good morning, guys. Very well. Very good. It's good. Good to yeah. talk to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish the Sox were a better team. I really do. <laughs> but it's always great to talk to you. I, I just, 
I look at what's happened thus far, and honestly, without being crude or rude, it feels like it was planned. It feels like you couldn't be this bad unless you tried. Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to watch, hard to talk about it, hard to be nice when you can be nice, hard to make sure mm. our people watching our show uh, don't think we are cover anything. We have to talk about it the way it should be, what the fans want to hear. Uh, believe me, it's, it's, it's not easy uh, to talk about this every day because it sounds like a broken record because every night, every day, it seems like the same stuff, you know, same type of game, same type of attitude, same type of the way they go about their business. Uh, you know, we, we keep praying every day. Hey, just hopefully it's a better game today. We can talk about it or we can watch a better bo- baseball game. Uh, we continue to be waiting for that date. Uh, I mean, obviously, a uh, couple of games, uh, we don't pitch well, but we every time we pitch good, offense, very struggle, nothing getting going. Uh, I never see anything like that. I mean, you can see a few players struggle during the year, you know, I mean, during the yeah. particular time. You can see two, three guys struggle, but when you see nine guys struggle, uh, don't don't even look good at the plate. Uh, you know, I mean, it just uh, seems like a, like you're watching a movie day in and day out. It's a bad movie, Ozzy. It's hard to watch. So let's talk about something that is a little bit more interesting right now. We'll get back to the Sox in a moment. What was it like meeting Bill Belichick, and how long did it take you to ask for his for him to take a picture with you? Uh, uh, listen, I, I first time I met him, I, you know, we uh, I talking in the. Uh, in, in the entrance of the clubhouse, and he walked with uh, with Tony. Tony said hello, introduced me to to the man, and I know who he was. Obviously, I know what it was. Like, oh my god, I see this guy a lot. But you know, I mean that name. <laughs> I can even still his name. Then I told my kid, and, and Chuck told me who he was. I told my kids who he was. Then okay, and he said you take a picture. I said no, nah, not really. Uh, I don't have time. I'm afraid. Then we went up uh, to Jerry's uh, suite to watch the game. I want to say hi to Jerry and Tony Shaw. Mr. Belichick show up, and we start talking. I mean, little by little, but I was my kids said, take a picture with it. I was so afraid, or so nervous. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm very outgoing guy, but I was like, and then he was eating. He was taking with nobody. Uh, man, then all of a sudden. I said, man, I got to take a picture before I leave. I have to go to work. <laughs> then uh, it finished up eating. Then, hey, I say, can, I told uh, Tony, uh, can we take a picture with me, sir? I said, of course. But it was so nice. I thought, like, oh, well, get behind me and we take a picture. Get off the chair. I got an opportunity to uh, take a picture. It was outstanding. Then one thing, I don't know. You may only see him on TV. My kid just texts me. Ozzy Jr. texts me like that. He got a smile on his face. I go, man. I said, no, this man never smiles to no one. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was a great experience. You know, obviously Tony, uh, it's a lot of to do with my influence in baseball manager, coach, player. Uh, me, one of the uh, best coaches in the history of any sport in the United States, and he, the man was so nice with me. He was, uh, I don't want to say a drink or two because I really. I know who it was, obviously. I watch football, obviously, but I'm not into a football uh, NFL that much. Yeah, I mean, listen, the two of you, great winners, right? And and uh, Tony, great winner as well. You know, it says something about being able to win a championship in any sport, and, you know, he's got six of them. I don't think you can look at him as anything other than a great coach, and that's not even counting the ones when he was with the Giants and he was with Parcells and he was putting together game plans to win. Guy's a great coach. Uh, you know, it, well, it's sad to see what happened this year, but, you know, you can't argue how great the guy is. It's a funny because uh, somebody asked him, uh, what do you do in town? You know what I mean? And he said, no, I'm going to see, uh, to visit Tony. And the guy said, you don't have anything better to do? <laughs> <laughs> Then it was, uh, you know, my, it's, uh, I, I take the picture like normal. All of a sudden, the picture it went virus. 
people was like, wow, you know, look at, look at you out there. You know, me just, uh, I think, uh, by the way, my, my son, I think people with few prisons in the United States and Venezuela and, uh, you know, around the, around the, around Latin America. But my kids say that that's the biggest picture you ever take in your life. <laughs> like, oh my. No, it, it, you know, man, obviously there is for fan, but uh, I take pressure, you know, with Obama and take a, you know, take a picture of a lot of people. And, and my kids say that that's the biggest picture you ever take in your life. And maybe the biggest picture you might take in your life. And I'm like, wow, I didn't realize, you know, man, I know it was good. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong, but I, I never thought it was that great of a coach. Yeah, no, he was absolutely incredible. You, what, what? Speaking of coaching, what the hell do the Sox do with guys like Ben Attendee, Andrew Vaughn? Do you have to sit down people, even if you're, if they're a high draft pick, if you're paying them money? I mean, what do you do when you can't score a damn run? You know what? I feel for Pedro, man. I can. I, I, maybe that's the first time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because Pedro got his hands tied up. He does. You know, I mean, you can make the lineup. You can try fixing the lineup. You can try thinking about the lineup. You can. And, but everybody, every day, is, they respond the same way. They respond the same way. Uh, I like the way the, the lineup was made yesterday, last night. They, they, they put Bonnie on the bench just to, hey, you know, relax a little bit. And then now uh, Jimenez up. Uh, now, it's, uh, you know, you're going to face a very pretty good, tough days to make the lineup. To me, shit, you have to play. Then the guy is in the bat. Right now, not seen about well at all. Is funny. Now we got to play Jimenez, and uh, you know, I mean, you get in the spot like, man, I had to, maybe you don't want to play Jimenez, but he had to. Right. You don't have any choices. I, that happened in baseball. I say, hey, I don't want to play Jimenez. The, the uh, shit is, is better than, than Jimenez right now. But you know, I mean, sometimes you have to do it. I mean, not sometimes you have to do it most of the time when the guy's healthy and he's the best hitter you have. You got to play him, but. Uh, I like the way he did it yesterday. He said, you know what? I got to sit, sit Bonnie down. Uh, whatever excuse you're going to make, like, I want him to have day off. I want him to clear his mind. I have, no, this guy is better than you right now. And you got to move on. And, you know, I mean, this game, uh, you know, you don't think it with your, you know, with your heart. You can think it with your brain. And it's no hard feelings. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's something, sometimes you hate to do it, but you don't have any choice. So when your teams would struggle at the plate, maybe not to this extent because this is historically bad what the White Sox are doing, having been shut out six times in the first 16 games, they're on a record pace. What can you do besides changing the order of the batting order, changing maybe uh, uh, something here or there? Is it is it salvageable? Is there anything you can do as a manager or are you just helpless and waiting for people to get hot? Well, it's kind of because no matter what you try, don't don't say work. I, I think the only way you can try to, to protect that guy with a better hitter behind is you don't have any better hitter behind him. That's the only way you like. Okay, I'm gonna hit this guy first. Uh, I'm gonna hit him second because they gotta throw. You know, they gotta pitch to him because my body third. He should be the best hitter, but my body third don't produce either. And that's kind of that's what they happen with the White Sox right now. I don't have to pitch to anybody. At least I have to because all those guys got a holes, swing the bat early, they didn't have any plan. I, I bet you they will. They have a plan. It's no doubt about it. They have a plan. But when they go to the play, it seems like they don't have any plan. They, it seems like swing a bat eight, from the first hitter to the ninth. Uh, I always believe, a lot of people say, I'm going to give him a day off. A lot of believe the only way you come out of the slum is playing. But then also, it's a match. I come out as long as winning, and uh, right now I don't see anything go forward to them. You know what I mean? They make a mistake on the in the defense. They just talk about we're going to have a go glovers everywhere in in, in in the lineup, and right now they're not doing that. Pitching has been okay. The lead has been good. Cop has been great. Uh, the two kids they come from um, I think the Atlanta. I don't. I can figure out the name right now. Uh, they throw the ball good. And uh, you know, there are a couple of things out there uh, you like to see uh, at least a couple a couple of pieces out there. But I think I think offense has got to be better. They got to get better, but they got to move the guy over. We have opportunity early in the season. We got men of second base. We know out like three innings in a row, and we even smell 
to score the guy. And that helped, you know, that not help them right now. I was thinking about it, Ozzy. Like, you know, at one point they got Rios and brought him in, and it was basically they were trying to stop someone else from getting But then you had Alex Rios, and you had to keep playing him, and he was doing nothing. Is that kind of what's going on with Ben Attendi? Is that kind of what's going on even with Vaughny? I mean, they're not getting the job done, and I know they were going to rest him for a day, and I know that Pedro said, well, he's, you know, a tick away, a click away, whatever. But, I mean, they're in such a worse situation than you ever were because they're not getting runs from anywhere. And David mentioned it. Like, this is historic futility. Don't they have well, to intercede? And, you know, I, I'm not saying, you know, Rios was struggled. But in the meantime, when we signed Rios, I don't know. I don't have any place to play him. Right. I mean, it was kind of hard for me. Because I had, like, three right fielders. And they had the edge. I think to me, similar when uh, – when Adam Dunn. Right. No, that's managing. Yeah. Adam Dunn. Uh, my kids hate me. My wife like, why do you keep playing that, man? Why you? I said, <laughs> no, I swear to God. This is not to me. I think that's the worst move I make as a manager. I make a lot of bad moves, obviously. But uh, to me, I, I, won't, I don't want to play him, but I have to. I mean, Alex is, is not taking his walk. He's not hitting for home run. He struggled at the plate. I try to figure out, we, you know what I mean? I remember Kenny bring kids from the minor league to face him in uh, what it was. Uh, I think we was in Colorado, left and righty. You know, they did everything we can have in all power. Get this man going, and I keep playing. I don't know. Right now, is I look myself in the mirror and say, "You were stupid playing that guy." But I don't have any choices? You know what I mean? I, I have no choice. I just like the only one they gotta come out is just hitting, uh, and I, I have uh, you know what I mean obviously. Back then, I have more power than Pedro right now. And Pedro say, hey, I don't want to play these guys. Ah, eh, 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 you're playing. What Pedro going to do? You got to play. But I don't think, the, the, you know, the, the, the talent is out there. I don't, think they, I, I don't think they have the talent in the way they talk about it. No chance. They have talent to play in big. That's the reason they're playing in big league. But when you talk about how much talented they are, uh, that's the spring training Pedro talking. Uh, how much talented we are, how much who we gonna be? How you know? I, mean, I don't see that happen. I, I know you know what, and I, I don't see any any happening anytime soon. Believe me, hopefully happen today. They win two games today. A little bit, at least you win one game. You show up to the ballpark next day with little, little bit more hope and enthusiasm. But right now, right now, to right now, what what time? Is it? Eight fifteen, whatever it is. I don't see that happen. I don't, I, I, I don't know why. I'm not excited about it, and uh, you know me. Hey, we room for them every day. <laughs> I room, we room for them every day, especially with Chuck. You know, Chuck is, is bigger White Sox than than in South Pole. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, uh, but uh, it, it just it's, uh, it's, it's hurt, man. It's hurt. In, in NBC yeah. studio, everybody down there hurt. Yeah, I come out and I, I come out in the morning and make him now. Uh, good morning, my people. It's a new day today. But everybody's hurt. Everybody's seeing right. each other right face to face. Like, what the hell? What to happen now? What are we going to talk about? It? What are we going? How the producer going to come up with something right. good for the show? Good for the show, but also good for the fans. We cannot talk about, oh wow, you know, tomorrow will be a new day. No, we got to tell the fans the truth. They like it or not. They, they, that's our job. And uh, believe me, the poor producers, you know, Jason, all those guys, they, they, they had to suffer. Because they to put that show together is not easy. And Ozzy is as gifted as you are at talking, and as much as you know about baseball, that is the challenge about talking about the same type of futility each and every day. Does it remind you of anything? The some of the worst teams maybe you were a part of. What is the secret to getting through something like this? They got 146 games left, and it's April 17th, and that every day it feels like. You know they're they're playing two games today, and all you can feel like as a baseball observer is why why are you subjecting us to that kind of punishment? Well, it's just one thing. I played for a lot of bad teams. Yes, I did. I played for. I never lose one of the games in my life, but I did play for. Hey, you got to go by yourself. You got to go there proud of yourself. I hit two forty before, but every day my two forty was hard nose two forty. I work with Walter Rinia every day. You know what I mean? That's why he appears. We working on it. We work. We work. We work. 
you know, yeah, that's a job. You have to work. I did it. We walked to Rina every day, and Frank Toma hitting 350, 50 home run, 100 some RBI, 120 walks. I think he work with the same coach, same time, same attitude, same approach, everything. I hit 220, 40 RBIs, and no home runs. You know, it's just your talent. Talent will take over. But I think right now, I, I, I hear a lot of things, a lot of guys say it's pressure. They put too much pressure on themselves. They might have. Yes, they do. It's not easy, guys. Go to the plate and look up to the scoreboard, and you see one is your first number or zero. You know what I mean? Like, oh, 190. We got six guys, six hitting on the 200. Six. <laughs> no, I, it's I think you, 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 even, if you If you can try that, I don't think you're going to do it in the big league. And I see a lot in the big league, guys. I see three or four guys hitting on the 200. How those guys stay in the big league? How those guys still playing? You no, know, these White Sox, Major League Baseball. You see few people that I know hitting 140, 200, 220, and they still have a job in the big league. Uh, what an easy thing. It's a beautiful thing. When you play in the big league, you're hitting 220, you still have a job. See, and I think it's the thing that's so frustrating is that the line they sold us to start the season is they were going to play smart baseball. They were going to play fast. They were going to be able to to play better defense. And they were going. And I know Moncada's out, and I understand Luis Robert. It can't be found. And it's weird to see to go from a six two guy running the outfield to a five seven guy. It's just totally different. But. They make tons of blunders. It's not like they're playing clean baseball and not hitting. It's not like the, the whatever line they were selling us has come through. They're they're kicking the ball around. They're not. Pedro said on Sunday that you feel like if a guy hits the triple, how are you gonna you know you, if you let in the run, you could lose the game. How, how do you win in that circumstance? You know, I mean, obviously we had the two three best hitter in, in the middle line. Of a lot of people, a lot of teams. In baseball, when you have the three big guys back to back to back hitters out in the lineup, it's going to be hard. Right. But those hitters, but those guys, they're not their fault. We have a bad at bat. We play bad defense. You know what I mean? We know they're not going to score the way they are because those three guys are there. But we, we, we sound defensively sound like the Pedro say. Where? We ask you Smith to play your stuff. You know how, you know what I mean? It, it, they're talking about like we bring gold glove to the, to the team. We don't. No. They sort of show my girl, and we all my respect. They're not a gold glover. You know, those guys in the outfield, they're not a gold glover. And uh, we, we pray those guys like, a, we preach those guys like, a, well, you know, we're not going to make a mistake. You know, you ain't not going to do this. You got Sosa playing third base. You got a uh, Goni play for say That's not a gold glover player. They're not. Now, Maldonado, I don't think Maldonado is a good glover anymore. No. He was, he was a good catcher. Well, yeah, I cannot take that away from him because he was. He went before. He, he went through a lot. But besides that, we don't have a good defense. I don't care what people say. I don't play, care what Pedro pray. No. And we don't have a great defense. We don't. The only defense we have in the past, past it was our third baseman yeah. and our center fielder. Body, it was all fielders. You know what I mean? Pantera and center field and uh, got a third base. Look at the, everybody out, like normal guys with a glove on their hands and not a gold glovers. And that, that's that's why I want you to say we're going to play better defense. Well, you know, bring different players, you bring the same guys almost. And uh, I, I think that's why defense killed them a little bit. Uh, if Pedro don't say anything, say, hey, listen, guys, we're going to go and play. Let's go play. But then say, oh, we work on it. We're going to be better. We just started this. We That's why right now all the organization, because I think Pedro uh, tell people something he don't have in their hands. He don't. I mean, Pedro try to be the best guy. I don't blame him. I don't blame him to try to make sure the fans, like, we, but also he don't make any help for him. To say, well, we'll be okay. We work on it. We work on it. We what? And I think, I think right now, we just say, you know what, guys? We're going to play 140 games, and we're going to play the best game we can play. We got, you know, I mean, that quick. We're working hard. We're here early every day to work. Now, you know, what I mean, at the end of the day, 
play is the one you go to make play good for you, or they're going to play bad for you. That's 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 the bottom line. All right, now it's time for Ozzy's outlook. Brought to you by Four Winds Resort and Casino. What do you see in today's White Sox games, and of course the Cubs play tonight? Who you taking? Right now the Cubs that uh, are broken last night, but I think I, I, I watching the offense against the face, the guys they got to face. Uh, they they swing the ball pretty good against them. I, I like the Cubs today with the White Sox. I a, a split. Really. Split. Third win of the year. Yeah, that's that's success. That's a good day. I, I spent a split. I want to play a split because uh, it's hard to uh, win the doubleheader. Uh, I, they're pitching well right now. Wap, I throw the ball pretty good. But I, I spent a split for White Sox uh, this, this afternoon. Great stuff, Ozzy. Thank you. Thanks, Oz. All right, guys. Have a good one. You too. That is Ozzy Gian. That is a difficult job. It is. Talking about it's April the 17th. Team is this bad? It's going to get harder. Yeah, they're they're about as bad as you could imagine. They're the worst right? team in baseball to watch. They're the hardest team in baseball to watch. Yeah, they're the hardest team in baseball to watch because Just don't give up a triple. Nobody cares about uh, the A's. <laughs> or three one two six forty four sixty seven sixty seven. Mullion on the score. The Parkinson Spiegel Show on your ride home. Afternoons 2 to 6 on the score. Chicago Cub Nico Horner. What's it like in that dugout when Michael Bush homers? You never know what you're going to get on this show. Miss a little, miss a lot. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, Twitch stream suggesting an I'm a fat fish podcast coming up. I like this idea. I don't know how to interview a fish. Uh, Just make it up. (laughs) Who's going to voice the fish? I, somebody at our station. I think you can do it, Layla. What, what do fish sound guest. like? You could be the second guest on Between Two Fats. <laughs> I've wanted to be on the I'm Fat podcast for a while. You're, I think I even asked about this in like 2018 or something. You are not qualified. I, I need you to find the actor who played Porkins. The, <laughs> the, the Jedi. The, the, I know it was actually why wing fighter. Was he in? Going to blow up the Death Star. <laughs> no, it's on Porkins. <laughs> <laughs> the photon torpedoes, the design flaw, many bothans died to bring us this information. <laughs> His real name is William Hootkins. It's fully operational. That's like a great name. <laughs> and he won't be on because he's dead. He died in 2005. <laughs> he, oh, the yeah. actor died? Yes. Parkins from I just, Star Wars. <laughs> from Star Wars. Mob. Like, I, I always wanted the I'm Fat podcast to have, you know, the, 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 the fat X Wing fighter guy. Oh, my God, you lost me to Parkins from Star Wars. Please make this personal. <laughs>
taken an 11 to 8 lead a line drive down the left field line just fair and just gone Mully and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio 670, the score, Ian Happ, huge night, and of course that Grand Slam was uh, was the cherry on top, just fantastic, you really thought at that point that things were going the Cubs away. It was over, you yeah. thought it was over. Ian Happ batting seventh, moved down in the lineup, was struggling on the road trip. Craig Council shaking things up a little bit, moves Nico Horner into the leadoff spot, gets four hits, so that worked. Everything worked. The Cubs' bats were working at a high level. Get this. This is how crazy that game was. Pat Hughes was on top of his game. Hall of Fame best last night. That was a great Pat, Ron, and of course with Zach. Optistats tells us this, though, Molly. In the last 100 years, two Major League Baseball teams have had a game with at least four doubles, three triples, two innings with four or more runs, and... The Grand Slam we just heard. Two teams. One of them was the 1927 Yankees. They won that game 21 to nothing on July 4th, 1927. The other team, last night, the Cubs. Uh, you and they know, lost. The, the, the most amazing thing about that Grand Slam is that it ends a run of 17 straight Grand Slams by the Cubs that came from 17 different players. Happer uh, had a Grand Slam already, and so he they they had a they had a run going of Frank Schwindel, Matt Duffy, Trace Thompson, Wilson Contreras, Alfonso Rivas, Patrick Wisdom, P.J. Higgins, Nelson Vela Cruz, Cody Bellinger, Nico Horner, Alexander Canario. Ian Hamp, Jan Gomes, and Morell a week ago of 17 consecutive Grand Slams without the same guy repeating. And Happer now has ended that run with the the after 17 different players at a Grand Slam. That's that's extraordinary. It is. It's not significant. It, you don't. No, like it that? is. Yeah, yeah. I think the 1927 thing is funny too. They're both. They made a lot of history <laughs> for the wrong reasons, and they ended up with a loss. <laughs> So now the Cubs figure out what to do about their pitching situation. We'll talk to Tommy Hadovy at 9 o'clock. Obviously, the focus is on Kyle Hendricks, but I think the Cubs' real bigger concern revolves around the closer, Adbert Alzali. Great guy. I love the rapport he's established with Matt Spiegel on Hit and Run on Sunday morning. He's done a couple interviews now. His personality comes through, but he's not getting the job done. He's got three blown saves. The Cubs have seven losses. If he had been better off to a stronger start who knows what they would be looking at but it wouldn't be trying to need a victory today to win the series in Arizona because it's been it's not what you expect from Adbert Alzali you have enough questions in your bullpen on your pitching staff already without creating one with a guy who is healthy how do, you know how do you make a closer cuz that's kind of what they're trying here how do you create a closer you know, normally, when you think about closers, there's there are guys that either have come up and grown into the role or guys that have been established in a closing role and you brought them in. Or they're failed starters. Or they're, well, often they're failed starters. And Adbert Alzali might fit that category. I mean, he was a starter when he okay. came up. Remember when he had yeah. that debut and we were celebrating the arrival of Adbert Alzali, much the way we were celebrating and have been enjoying Ben Brown. I don't know if that's comparable, but Adbert Alzali at one point in time was expected to be part of the Cubs rotation. Didn't work. So now he kind of accidentally ended up at the back end of the bullpen last year and was excelling in high leverage situations. He, he sees the opportunity and he became the closest thing the Cubs have to a closer. I don't know if he's going to have the job all season. I hope he does. That would mean something has changed. He's not going to keep it this way. And you look at the White Sox with Michael Kopech, and you think, how, does, how did that happen? Well, he was a failed starter. He was a, I don't want to say failed bullpen arm, but this was kind of the last resort. And small sample size, they don't have a lot of leads to protect. They're 2-14, and 14, for goodness sakes. But that's how you create a closer. You kind of like 
last resort. Michael Kopech's taking a, the right approach to this. He's got the stuff, and he's throwing heat. I think it's a lot harder to be a starter than a closer. But I think that there's a specific mentality of a closer. And you have to you have to not worry about stopping someone. You just have to hit your spots and get outs. And, I, I mean, when I watch Elsley, you know, if he gets a line drive out, he's punching himself in the chest. He's so pumped up. All you got to do is get him out. But it's, you know, that's all when everybody is desperate to try to stay alive. So, that, but I think going through a rotation and trying to mix it up, and all, I think that's harder in the long run. I think with closers especially, it starts with velocity. Yes. Because of all the looks, that is the most intimidating. You can come at hitters. You can attack hitters. You've got the 98, 99, 100, whatever it is. You know, high 90 heat, and I think that's a good place to start. With the Cubs, I do wonder if this continues. Now, look. Craig Council, we always have to kind of preface this, not big on roles necessarily. Looks at guys as outgetters. Starters are, you know, guys who give you four innings. Starters could be openers. Guy who gives you, as Luke Little gave him, you know, one inning last week. I don't know what he looks for in a prototypical closer. He had good success in Milwaukee, but he had he had the best in the game in Josh Hader at one point. So with the Cubs. I would like to see if Albert Alzali continues to struggle, maybe the next time there's a chance to get the last four outs or three outs, give Keegan Thompson a chance. He certainly is a guy who has looked nasty since he's come up. Keegan Thompson looks like a different pitcher than he did last year. Nico Horner talked about it on the Parkinson Spiegel show. He looks as good as he has looked. Maybe he's learned some things in Iowa. Maybe he's corrected some flaws mechanically. I don't know what it is, but it's obvious to see. Well, especially today, right? There, there's. At, let, let's hope the Cubs are in a situation where there's, you know, either you're just protecting the lead or a save situation, but feel free to be up five or four or more in the ninth inning, right? But, you know, you, you cannot give Owsley the ball today. And I don't even know if you can give it to him the next time you're in that situation. You might have to go to Mark, Mark Leiter Jr., might be the yeah. guy. You know, they went to him a little early uh, last night. They got a hold out of him. But David, until last night, he hadn't he hadn't allowed an earned run. He had worked ten innings and hadn't allowed an earned run. I like him in that role, though. He's in those situations that are conducive to this is matchups, know, right? This is one of those things. You know, the the you know go get an out versus the roles, right? Well, and, I think I think also because the roles, the first eight innings, maybe this is something to be interesting to talk with counsel about. The first eight innings, I do think you play the matchup game as much as you possibly can. And he may be, okay, these two hitters there, these three hitters here, that's the part of the order's coming up. Let's do this and that. In the ninth, I don't think you have to worry about that if you have the right guy. If you have the right guy, it doesn't matter if you got two lefties coming up. If Keegan Thompson's your guy from the right side or Adbert Alzali, then he's your closer. Go get those three outs. I don't care who's up at bat. The, the difference in the bullpen this year, though, didn't they get Hector Neris? You know, isn't he supposed to be not not the closer necessarily, but the high leverage moment guy? And he hasn't lived up to that, right? And he was used the night before when he actually did get out. You know, Sunday he got out of a jam. Yes. Uh, Monday he got out. Of, he wasn't available. Yet. Right. I mean, they they played two extra inning games. Yes. In and tight games. It. Yeah. Up and down, back and forth. So their bullpen was spent. Yeah. Keegan Thompson wasn't available. He wasn't available. I, I understand. And they had nothing left but Drew Smiley at, at that point, right, to go, come in when he did and ended up losing the game. They used seven pitchers. You used seven pitchers, six after Kyle Hendricks, and that's going to tax your bullpen at the end of a road trip. The today. biggest question is Luke Little. Like, w why why Little there? You know what I mean? Like, why was that the first person they went to? Well, the problem was he had nothing. I mean, he. Couldn't, I'm sure the answer would be matchups. But he couldn't even he couldn't even get the ball over the plate. Well, well that's the he other was part. Bouncing of it. the ball right all there. over the place. It's also the couldn't fifth get inning. the ball over the plate. It was a fifth inning. Ten walks. Yes. As a staff, that's right. That, that's a problem. They have walked a lot of batters this year. I mean, once you get a lead, you got to trust your stuff, trust your defense behind you. This team is built 
on defense. And Christopher Morrell has actually been playing pretty good defense out west. He has. Actually, he's taken a step forward. I didn't have a problem with Luke Little at that spot because it was a contrast to Hendricks. It was also the fifth inning. And you had a sense at that point in the game, it was going to be a long game. I, mean, I almost felt like at that point, Craig Council thought, we aren't coming back from this. I'll throw Luke Little out there. Mm-hmm. And then Luke Little extends the lead, right? I, it just, I just, I, I'm just shocked that Luke Little was the answer right after Hendricks. And again, I'm sure, I'm sure it's matchups. I'm sure it's the whole righty lefty splits, the guy coming up had never seen Little, all that garbage, in my opinion. But I'm just surprised. It almost feels like they were kind of like, okay, you can have this one. But you said it. the 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 entire bullpen is kind of taxed. Every guy available has to be used, don't they? I yep. mean, don't you have to find a way? Well, I just, to... I just wouldn't have gone. I guess my point is second guessing. Of course, this is the. I wouldn't th- have gone. This to, is... I wouldn't have gone to Luke Little first. But this is what Craig Council's strength is supposed to be. Correct. So I think at some point in time, that's got to factor in. It's not his fault in. that Luke Little bounced two balls. Yeah, and, and, that's and the, not his fault. Last thing, I was, you know, Kevin from Palatine is 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 a great con- contributor to the show, and we always sometimes go with it too, like. This is a council loss. This is a Jed loss. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes the loss is a loss, the, and the players have to be held accountable. Right, right. And sometimes the pitchers are just bad. It may be the right decision and the right guy, but you just don't have a player come through. And sometimes it's a player loss. Kevin, wow, <laughs> it took long enough. When when did he when did he call it a Jed loss? Six o'clock. Six well, it's funny. A two one five texter. Wait, I thought it was a Ross issue. Oh boy. If Rossi was there, they would have lost worse. And that's a joke. All right. 312 644 67 67. It's Mully and Hall on the score. Tonight, the season is on the line for your Chicago Bulls as they face off with the Atlanta Hawks at the United Center and NBA's play in tournament. Listen tonight as Chuck and Bill bring you all the action. Baseline right runner by Kobe. Reverse good. Oh. Kobe White put on a show. Russo lets it fly. Three. Got it. Big time shot. Pre game coverage starts at 8 15. Tip off at 8 30. Let's go to Hammond and welcome Ryan to the score. Hey, Ryan, what's up? Is that a collar version of being Rick Rolled? It's like a ringback tone, I think. Obviously, that wasn't there when I screamed it. So, so, (laughs) some bit has happened. No, I think maybe he put us on hold while starships are meant to fly. Yeah, maybe he put us on hold while he was he's at work. He put us on hold. (laughs) All righty then. I I thought it was a Rick Roll thing. Yeah, no, we're not getting Rick Rolled. He had a point. Don't, don't. He had a thought. Bow. Well, <laughs> you there, Ryan? <laughs> no, he's not there. Bilal, you there? Bilal, you there? All right, man. All right, we're going to get rid of Ryan. Yeah, here. let's get rid of Ryan. One for two. <laughs> all right. One for two in terms I, of fighting a human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd go to my guy Skillet out there in Effingham. Skillet! Okay, yeah, sure, Skillet. Where you been? Hey, I've just been driving my 18 wheeler around. I just got one opinion on this hire. <laughs> okay. You you get you get some management that's gonna put put on a no name uh, coach like that, and to me that just kind of sounds like they're trying to save money. And I don't know if that's the recipe to win a division when Rodgers is out the door and the Bears are as good as the Vikings. I mean they're knocking on the door here; they got a real shot at it to win. And I think that if you get a top notch uh, OC, then this uh, head coach is higher is just a moot point. But now look look at this guy, Urban Meyer. I mean, he, he didn't really do nothing that wrong. Okay. And all, all he has to do is go coach this field kid <laughs> again. Wondering. He won a national championship Skillet. with him. Why wouldn't was, you pay him $10 million and yeah, go try was, to win a division? Where are you really from, Skillet? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, all right. Well, there, there, yeah. In NFL news, Urban Meyer, what a piece of crap. <laughs> ah, the West lever has been pulled. The, the Les West lever. lever. Love the West lever. All right. Well, Skill it. Effingham is where they have the giant cross down there, right? Uh, on off the highway. The, and and so Skill it. There are three of them. Three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Is I that there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> a few I have one for three. All right. That's a music <laughs> reference you didn't get.
get tickets now at Ticketmaster.com. You wanna? Molly and Haw will be back in 60 seconds on The Score. When people have a craving to explore new and traditional Asian... sense and I try to remember over and over that you know the things we think about in April and the things that we talk about in April like so oftentimes by June let alone August seem so remote so that's hopefully how I'm looking at this this you know rough rough three starts that you look up and it, it, he's just it was clearly a bad patch and then he, he got he got going again and pitched really well Mully and Haw Chicago Sports Radio 670 the score that, of course, is Jed Hoyer, uh, the president of the Chicago Cubs. And uh, we should let you know that we still have a couple pairs of tickets to give away for the Cubs uh, coming home. The Cubs uh, finishing up tonight in Arizona. They'll be home for Friday's matchup, 120 starts against the Florida Marlins, uh, and you can win yourself a pair of tickets. we got a couple more to give away, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, David, we got a, a texter checks in who says, wait, what happened to Cody Hoyer? Is he mm-hmm. come, isn't he supposed to come up and take – Cody Hoyer, if, as you recall, did briefly serve as a uh, – as a closer, I think he last played in 2021. No, he w- had Tommy John surgery. Sox property traded to the traded Cubs with Badger Gold. To the promising Cubs. young reliever threw hard. Tommy yeah. John surgery came back last June fractured and his fractured elbow? his elbow. Now he now uh, he's with he signed a, ten days ago with the yeah. Rangers. He's in the Rangers minor league system. Yeah. Product property of them, and yeah. now they can bring him back. And maybe if he can stay healthy, he'll be something for them. But he is not an option. No, he's, he's not an option in that he's bullpen. No longer. A, it's like you calling for Keegan Thompson. You can't call for Cody Hoyer. He's been designated for assignment, I believe, in November. He's not in the organization. Took so him a while, but now he's with. The don't have options, and I think that Keegan Thompson's an option. A closer. The Cubs have options with Kyle Hendricks. I don't know if the if the injured list is is a realistic one. Uh, one of our callers mentioned that. Billy Epler from the Mets got in trouble uh, for doing that, for kind of phantom injuries. You can find ways, and I just don't know. I just don't know if it's feasible. How many more starts are you going to give Kyle Hendricks if he continues to struggle? He's given up seven home runs in 17 innings. It's a small sample size, and his, he has a larger body of work that you respect, but you're also trying to win a division here. Would you maybe throw him a bone and make sure that he has a start against Florida on Sunday? Probably would give him a chance at home at Wrigley Field. A, a Bad an team. Environment that he knows well against a team that he can, you know, d- probably fare pretty well against. It's not, you they know. They played a good schedule. I mean, I know other people have been successful and he hasn't, but it's not like he's going against the baddest, the worst. Of all but he put his team in a tough spot yesterday. They score 11 yes. runs and they lose, and part of the reason was that Kyle Hendricks was not good to start the game. So today they have an opportunity to win the series. Still, Jordan Wicks and Brandon fought right here on the score. Pre-game coverage begins at 2.05 with first pitch at 2.40. It's going to be one of those games that to come home for a homestand. You would like to get a win on the way out the door. Yeah, it's a getaway day for the Cubs. And as you say, be here on the score, 205 in the first pitch at 240. And then later on, 
The Bulls take on the Hawks at the United Center in the NBA play-in tournament. We'll have that, too. The pregame coverage begins at 8.15, tip-off at 8.30, and this, of course, is the only local broadcast of the game. It can be heard right here, 670 the score, and in Chicagoland on the free Odyssey app. Big day. Big day here at the flagship and big day in the city for the Bulls in town, the Hawks. Uh, the Hawks are an opponent the Bulls should beat. The, Bu- the Bulls should win this game tonight. Home court, beatable opponent, and there's really no excuse for the Bulls not to win tonight, even though they're as inconsistent as they have been. So I think that you have a chance. You know, the Cubs would like to win coming home, and then the Bulls have to win or else they're going out or else they're staying home. If the season's over tonight. If they don't beat the Hawks, it's over. Yeah, yeah, and – Again, you say that like it's a bad thing. I mean, I, I'm just saying, I hope they win the game. I don't feel the same kind of buzz I usually would feel about something like this, even last year. But then, you know, let's say they win. So they're going to go to either Philadelphia or to Miami. And that seems like it might be a difficult place to play either one. And then if they somehow get through that, that's how you get in. You need two wins Wednesday, Friday, and then you're opening up at Boston. Gulp. Gulp. No, thank you. Big gulp. Hey, uh, Dustin, did you see that uh, Baseball America uh, declared yesterday that uh, not only is your guy Michael Bush, who did not hit a home run yesterday, that's a pity. Because when you score when you score 11 runs, you automatically think he may have uh, been homering for one of them. Uh, but at any rate, he ends up uh, as a rookie and as eligible – should he win Rookie of the Year, they get the a first pick after the first round. They get a draft pick out of it. Do you feel differently about him being a rookie? No. Nope. You're still saying he's not a rookie? Nope. Okay. I'm and, dying on this hill, Mulligan. Answer your phone. Yeah, he's, his phone's ringing and it's very Man. important. <laughs> hello? hello? Hey, Crawley. He's he's dying on this hill. He's now on the air saying hello. <laughs> he's, he's talking on the phone. <laughs> on the air. Come on. First day. Oh, he's the best. <sighs> All right. All right. Tommy Hadavi next. You're listening to Mully and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 6 7 to score. This is Mark Grody with your draft spotlight on the score. The Bears are pretty set at safety with Jaquan Brisker and Kevin Byer, but Miami's Cam Kitchens has had his eye on the Bears since the combine because of his relationship with the. But what they have is they're teaching guys, as you say, to throw so hard so that guy comes in in the fifth or the sixth and he throws hard and it's your starters aren't necessarily the best guys anymore. Like the strategy has changed. I don't think it's the best for the fans. I'll tell you that much. Like the game has changed in a way that makes it not as entertaining, but there's got to be some things that you see that, that make some strategic sense at this point. Not anything I see up there. I think that's just ridiculous, and it's it's increasing injuries, and it's not maximizing on your best guys. And you know, you got in just listening to what you just said. Yeah, you're being dominated by the fake technology again. You think that all these guys throw ten miles an hour faster than we did back in the day? Just watch the videos. Watch videos of guys back in our day who were the hard throwing guys compared to now. They are measuring fastballs and balls right out of the hand now okay the jugs gun and the ray gun back in the day measured it as it crossed home plate Uh so there ain't no difference these guys i you know i've been there i've been with these guys that they say are throwing 100 and sitting there watching them going they ain't no different than anything i saw you know hitting against guys in spring training this is not but they're just trying to pump it up like they're doing such a great job and you look at this fake technology like everything else in the world here's the next thing that i that i laugh about and i actually have talked to a lot of the old umpires and a lot of new umpires about this stuff too about them wanting to do the technological robot umpire stuff too and i'm like okay i understand that but if you've actually seen the atlantic league funny posts that people made about strikes being called at balls that are like three feet outside and this night and When, you know, watch the news today. Oh, they're telling us all about more, you know, 
watch out because Russia's going to get into our technology and try to mess with our stuff. <laughs> Wait a minute. They can, they can get into our technology from Russia? Well, you don't think that uh, the front office can get into the technology that's running the strike zone at the home stadium. Oh, this is fun. I've I never, had never thought of that. I had never <laughs> considered this either, that like another uh, front office would override would the robot the umps. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and it wouldn't be every pitch. It would be, okay, base is loaded. You know, we got to get this pitch right here. Strike, go yeah. quick. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, that's the kind of stuff that I know would happen. You, somebody's going to do it now. You just gave him the idea. Jack, so thank you uh, for that. They think they don't have the idea. Come on, it's that's it's that's metrics and that's technology. <laughs> Ruin. Do you everybody. have a smartphone? It's, it's ruining our kids' lives. It's ruining our sports. It's ruining our countries all around the world. It's crazy. Do you have a smartphone? I'm on it right now, dude. So I'm sure that, that you know, hey, maybe Putin's listening to us. You never know. <laughs> it, it's not that interesting. I mean, it's good, but it, it's, yeah. it's, it's not that. This hour brought to you by Busey Bank, building business, growing wealth since 1868. Pitching coach Tommy Hottavy of the Cubs wearing the blue pullover. Tommy Hottavy, pitching coach for the Chicago Cubs. You're transitioning from being a player to kind of getting into baseball. You take an online class, was it, at Boston U, Sabermetrics 101? Yeah. I was a finance major in college and I had an economics minor. A lot of it was to, I'm going to refresh all my econ knowledge and I'm going to do it in a baseball course. It's, It's like one of the best things ever. There's just a lot of trust there with Tommy. We know he's such a hard worker. He puts in all the hours and really, really knows what he's talking about when it comes to pitching. Tommy Hadovy breaking down the starting rotation and bullpen on the north side with Mullen Ha. I'm here for one reason. I want to help these guys get better, and we want to win baseball games. Tommy Hadovy on 670 The Score. Score, score, score. Tommy. Mullen Ha, Chicago Sports Radio, 670 The Score. And now it is time to go out to the score hotline where Tommy Hadovy, the Cubs pitching coach, joins us like he does every other Wednesday. Good morning, Tommy. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you guys doing? Doing well. You know, at this stage of the road trip, after a three-hour and 38-minute marathon last night, one of the wackiest games you're ever going to watch and probably participate in, in your case, how are you feeling this morning? Are you are you run down? Does it seem like it's been a month since you've been home? Yeah, it, it definitely does. I mean, we've, you know, for the last, the last, I mean, year, if you look back at our series here last year as well, I mean, we have had some absolute grinder games um, here out in Arizona. And then, 
you know, it's a tough team. It's a tough team, and they're built to kind of grind out some of those games against you. And I feel like we're built kind of that same way. You see two teams just kind of going going back and forth in battle. And, you know, it's it's been it's been a long, you know, 10-day, nine-game road trip. And we're obviously excited for the opportunity to kind of wrap that up and, and end on a good note and get home and, and get to get back to Chicago. So Jordan Wicks going today, and I think you had a lot of hope invested in getting out of Arizona with the series victory. That would be big because you're in a tough spot. Last night did not go well for Kyle Hendricks, Tommy. And I think it's an uncomfortable conversation, and we've been trying to talk a little bit around it this morning, talk about the the elephant in the clubhouse, if you will. Kyle Hendricks has not been good, and seven home runs in 17 innings is is not – the kind of thing that I'm sure that you look at and Craig Council looks at that you guys can live with. Number one, is there anything obvious that stands out to you that he's not doing or what is wrong? And secondly, how difficult is it because of who he is? Yeah, I think number one, I think, you know, we saw a guy kind of early in the year that was trying to find some mechanical things and, and also try to call his pitches at the same time. And, and he's so smart and studious and what he wants to do and knows how he wants to attract, attack hitters. And, and sometimes you get a little one-dimensional. You kind of fall into patterns. And, and what I thought Kyle actually did really well yesterday working with Miggy is, is he did let Miggy call more of the game. And it kind of had more of an interaction of how things went. You saw how the curveball usage went up yesterday. I think he did 10 curveballs, which he, he threw, I think, seven in the first three starts combined. So, um, you know, he was able to mix a little bit more. The, the big thing is just when he, when he makes a mistake right now, he's paying for it. You know, and I think he gave up five hits last night and two of them were homers. And, and you know, one of them was just on a, a middle-end fastball to, to Guriel, another one on an 0-2 fastball to Jock that, you didn't, that Kyle just didn't execute. That's just not something we're used to seeing with Kyle. You know, when – when he's ahead, you know, he's usually getting guys out at a high clip. And, and, and then the other part that stood out from yesterday was just the, you know, going out for the fifth and those, those two walks, you know, that kind of put us in a tough spot there. You just, it's just uncharacteristic of Kyle. And I think, you know, when you're lacking confidence early in the year, you see guys tend to, to be a little bit more fine with how they attack hitters would be falling behind more often. And, and, you know, for Kyle, he's so good when he attacks a strike zone early and gets ahead and, and can just stay on the attack and be aggressive. I, I know there were some – it was still a tough outing for Kyle. There's still some positives to take out of it and the way he's feeling, the way he's moving, he's starting to get better. But like you said, you know, you get to a point where you need to make, you know, just results need to happen. And, and I know Kyle knows that and he feels that, but he's, it's not going to change his approach. He's going to continue to work. Be the be the you know steady guy that he is, and that's what you appreciate with guys going through this, and you know he's going to come out of it. And I think that you've got to be very careful with designating guys to the injury list without any real injuries. But I wonder if it's whether it's a, a mental or physical thing. It, would he benefit from t- ten days on the injured list or a, a, a vacation mentally? and a physical break, maybe to work on mechanics, or is that something that would be realistic or under consideration, Tommy? Well, I think, you know, we always got to make the best decision for, for the player and for the team, you know, and, and I think there are times where guys are dealing with, with mechanical issues that do stem from, you know, minor things going on. No one, no one ever feels great, you know, and I think guys are trying to figure out how they can navigate you know, how they're feeling, how they're pitching, and, and continue to get the work in they, they do. And sometimes that works, taking guys out of competition, giving them a mental break and let them work as, and focus on the things they need to do. Other guys benefit from just continuing to compete and grind. And it really just depends on where you're at, you know, in the season and what you're trying to do. I mean, we're, you know, we're at April 17th, and we're, and we're trying to see where we're at with our – with our rotation and trying to see where we're at with the bullpen and trying to give young guys opportunities and high leverage situations. So, you know, we're making decisions for, for the team. We're also trying to, to see, get a landscape of where guys are heading into the season. So let's stick with the rotation for a moment because health is a huge issue and it has been since Justin Steele went down uh, shortly into his first start. He's been around the team, Tommy. So I think I, I'm curious how far away is he is in what kind of progress is he making? And you're, Rotation also gets a boost. It seems like is Jamison Tyone on schedule to start Thursday at Wrigley Field. 
Yeah, uh, Justin's been, you know, feeling great. He's been he's been doing a really good job just going through this process very steadily and not trying to push. I think it's easy when you look around and you see the guys, you know, you you know, competing and grinding out there. You want to be part of it. Um, but he's, you know, he's doing a good job of kind of staying with himself, doing what he needs to do every single day and not trying to do too much. And I think that's such a huge part of, like, a rehab process for, for a young guy. And, um, you know, yesterday we went over to the complex being here in Arizona. We were able to kind of throw, you know, um, in, in our lab, get some bullpen, some biomechanical data just to kind of see – and compare to where he was early in the year and early in the spring. So it's a good good place for us to be able to start. You know, hopefully we're going to be at a point by the end of this week that we're going to be seeing some live BPs from Justin facing some hitters and, and just continue to progress from there. So, um, you know, he's, he's progressing on the schedule that we had kind of uh, we, we, whenever the guys get injured, we talk about having a, a kind of an advanced, aggressive schedule and more like a, a reasonable schedule. And I think he's been progressing on this more advanced, aggressive schedule pretty well. So um, still, still need to check some boxes. Still need to see where he's at over the next week. But but definitely feeling good about how Justin's feeling. And Jamison Tyone on schedule for tomorrow. Yep, Jamison, you know, should be, you know, barring anything, you know, going on over the next 24 hours. You know, he's he's been looking good. He worked he worked hard during his rehab outings, continued to focus in on what he needs to do to be successful. Um, mechanically, he's, he's, you know, in a much better place now than he felt like he was early in the year last year. You know, it's always good when you have more time with a guy. You get to know him over the course of a year, and you're able to help them make the adjustments that they need to make, but also what makes them tick and what and what helps them, what drives them. So I think, you know, we're excited to get Jamo back. We're excited to kind of start seeing some, you know, some familiar faces, um, you know, that we saw during the course of, of the year last year. And look, like we're going to need a lot of guys to step up this year. You know, we're going to need a lot of guys to contribute. And, and it's nice. It's going to be nice to get Jamo back. It's going to be nice when Steele comes back. But, you know, definitely feeling confident in a lot of guys that have been able to step up so far. Talking with Cubs pitching coach Tommy Hadovy here on Mully and Haw Show 670 The Score. And what a nice problem to have, Tommy, because we're talking about what to do with Kyle Hendricks. We're talking about how to fit in Jamison Tyone. And it's not as obvious as it might seem because you've got guys who have stepped forward. Javier Assad quietly is just very consistent. Ben Brown has been as good during the regular season so far since that first bad start uh, outing in Texas as he was in spring training when I think he convinced a lot of people that he was here to stay. Who's been more impressive? I mean, that's a embarrassment of riches right now, but you have those two guys especially that have stepped forward in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, you could you could look at both of those guys as as being you know, impressive in what they've been able to do. You know, it's really fun to see Ben Brown, you know, come up and, and make his debut and have a good outing, and then have one bad inning. And, and when you look at the totality of his season so far, that's all it's been is one inning, <laughs> you know, one tough inning in his major league debut against a very good offense. He's done everything else outstanding. He's answered the bell. He's, He's, he's been able to take the ball and go compete and, and stay aggressive and attack. And for a young guy that's coming up for the first time, that's what you want to see. Um, but, you know, Javi, for me, is just such a special pitcher. Um, he can do so many things with the ball. It, it, the way he moves it around, um, the stuff he has. When you watch his games, nothing is straight. You know, you're watching on TV and you just see how much movement he's able to create with the ball and execute you know, while doing it. And it's, it's just so fun to watch him pitch. Um, such a competitor. He's so fiery. Like, you know, just such a great personality when you're working with him. And he just continues to go out and do whatever we ask him to do. You know, if you, if you need him to close and go three innings, he could do it. If you want him to start and go six, he can do it. You know, he can pitch in so many different – he just wants to pitch. He just wants to pitch. He wants to compete. Um, and he's doing he's doing great. It's, yeah, I'm happy for him, and they want to continue to build and grow off what he's been able to accomplish. The versatility is so valuable, especially when you have so many different roles. And I know that Craig Council views it as not having – he doesn't really define roles as much as he just wants outgetters. That's the term that he has used consistently. But I want to ask you this. You look at Ben Brown, and he is your prototypical 24-year-old up-and-coming starting pitcher. He looks the part, and certainly he – has backed it up the other night against the Diamondbacks. Six innings, one hit. Outstanding start. 
Tommy, when you look at Ben Brown and you hear praise from guys like Pedro Martinez on MLB Network saying that the Cubs have something special there, what's the secret in managing him? Where does his best role moving forward? In the rotation? Because I would think with a young pitcher like that, you want to have as much certainty or consistency with what you're asking him to do rather than playing and using him in various ways. But what is the what is the best way to use Ben Brown moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we obviously see what he can do as a starter. And then we, we, we know the type of pitcher he can be, and we're going to want him to start games. But I also think there's, there's ways to utilize guys throughout the course of the season to continue to keep them healthy, and, and pitching along into the season, there's going to be a time we're probably going to use Ben out of the bullpen in a shorter stand if we feel like we need to, you know, back off the workload a little bit or give him a little bit of break or, um, you know, if we need to piggyback uh, two guys because the bullpen's, you know, hanging <laughs> a little bit and we need to give guys a couple of days, like we have the flexibility to do that. We have the pitchers to do that. And, and when you have that mentality, kind of like Council says, of just get have out getters. Like today, your outs are going to be in the fifth through the ninth, just not through the first or the fifth. And and to be honest with you, it's a good experience for some young guys to learn how to pitch deeper into games and pitch fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth inning than it is you know when you start. And so I think there's a lot of ways we can navigate this. And I think there's you're going to see Ben probably pitch in some different situations, and you know we just need to keep keep finding ways to keep him comfortable, even if he isn't starting, um, just to make sure that, you know, he's continuing to grow the way he he needs to grow in this game. Um, He's definitely done a fantastic job starting. We know what he can do. And, you know, we're we're obviously going to communicate through that over the next, you know, few months. Meanwhile, the most consistent outgetter in the rotation has been Shodem Managa, and he did it again. I'm wondering when he's going to give up a run, Tommy. That's become quite a story quite an entertainer. What is he doing so well and how surprised, if you are surprised, are you? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised in the fact that he, he's come to, you know, Major League Baseball as a, as a pretty polished veteran pitcher that had a lot of success in Japan. What, what I think I'm most impressed about is, one, like his, his willingness and, and ability to adjust from what he's done in the past to maybe taking on a few a few things that that we feel we're going to help his game here at the major league level you know case in point like most particularly is just being able to execute pitching up in the strike zone which you know they just didn't do a ton of in japan and you know his his ability to manipulate the ball and, and understand now what pitch movement is telling him when he does get a fastball that has a little more run and a little less ride, like how to make that adjustment. He's learned that so fast. Um, and again, it's just a testament to the person he is, but also the competitor and, and how much he wants to continue to learn in, in this game. And I think that's been one of the most, I don't know, fun, exciting things as a coach when you have guys that can take information and make the adjustment quickly, and then not only not only make the adjustment, but but learn on their own and be able to make the adjustments on their own. It's pretty fun to see. And I know technically he's he's a rookie, you know, in in Major League Baseball, but definitely a veteran guy in terms of his ability to understand what he's trying to do, knows what he does really well, and goes out and executes it. It's really fun to watch. Um, he's a great personality to watch on the field, just his mannerisms and the way he goes about his business and. And yeah, we're lucky, definitely lucky to have him. The other character that you have uh, on the pitching staff is in the bullpen, Adbert Alzali, but things have not started out as well. Three blown saves, Tommy, so far. You guys have lost seven games off to a pretty good start, but he seems to be more inconsistent than he was in the second half of last season. Is there anything specific? Where's the level of concern, and uh, how do you get him on the right track? Yeah, I think, you know, with Adbert, he was in such a good place last year, you know, at the end of the year. Mechanically, he felt great, and his, his, his pitch shapes were exactly where he wanted them, and he was able to execute where he wanted to. And, and you know, it's early in the year, and he's just not quite back to that exact level. He's obviously a really good pitcher, and he's got really good stuff. But, you know, there were a few minor, minor mechanical things that were a little off, it was causing his, his slider to have a little bit more depth early in the year than that kind of sharp late break. 
uh, that we were seeing at the end of the year. We kind of identified some some minor you know cues and tweaks there, just to kind of help with that. And and he got on a nice little run there. Um, saw the, the the slider you know Viva tick up and things tick up. And you know <clears throat> other than the you know one pitch that Marte hit out last night on that on that slider, it kind of just stayed down away, which is a, which was a heck of a swing by Marte too to be able to hit that ball. You know, 17 degree launch, launch angle down away, pulled you know to, to right center. It was, a, it was a really good swing. You know, he's he's kind of gone on a nice little stretch. Obviously, you know the homers, the, the left-handed homers are always something that you know we want to stay on top of. He did a great job of suppressing those last year, and he's he's just given up three this year. You know, we we know what he needs to do to be successful. He knows what he needs to do to be successful. And, and unfortunately, when you're a closer, if you make a mistake, you, you pay. Your team pays, and, and not a lot of guys can handle that. But we know Adbert can, and we know he's got the ability to 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 get some really big outs late in the game for us. And he's going to continue to work, and we continue to help help these guys, not only him, but all these guys, continue to get better as this year goes on. And and we're looking at it as you know we're 17 games in. And, and we're trying to find ways to help every one of these guys get better because we know there's going to be bumps in the road early. We know there's going to be bumps in the road of you know how we're going to use guys, where we're going to put them in different situations. But we believe in them. We trust what they're going to do. We just got to keep working. Quickly before I let you go, Tommy, Keegan Thompson looks like a guy who you brought up and wants to stay. Five strikeouts in his first two outings. Very strong first four innings of the season. Looks like he has rediscovered something is he a guy you are beginning to trust in high leverage situations? Yeah, I, I think you know Keegan's proven he's, he, he's been able to do it in the past, and that's the thing is like you know when, when Keegan went through a few struggles last year, you knew it was in there, um, you know. And for him, it's just it's just about being himself and not trying to do too much. I think when when you get put in those situations, that was one of the toughest situations anybody's going to get put into in, in that game two days ago, you know, in, in the extra inning game and. He, he stayed calm, he stayed cool, he executed everything he wanted to do and didn't try to try to do too much. And, and that's when Keegan's at his best, when he's just attacking the strike zone and, and competing. And, and you know, when you, when you lose Steel early, when you don't have J-Mo, when you lose Merriweather, you know, a week into the season, you need guys to step up. And, and it's been fun to see Keegan in these first two outings really take the ball and thrive. And, and we're going to need more. We're going to need more guys like Keegan. We're going to need more guys can continue to step up and execute in, in huge situations to help our team get better. And, yeah, it's fun to see and, and, and really happy for him with the success he's had so far in these first couple outings. Tommy, safe travels home. Good luck today. One last question. We're having a debate here. When you played in the majors, when you sit next to any one of the managers that you have worked with with the Cubs, have you ever referred to, do you often refer to him as skipper? You like the term skipper as a as a manager? Yeah, that's you know that's a that's a that's actually a great question. I I don't love the term skipper. I'm trying to be more Thank you. personal, possibly yeah. by their by their name, you yeah. know. But um, but yeah, no, a lot of people do. Um, and and you know it's funny. It comes out in like more baseball conversation. It does. Like, hey, Skip, you think we should run here in this situation? You know, and and. Um, but why? It's funny, but yeah, I, I never. I don't know. I never really. I never really got that. But, I, I don't yeah. either. I just think is a baseball etiquette. You have to call a manager a skipper. I've never, I don't really get it. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I like using their name. I think it's a little bit more personal. More personal. Me, <laughs> Tommy, <laughs> thanks so much again. Appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Tommy Hardy, the Cubs pitching coach, settling that debate once and for all. We'll get into it more. We'll get into it more when we come back because it's something that they had fun with on the Cubs marquee broadcast on Tuesday night. But first, right now, you can win a pair of tickets to see the Cubs take on the Marlins Friday, Friday afternoon at Wrigley Field. This Friday, yes, just be the sixth caller to the scores contest line, 312-540-0670, and you can win a pair of tickets. Cubs, Marlins, Friday at 120. Wrigley Field, be the sixth caller. Now, when we come back, we'll settle the skipper debate once and for all with Dustino. It's Molly and Haas, Chicago Sports Radio, 670 the score. 
Holy cow! The score celebrates the 26th annual Worldwide Toast to Harry Carey. Thursday, May 2nd. Hi, everybody. Pat Hughes here. Join the score's Parkins and Spiegel show, broadcasting live at Harry Carey's Tavern, Navy Pier, 4 to 7 p.m. I got so excited. I mean, the, the play calling and the player execution was outstanding. As good as, as, as you're going to see all year long. Stefanski's awfully good. Absolutely. And and the players were, were tuned into it. Oh, man, what do we got? <laughs> <laughs> I see light mango. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I I did bring they're, in. They're not making this. They're not making this in Pittsburgh. I got to see where this is. Well, uh huh. Oh, you bet. It is Pittsburgh, your... Iron City. You know what? I'm going to text the president of Iron City Beer as soon as I leave here. <laughs> text him right text now. Text him right now. Call him right show. now. And I'm I'm, I'm going to see if Tony see, see if he's with the. Uh, uh, yeah, you text him right now because we. The, so I mean, there is a know, bottle of red that I brought. He's not. For, he's for not the president, but he's got a lot of clout. Dave first. loves Iron City Light. He likes it over ice. It's his Pittsburgh beer of choice. He doesn't like fruit beers. He didn't know there was an icy light mango, and he's now disgusted. Don't worry, coach. We got that right at the Giant Eagle in the flats. Oh, on the flats. <laughs> I love it. The <laughs> south side. I love it. The flats. <laughs> Perfect. Should I call Tony and see if he answers? Well, yeah, not on your cell phone, Dave. We won't be able to hear him. We'll be able to fine. You, you'll be here and put on speakerphone right by the mic. All That's right, no fine, problem. Fine, fine. Yeah. Give it a call shot. Let me, call Tony. Let me, so, I got him on speaker. Let me just see if Tony answers. But the person you called has a police mailbox that has not been set up yet. That, that's a voicemail. All right. <laughs> All right. So, Dave. I'm going to text him and see if he gets back, and then I'll get him to call me. All no. right, good. Because you're, you're appalled by this, right? This is an Iron City light with fruit in it, and you like it straight up over ice. Yes, absolutely. Right. Go, go ahead. Keep talking. I can text and talk. Can, can you? <laughs> yeah. 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 So. <laughs> Dave, Dave's reaching <laughs> for a paper, paper towel. towel. He's I, I, off know, the for, mic. Forget about his football point for a second. I, this is his beer from his childhood. He's been drinking this since he's the coal mines in like sixth grade. He's told the story a thousand times. Uh -huh. Have a sip of your beloved icy light with mango in it. And I want I want you to tell me if you're disgusted by a little fruit in your beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hmm. I, I, I got to find out who recommended this. Honest <laughs> to God. I mean, we're talking about Pittsburgh. I know. Right? I know. We're talking I know. about the Steel City. I know. You're we're Paul. What, ki what kind of metal forging could you do when you drink a couple of these? Huh? I, I wonder if I went into Yarsky's bar on the saw side after I worked night shift at JL Steel when I was going to Pitt and I walked in there and I said, Can I have an IC light mango? <laughs> when, the, when the bar is seven deep with steel workers, you know, you can't even see their eyes. Everybody's got the soot on them. Right. They got the hard hats backwards. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, not, no, better. I'll yell it from the back of the bar. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Danny, you got an IC light mango there? <laughs> yeah. You're getting, you're not coming out alive. <laughs> right. right. No, there's no, your ass is kicked three oh, times Christ. before the front door <laughs> and fired. Yeah, and, and fired. And fired. Yeah, you can't go back to those mills ever again why would you want to mango <laughs>
like the use of Skipper, and it's been an ongoing thing here, which is why watching the Cubs game last night on Marquee Sports Network, in the third inning, I was amused by this exchange between Hoog Shambi and Jim Deshaies. When you played, would you call your manager Skipper? Um, no, not much. Just by their name. Okay. Do you call Craig Council Skipper? I don't think I have yet. The 2-0. And a swing and a miss. I mean, if I were a manager, I would I would kind of dig Skipper. Skip, what's up, Skip? I, I get it. Just don't call a manager coach. Yeah. Some managers really take offense at that. Or call the umpire blue. Yeah. Neither of those. That's funny. When you first get into pro ball, yeah. my first manager was Ken Berry, outfielder. Okay. Um, really good defensive outfielder. Played for the White Sox for a while. And, you know, you first get to pro ball, it's like, coach, you know, my name's Ken. Call me Ken. It's like, that felt very weird. But, but you're an adult. You're the boss. I can't call you Ken. I don't think I would mind coach. I would prefer coach to skipper. Skipper is somebody that works on a boat. Skipper, but you heard the key. The key was, and he, he being JD, mentioned it, but don't call him coach. I know. And that's what happened to me okay. when I was trying to get a manager skipper on the air at a previous stop, and I said, hey, coach. And first of all, I'm not coach. Was it old school? An old school guy? Old school. I, I said on the air who it was, didn't I? Bobby Cox? Bobby Cox. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Called Bobby him in a hotel back when we used to call what we called hotel bingo. Yeah. Called him up, tried to get him on the air as a guest. Uh, I, he may have been in town playing the Cubs, for all I remember. doesn't matter. But he scolded me and then declined the interview. Why do you think they hate being called coaches? That's kind of what they I, I are. I think it's just, they, it's like, it's almost like a military rank. Maybe like I, I I'm not a soldier, right? I'm not a captain. You know, I'm not a corporal. I'm Tommy a general. Tommy Hadovy is not the skipper of the Cubs or the pitching. He's a skipper. coach. He's a hitting He's a coach. He's a first base coach. They yeah. have designations, right? Right. right? But manager, like it's it's weird to say, man. Excuse me, manager. <laughs> hey, skip. But I think it's the hey skip part. I I think I just don't like it because it makes me cringe, but also because it invokes the idea like I grew up in the Gilgans Island. I think of Alan Hale when I hear the word skipper. Well, and uh, you've told me that it annoys you so then i just repeat well, it annoys say it, me right? so you like to repeat yeah. it and i and i appreciate that because at least i'm listening right? at least you're listening <laughs> at least you're listening i'm engaged here's the other thing that bothers me and i think from a radio perspective and i don't want to get too deep in the weeds here but don't you discourage you teach students at illinois media school wouldn't you discourage them from referring to managers as skippers wouldn't you discourage them re referring to the football field as the gridiron or no, wrestling I mean the as the gridiron, the ice, the court, the no, hardwood. No, 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 no. Cringe, cringe, cringe. Why? It is not. It's. It, it doesn't mean you have to. Because we say it a lot, doesn't mean you have to substitute in words that really make you think. What? When is the last time in casual conversation you called the football field the gridiron? We're supposed to make things more conversational, not less. If you're writing, you're not supposed to make it harder to read. It's supposed to be easier. Don't put up stop signs. Give me express lanes. Gridiron? Really? Every time I hear gridiron, I don't care if it's on a national broadcast or whatever. I cringe. Just stop. So just the field? Yes. Or name the field? Or football. It's a football field. It's not a gridiron. It's not hardwood. It's a basketball court. Like I just like to be different. So like I'll I know say you do. I'll I'll refer to the airport, the airport. Yes. As O'Hare Field. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Well, that I mean, is but ridiculous. it's it's different, right? Everybody, you know, take me to the airport. You know, oh, the plane just landed over at O'Hare Field. I'm probably in a very small group. I've already, I was already called weird this morning on the text line. That's okay. I think this is maybe a weird thing, but for years. I would hear this, and like as a writer, I would try to avoid this. It's not clever. It's not even like different. We know what it is. It's like walking into a living room and calling it or calling your television set something different just because you want to call. It, you're tired of calling it the TV. Silly, Skipper, and Tommy Hadovy. Thank you. Would rather just call. Would rather just call Craig Council Craig instead of Skip. All right, Skip.
Just I mean, stay away Skipper from- might be kind of weird too, but Skip. 815, just stay away from cliches. I think that's it. I think it is kind of a cliche. And you're sort of trained, hopefully trained, to avoid cliches, not introduce them. There are other things that bother people. Jeff on 294 has a couple more. I love this exercise because it reminds me of things that I drive me crazy too. Jeff, welcome to Lillian Hall. Hi, right, guys. It drives me nuts. I mean, I hate it. When I hear somebody on the radio go, he went yard or he hit a walk-off. How about he hit a home run or he hit a game-winning home run? I mean, what the heck? And what the heck is right? I, I think baseball announcers in the midst of calling a home run have license to maybe get creative and can add their own little pizzazz. We heard John Sterling's last home run call this week. We love the way Pat Hughes calls a home run. If you want to refer to it as something different from a home run as it happens, I get it. But like later on during the sports broadcast or the pregame show or whatever, I don't think you need to went yard. <laughs> Say Suzuki went yard last night. No, he hit a homer. He hit a homer. Everybody said, what makes you different? <laughs> then we may as well just have Surrey do everything. What makes you different? It's just, uh, right, let me other- ask you this is uh, uh, since we're doing this you okay. brought up illinois media school yep. okay here's one thing that the students do that drives me absolutely you know what crazy and i want to get your opinion on this the cubs beat the diamondbacks last night three to two to start the story mm-hmm. i hate sentences that start with the I especially too. the lead sentence that's good that's, okay. that's no the the I'm you're, like, you're dying me to death the is the most boring word in the English language. Thank you. Okay. Why so, would you? So there we go. We found common ground. Common ground. David, nobody wears out nicknames more than you do. If I had to hear one more Stro show last year, I was going to vomit. <laughs> okay. That's, well, that's nick- different, though. That's a nickname. That's a nickname. That's a nickname. Skip is a nickname for Skipper. Like maybe, the- maybe this afternoon we'll have the Skipper show with uh, Craig Council and our guy, Ron Coomer instead of the manager show, but they don't. They, you never heard it called the coaches show on baseball. I, you know, never I'm, heard it referred to as the coaches show in baseball. No, it's not. It's the manager never is. show. They want the, the manager, manager show. show. I'm going to have to get Coombs' opinion as an old school baseball guy. We know that he Friday probably at eight. he will come down on calling him Skip because I think he has referred to he used to refer to Joe Madden. I think as Skipper. Okay, Skipper. It's, well, especially Skip. You hear a lot of Skip. Right? Yeah. I it might be a little silly. It was People, the coach though. The the coach thing upset the manager or the skipper. And you even heard JD again say, just, but don't, don't call him coach. So I bet he at one point got scolded for, or heard somebody get scolded for referring to the manager, the captain of the boat, if you will, as coach. <laughs> 217 says, uh, what do you call the manager of the Marlins? Well, that's, that's his first name, Skip Schumacher. So he actually is Skip. He is Skip. He's Skipper Skip. Skippity Skip. Skip squared. All right. Well, I just had to get off that off my chest. I, I think I was more uh, identified with JD. Seemed to be a little more on on my side there. Seemed like a little bit. It just seems like it stands out. You don't you don't call somebody that. But I wanted to stand out. I don't think you need it to stand out. I think you find other ways to make your commentary stand out rather than using cliched nicknames. I hope the people between five and five thirty laugh when they hear Skipper like I, spit out their coffee. I hope they do because I do. they know it's going to lead to a segment like this. <laughs> well, we have to. I was just curious. I just wanted. Hey, to, they re- they referenced it on when the marquee they last it on night. the marquee I mean, network. Hey. I thought it was worth addressing, but we have more important matters today on the score all day long. Today, the Cubs finished the road trip against the Diamondbacks. It is going to be a game. Pre-game coverage starts at two o five here on the score with Zach. And then it is the first pitch at 240. And you don't want to miss Jordan Wicks. That is a big start for Jordan Wicks. He's 0-2 this year with a 568 ERA against Brandon Fought. And I think he's a he's a good right-hander. He's a good young pitcher. So the Cubs have their work cut out for them if they want to win that series and head home for a nice uh, weekend series against the Marlins. And then later today, the Bulls and the Hawks at the United Center in the NBA play-in tournament pregame coverage, 8:15, tip-off 8:30. The only local broadcast of the game right here on 670. The score 
and in Chicagoland on the free Odyssey app. I picked the Bulls. I think they win tonight. I think they will shut down or limit a, a compromised Trey Young. I think Iowa would play. I have my doubts about Drummond. I wish it was I wish it was a team that going into this with full health or not. I don't know what it means if they win tonight, except for they play another game and the loser of the Heat and the Sixers on the road, correct? And that will be where they got to last year. For them to make progress or to consider this season a success, I don't even know what they can do except for short of beating the Celtics in a series that no one would expect them to win. Other than that, this season has been largely disappointing. Started 5-14, and 14, got better, but it started 5-14. and 14. Thank you, Billy Donovan, for acknowledging the fact that you don't get credit for digging yourself out of a hole you created for yourself. So, Bulls and Hawks tonight, 8.30 tip-off. Be right here on The Score with Chuck and Bill and Alyssa Bergamini. Looking forward to that. Before we get out of here and get the transition, you can be the sixth caller. You like Aerosmith? You want to see them in concert? January 19th, 2025, right around the corner at the United Center. Tickets go on sale Friday at 10. Right now, you can get ahead of the game and wear a pair of tickets. Win a pair of tickets to see Aerosmith. Sixth caller, 312-540-0670. When you come back, it's a Layla Wednesday. Layla Rahimi. Lawrence Holmes, Dan Bernstein, they will join us next. It's Mullen Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 670 The Score. Bears fans, the Parkins and Spiegel Draft Special on The Score will be live from Detroit, the epicenter of what could be the most important draft in Bears history. I've heard that they love football, so that's the place. I'm excited for that. We're taking the show on the road to Detroit to be in the middle of all the draft drama next Thursday and Friday. Starting right after the Cubs game around 5 p.m., we'll be there reacting live to what Ryan Pohl does with his two first-round picks, including number one overall, along with expert insight from Dave Wanstead and Patrick Mano back in our Chicago studios. Then that Friday from 2 to 5.30, we continue our live coverage in Detroit, recapping round one and getting you ready for day two. Only on Sports Radio 670, The Score, and live on the free Odyssey app. Draft coverage on The Score is presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. This segment brought to you by Visit Detroit. The countdown is on. for the First Death Star that was put in there on purpose. Jen Erso's dead. And many Bothans died to get that information past whatever the guy's name is, Ben Mendelson, who was flying around. He's flying around, you know. It's flying around. Oh. oh. So the, the second Death Star, that's just, that's really stupid. I need to hear the Dave Wanstead breakdown of Star Wars oh, now that you did that. What? Yeah, it's a f- what if he were a big fan? Star That'd be Wars. Fantastic. Like, seriously. That, that would be hilarious. Because I guess King Griffey Jr. is like a huge Star Wars honk. A Wani on Star Wars podcast yes. would be unbelievable. Like he knows he knows all the words to, to lub nub. Oh, I could translate Ewok. Oh, come on, Bertie. He can play the cantina scene <laughs> on the trumpet. He speaks Wookiee. Right. Oh, that's, I used to coach on the planet Kashyyyk. Tony Wise and I were there for, for <laughs> three years. <laughs> they were scouting offensive oh, linemen. You, you should have seen those. You've got a couple Wookiees out there. Man, you got a double block. Run right behind them. They play all day. play hard. I mean, I, I guess if you're thinking about Wookiees, you're thinking tight end and defensive end, right? That's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm thinking Chewbacca is playing defensive end for me. The end? I oh, feel yeah. like I feel end. like he's a three tech. Tight end, tight end, or D end. Yeah, like like hand in the air, tight end. See, I, I I feel like Chewbacca might be better served like letting his anger flow. Play, play him at D end where he could just swap people and get to the quarterback. Yeah, I worry about I worry about penalties. He'll help you the, up. But the way they're calling the game now, I'm yeah, concerned about that. I mean, penalties. he's going to get two of those a year. Okay. You have to put up with the fact that. You're going to just take it. Yeah. That he's going to get the. You <laughs> he's going to pull someone's arm out at least once a year. <laughs> oh, there's that again. Oh, you know, Chewbacca. <laughs> you know him. The, the, this is part of the package. 
Still a great player, gotta, though. Got to take the bitter with the sweet. Destined for the Hall of Fame. Call, call a couple other things and it's been a lot of fun so thank you all for texting for listening thank you uh to thank Evan. you most of all for listening thank you most of all for listening on this wednesday it is wednesday april 17th thank you lawrence don't talk yet lawrence sorry my bad <laughs> so we would like to also thank our executive producer dustin rhodes can never see myself you know not with those two guys it's I understand this league changes and there's so many things that go into it and we're not going to play forever, but, you know, we've uh, experienced so much together and at the end of the day, like, again, I know they want to win. I know I want to win. and That's all I'm worried about. Steph Curry, after the Warriors were eliminated, is Clay Thompson done? Is he really done? Man, that post game. Yeah, didn't score anyway. I'm sorry. Also, thank you to Brandon Fryer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was Shannon Sharp with the skip. Skip. But that's Skip Bayless. That's not Skipper Manager. That's just Skip Bayless. Skip Schumacher. Skip, skip Schumacher. I, I do miss I do miss him saying skip because it's just Skip. I miss a good Southern accent, man. That like voice real Southern. Belongs to Layla to Layla Wednesday. Good and, morning. And the great Lawrence Holmes. And Sir Limps a lot, Dan Bernstein. You okay, Dan? What if no. you're just rested? I, I, She's back tonight, I right? I feel for you. I feel, Dan, I'm not making light of it. I do, I'm sorry if I made fun of it. I didn't mean to. But like when you're limping, I feel for you because it reminds me of how I feel when I'm going through gout, which is, sounds like your symptoms are very similar. Common. Mine, it's mine is, common. Mine is osteoarthritis. They have, uh, they've, I finally got this ankle imaged and the, the foot and the ankle, and it's a basically like a straw that broke the camel's back of old injuries and missing ligaments and bone spurs all over the place. So 
we're going to see what uh, we did the steroid course, and now we're going to see what uh, a PT does for a couple times a week. Is it month. constant pain? Ah, uh, it's here and there. It's yeah. unpredictable. Every day, right. when when the feet hit the floor, you kind of take and you're like, okay, well, where are we today? How is it? And then you take you know your couple of naprosin and and you hope for the best. You you, you strap it up and see which shoe feels better than which other shoe. And, and strap it down. Sit back, relax, and strap it down. I feel, it's, I feel it's, for ain't you. Nobody it's got right. TW, It's hard to limp around. No, it's, it's hard. To, I, I've been there, and people do notice and they ask they mean well but yeah yeah i'm limping no yeah it's but it's more about the facial expression every time a step is made right that's the self and and i'm not asking for much i just want to be able to get back to walking around and fishing i want to be able to play golf fair enough and i'm I'm, i am in good hands medically i i was in good hands with the diagnosis and now it's just a matter of kind of putting in the work so we'll get it better so i could get you one of those little foot brace things it helps I have, like I have one. hot cool. Oh, I have the uh, like the neoprene strap brace thing. Oh, that's but yeah. But I have like one where if you need to heat it up or cool it down, you can. I'm gonna wait to see what the therapists say. As three broadcast veterans, I would like your opinion on what we just had fun with. I know people wondered why we spent time on, but the reference to every baseball manager as skipper, the reference to football fields as gridirons, the reference to things like wrestling as grappling, the alternative ways to refer to something that is just very simple and basic, like a manager, like a field, like a court. Do you have any hard and fast rules that you use when you're describing things for the umpteenth time? And you think, Oh, I need to change it up here. I'm going to call it a gridiron. Country hardball (laughs) for someone who throws hard. If you're in direct answer to your question, the rule on which I have been raised is when in doubt, don't. Yep. That when in doubt, it just. It, I like that. Say say what it is. Say second base instead of second sacker. Yes. Right. Or the, <laughs> Ew. The, That's jammed. The keystone, the hot corner that when when in doubt. Can of corn. Less jargon. Right. And, I think that is the way to go. Sacks packed. Let's see. Man. Did you guys ever hear the phrase, uh, the best writing is often a turn of a cliche? Like yesterday I wrote a package, which I don't typically do. And I was like, well, for the Bulls, it, it's win or stay home. They're here tomorrow. Back to you. I love that. See, a but version of I a cliche is time. actually more clever or it stands out rather than the cliche where you hear and you're like, yeah, okay. You just sort of, everyone uses them. Everyone relies on them. I know the cliches because they're heard a lot, but I do think that the one in particular that bothers me and Dustin likes to poke at me is the skipper manager thing. So it just came up. <laughs> well, I remember the- when Ron Washington came to Austin once and this radio station was interviewing him and they're, you know, fantastic when it came to everything Texas Longhorns, but they just loved calling him coach. <laughs> but well, I also don't know why that's wrong. It, it, it's a manager. I mean, it is He's not a coach. But it's it is wrong. But it's funny as to why it's wrong. People used to get mad at Joe Madden because he would call runs points. I know that bugged me. I, and you know what? Also, but does it really matter? Uh, only no. Jerry Reinsdorf would get mad about something like that. Though, right? <laughs> Send you a text. I think, yeah. but they they don't get mad at him because they assume he knows. Like if I said it, people would be like, "You clearly don't know." But with with Joe, it's like a thing that's okay. He can get away with it. Well, I was laughing, like it, Skip Schumacher, for example. Skip. His name is Skip. Yeah, no. So if players call him Skip, <laughs> and a lot of players call the manager Skip, but that's his name. That's his name. Skip, Skip. Yeah. Right. So it's like, hey, Skip, <laughs> Skip. It's like, okay, yeah, you call, you have, you know me like that. You're my player. But players still refer to the manager. His, his Skip name or, is not Skip. Well, his name his is name probably is Sheldon. I what, also, what is it? Jared. It is Jared? strange. Jared Mitchell, Skip. Jared Michael Skip Schumacher. It's also strange to call somebody I find incredibly revered just by their first name when I don't know them. Like, or as long as you don't call Ron, him coach or Ron Washington Wash. I wasn't the one calling him that. I was giggling. How about base? Nuts? I think I think Wash works. That, I mean, that's a nickname. Wash, that's that he, a nickname. Yeah, but nicknames for people like based off their names. I think are fine. Or like Don Mattingly when he was manager. I'm like, you're legend. I'm not just gonna call you Don. Like, what? That's his name. What would you call him? I, miss, I don't. That's it. That's what. That's the problem Don, here. Call him his name. It's a, it's respectful to call him by his first name. If you're my coach, I but will I'm call like, you're you not coach. Just Don. Right. Yeah, there he is. No, he's, he's not. He's a guy named Don who can hit a baseball really well. Hall of Fame well. <laughs> yes. 
He hit a ball with a stick really sir. well, and his name is Donald. Dear Up here sir. on the Simpsons well. Oh, hi, Don. Yes. So, yes sir. Some people do. They, they relish the idea of being called coach, though. Some will tell you. They yeah. do that. Yeah. 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 Some will tell you. Some and then you, you have to tell them, and then they I'm go not to, doing that. Then they go to jail? For pimping. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. It, there are people not, who get really caught up on this. Titles. Anything goes yeah. when it comes to hoes, I thought. Yes, because pimping ain't easy. I mean, no, I, no, no. it's not your traditional Broadway. Show. How do you deal with this in in class, David? Because I do go by professor in class mainly because I I want to create that a line. Hierarchy? Yeah, not hierarchy, I, but just I don't have a problem with that. I used to I used to go through that and struggle. I my, to be honest, I would say I would say I'm not a professor. Call me David. If if you're uncomfortable with that, you can call me whatever you want, or not. But I, I, I wonder about. I don't. I, I'm not a professor. You are though. If You're a you, scholar practitioner. You're teaching what you know. So you prefer like if students, if you're teaching at DePaul, to refer to you as Professor Holmes. Yep. Okay. As long as you're consistent with that, I yeah. think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. It's funny because then when they see you in the wild, you know, th that's how they refer to you even after they graduate, which is kind of funny. Professor Holmes is eating a lot of donuts. I am. Oh, I, I met Chef, a lot of Mexicans. Along respected. those lines. That, that Chef is, is a respected title. That's funny you say that, Lawrence. So a month or so ago, there was a function at, in the performance studio. Yeah. And it was a sponsor event. And one of the sponsors' uh, client was in here. And she um, was a student I had years ago when I was in South Bend at St. Mary's College. Tremendous writer tremendous personality just a great young woman she's not i mean she's older now but she's still a young woman yeah. and she comes up to me and it was professor Haw. Mm -hmm. professor Haw. no go. that's great, great. And, and actually people in the people around me were like huh that doesn't equate well many years ago it, it, it at least it is the way i was referred to I, I do have students who have transitioned and i've said okay like just call me lawrence because we're working in the same it's building different. or yeah you know, stuff like that, but in the classroom. Well, I did it in the classroom at St. Mary's because there wasn't a big age difference between the students I was teaching and me, and I did not yes. want to get real informal that's, with a bunch of college yeah, colleagues. That's, that's the idea. So, that is, yeah. yeah, that could be a problem. And unfortunately, there is a boundary you have to set there, and sometimes you do. it's as easy as a title. It's a good point. I, I do. The chef thing does get to me, though, because I, I don't know, like – Hearing all those people refer to a chef as chef Ugh. always strikes me as weird. And it, it, I mean, I get that that person is the chef at the IHOP, but <laughs> still, though, I like, think it's really weird when Shane comes where's in. Where's my Rudy Tooty fresh and fruity <laughs> breakfast? Chef. <Come> in, chef. <laughs> I got three Rudy Tooties. <laughs> Isn't that kind of the premise of the bear? <laughs> yes. Isn't it kind of awkward when Shane comes in here and, and demands that we call him executive producer Shane? It really is. I mean, I don't understand that. Senior EP executive Shane, yeah. producer. EP, you know, you can call me EP. That's a little bit off. Yes, it's, it's a strange, it's strange. Assistant thing. to the regional manager. <laughs> Do you guys have Bulls fever? I'm sticking with Getzo, by the way. Sadly, David. Yeah, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I'm also going to therapy for, for bulls fever. No! It's, it's ingrained. Sky I, fever. That's I, what you want. I can't lose bulls June 23rd. Fever. I, I was no going to say. Sky fever. Uh, no, Dan. No. We're not going to do this. You're invested because you watched all the games this season, and you care about what happened. This, you want to, it's, it's like That's watching, normal. binging a show and being like, you know, this show's not great. Some but cost. I'm, yeah. I'm in. I've all I've already gone through all of this. I've got to see the finale. And yeah, we're, we're so guess mad. what? Now but you get to see what the finale. What you just described is more obligation than anticipation. It, it, we we had maybe the Dedication. darkest, most Dedication. nihilistic episode of the organization's win championships podcast because we despite all of the rules about no doom spiraling no being, oh you have those on that show no yes not that on this show, one not but, a, but no being, man. because otherwise when you're just talking bulls 
and you everything devolves to what why does it matter what's the point why do we bother what are we doing here so so you don't want this discussion on this show so what i'm saying is that we can't like when we're really trying to get excited about the bulls get excited about things that excite us about the bulls because the fact is they have been an entertaining product they have been they, there's, they, there they have really been have all been. kinds of storylines. There have been fun games. There's been exciting outcomes, interesting personalities, likable people, a likable coach. But you know you're trapped in an endless cycle of larger misery. So it's it, it's really hard to, to break out of that when you're like, if they win this, then they win this. And then here comes the Celtics just, boom, 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 just repeatedly kicking them in the crotch and everybody goes home. Then there's your cliche. I feel like there's a couple of things at play here is that they actually, unlike say the bears in that losing streak years ago, that, that birthed one of the worst press conferences of all time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the schedule that got the bulls out of their self-made mess. It was that. It was except for, I think the other difference was, which I appreciated is that Billy Donovan will be the first and was one of the several to say, don't give us credit for climbing out of that hole we dug it for ourselves they started five and 14 so yeah they've been a pretty good team since then but they started that yeah way. he's not sugarcoating anything he's not well he that's never like has. the clutch games where they led by 20 and I, billy <laughs> answered our discussion apparently billy talked yesterday i was at practice and he tells stories he's a storyteller there's been no place for him to park the sound we're here for it we're the show. We yeah, the, time. We care. The, I I like hearing what he has to say. We have great the space. Talker. I I need it. I did the, the pregame yeah. stuff with Billy is some of the best stuff, and it doesn't see a lot of air. Like or like the writers are always like writing the game's story, and there's always such great stuff. That's a good point in the pregame that it, just kind of goes away. It also adds valuable context to how he coaches, manages, skips. <laughs> Skip. It does add valuable context to his viewpoint on a team. He's he's great on the hardwood. He definitely is a great hardwood manager. See, I see what you did there. <laughs> on the hardwood, well, but not the gridiron. What else? What about got? the gridwood? <laughs> what, what do you guys have today? We have an awesome show. Great suburb today. Gridwood. <laughs> Don Staley is going to join oh, us at man. eleven. That's Let's awesome! Go. Yes, good get. Yeah, if, right, Ray fantastic. Just, the the get. Yeah, Ray called her and oh. said, "You want to go?" And she said, "Yes." Nice job, Ray. Yep. So uh, we got high noon, eleven forty. Mike Florio decided to move because Don Staley is so important that it, she actually he can, oldest one though. It's true. He good did because he good was at him. the Mike's at the, pro Don Staley. Yeah, he owed us one because we had to move him around for something as he was talking to Robert Kraft. Uh, Nick Friedel will help us preview the play-in tonight at 1225. And then at 125, Jeff Pagliaca, the general manager of the Chicago Sky, All will right. be our guest. Good, good lineup. Have a great show. Broadcasting live from the Hyundai studio, presented by your local Hyundai dealers. This is Chicago's number one and most listened to sports station. 670 The Score is Chicago Sports. Chicago Sports is The Score. WSCR Chicago. WBMX HD2 Chicago. Always live on the free Odyssey app. The Score! The NBA playing tournament gives teams the chance. Oh, I'm, I'm told by someone at the White Sox, it's not the hit man, it's the batter man. The batter man? I guess. Don't find the this, batter man. This person would know. Okay. Sorry. I still think that everyone Sorry. calls it the hit man, though. It's more fun to say the hit man. Isn't that really what well, we're going also, for with your wait, home yeah, run yeah, outfit? Yeah, yeah, and hold on. Wait a second. If you have a choice, if it's batter man, <laughs> that presumes he could be out. <laughs> hit man's always right. going to hit. Hit man's on base. Hit man's scoring. Hit man's doing stuff. Batterman might pop up. <laughs> Batterman has just popped out. <laughs> right. You know, Batterman's trying. I'm trying to get a hit. I'm, I'm trying to maybe get a walk. It's Batterman. He fouls a couple off, and he fouls one off his foot, and he grounds weakly to short. And he's hitting 227. Yeah, Hitman. Now, just, Hitman. Like, he lines in the gap. Hitman's got 45 home runs. Come on now. Change that. Even though if it's true, change it. There. It's, Here ends the lesson. It's clearly true from the person who, who sent this. Oh, I'm not doubting. It's clearly true. But because, because according to them, he's batting. I know. 
I'm presuming I'm I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that he's all wound up and ready to rock and his front foot's landed and he's loaded and he got a hit. This but is, hit man. But the White Sox themselves are like, no, 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 he's he's batter man. We have to keep open the possibility that he bounced it back to the mound. Go White Sox. Could also be on deck man. How, how, plate appearance how, man. How, how did it turn out for you? I, I grounded out to short. Weekly. I waved at a slider in the other batter's box. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. <laughs> You'll get him next time, batter man. <laughs> so, so White Sox. I like the alternate universe where batter man is a superhero with the power that to just like throw pancakes at you, just create a bunch of pancakes, <laughs> a lot of waffles. He shoots at like, man. <laughs> like it's, instead of spider webs, just comes out of his wrists.
just sounds like a guy who's stuck in between. He is something well less than 100%. Doesn't look good, coach. Can he play? He's in a coma. Answer my question. Can he play? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> His body just continues to fail him. I don't understand organizationally other than a lack of depth, which shouldn't matter because your team's not good. Why they do things this way? What if Jerry is a put dirt on it guy? I don't know. I said eat it. Eat it. Coach, I think I swallowed too much mud. Take a cell tablet. These are baseball players. They don't need to be coddled yeah. with all of this stretching. We're paying them. They can bring in their own. Cell tablet. Maybe Eloy is Deadpool. Uh, this is the real point here. The f is a phone booth doing on a street corner. Disappear in 98. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Bernstein and Hope. Middays 10 a.m. to 2 on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Today's show is so good it shouldn't be free. We should be charging. We should be charging a subscription or some special one off cost. For you to listen to this show. No, this is the this is the free medium that people get, and they occasionally get a show like this. They All also right. sit through well, our this, bad shows. Well, congrats. Exactly. That's true. So maybe you earn, by sitting through bad shows, you earned the right to get this one. What exactly. are these bad shows you're referring to? I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's okay. right. Well, on your ass, Wojo. As we broadcast live <laughs> we are. from the Hyundai Studios, brought to you by your local Hyundai dealers, so we are all set for you today. You say, well, what do I get? Well, you get Don Staley at 11, you get High Noon at 11.40, Mike Florio at noon, Nick Friedel 12.25, and Jeff Pagliaca at 1.25, and a whole lot more. Not only that, two pairs of tickets to see Cubs and Marlins Sunday, April 21st. <laughs> A, a lovely Sunday Cubs game with a friend or a family member or a paramour or members of paramour. Those, Misery business. Those, and we could give those away at any minute. At any time, we could give you the cue to call if you want to win Cubs. There's your paramour. That is a very stud song. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's, he, he, loves he loves him that. some Haley Williams. Did you and guys, who doesn't? Yeah, that, that fits. That tracks. Ever tell you about when I met her? No, it was fantastic. Did you guys do the Spider-Man thing to each other? No, we didn't. There wasn't enough time. It was like this. They had this event where I used to work over at NBC Tower at uh, WLS AM. WKQX had Paramore into the sound stage. They have kind of like what we have here, right? Hell yeah, ours and, is better though. And so, oh, ours is way better. And so afterwards. Paramore took pictures with like the fans that were there and then they took a picture with all the staff that were there So I was in that picture on my way out. I stopped and I was like, I got to say something to Haley And so I stopped and I was like, hey, I was running this morning. I listened to your new album It's really awesome. And then she responded to me and I blacked out I don't remember what happened in the next five <laughs> seconds And then I left the room and I was like, what the hell just happened? The scene from dodgeball yeah. Justin, I love you. And then you get hit with a dodgeball in the face. <laughs> Jody loves Chachi. I had a moment like that. I was in an elevator with Ron Jeremy. And I was like, I'm in the elevator with Ron Jeremy and me and nobody else. And I have to say something. And I said, looking good, Mr. Jeremy. And he gave me a really dirty ass look. What the hell? You were being nice. I know. Well, you probably thought you yeah, Haley, Haley yeah. was really nice. Yeah. Isn't Ron Jeremy yeah. in jail? Oh, yeah. This dead? is many years ago. Yeah. Or in jail or dead. I, Both. You, you got to stop killing people. No, I don't. Yes. I, I, we got we to set some sort of fine. No. Well, first, let's find out if he's dead. Uh, you hear the voices of our producers, Adam Studzinski, Ray Diaz. There is Brandon Fryer helping out as well. Kevin Lapka, Connor O'Donnell doing their things as... Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's not dead. Ron you Jeremy? owe $5. Is he in jail? Yeah, five dollars is an appropriate every charge. Time, every time Bran, Dan preemptively kills somebody, dollar in the jar. He's not healthy. He has severe dementia now. Oh, no. And the, well, or, or he was faking it to get out of jail. As determined by mental health experts at Jeremy's sexual assault trial. Right, because there are some who thought he was successfully faking his dementia because he wanted to avoid prison. He had an aneurysm, so probably not. As far as we know. I mean, or he was really good at faking it. Yeah, that would be that'd be an There's excellent, joke. excellent he's an job. Actor. Of, he's an actor. actor. Not a really good one, though. Dave. Actors There's, pretend for a living. There's definitely a joke they, there. They can usually tell about his line of work. Aneurysm. Is Kyle Hendricks washed? 
Man. I don't know if we have to go to that degree. I'm, fair question, though. It's not. His ERA is 12. It's not good. They didn't help him out, though. The ERA wasn't 12. I mean, you, you leave the game, and it's like, there's a wild pitch, and there's a wild pitch. That didn't help. Well, the bullpen also walked seven batters. That's what I mean. Like, but didn't that game feel very last year-ish? That's what Ian Hap Un- said about unstable, it. Unstable, tired start. You have to go to your bullpen. Your bullpen is tired. This is not what you need to be doing on April 16th. Everybody has to hit their way out of this jam. And then, unfortunately, what was one out left? And poor Adbert Alcelay and I had questions about the closer situation, as we recall, all offseason. Well, Sometimes I don't like being right. I, what I, when and you, I like Adbert Alcelay. If you look at the box score, if somebody just hands you this Cubs box score and asks you where and when did this game take place? Hell. No, you're going to say, right? You're, September of 2023. That's one answer. The other would Wrigley. be Wrigley Field in May. Say, all right, that's a, that's a Wrigley game. That looks like what he's stupid Wrigley August games. Fests. And you realize, no, it's roof open Chase Field in April. Well, that's what makes it so weird. I mean, it's it's not just that. I I feel terrible for Asli. He's got what three blown saves already. That that is awful. This early in the season, we talk about how these games should count so you don't have to play stressed out for two months. But man, if I'm not already there just watching, and I know you guys talk about the baseball roller coaster, but I watched all three hours and thirty minutes of that game last night and stayed up late when I could have gone to sleep because I was off at night. So I'm here to live it. It's very stressful. To get back to Hendricks, why don't we listen to Jed Hoyer on this? Because Jed talked about some of the issues that Kyle Hendricks is having so far this year. I think you look at his career, I think he's just made the most of, of what he had over and over and over. And, you know, I feel like he's had his times of struggles in the past and he's gotten through them. And, you know, my hope is that this is another one of those times. You know, I feel like um, the third time through the order has really bitten him so far this year, and that's something obviously he's going to have to to work through. He's also faced, you know, Rangers, Dodgers, Padres, which I think has been a, a tough slate for him early in the season. But yeah, he's obviously he would say it, and you know he's you know, he expects more of himself, and you know obviously we expect him to, to pitch well. Um, but I I think there's, you know, we have to remember we're three starts into his season. You know, he's got you know what he have twenty nine more probably. So I think mm-hmm. letting giving him a little bit of of leeway and time to work his way through it. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I try to remember over and over that, you know, the things we think about in April and the things that we talk about in April, like so oftentimes by June, let alone August seem so remote. So that's hopefully how I'm looking at this, this, you know, rough, rough three starts that you look up and he's just, it was clearly a bad patch and then he, he got, he got going again and pitched really well. That was if, Jed if, Hoyer. If I set the over under on Kyle Hendricks' remaining starts at twenty eight and under, a half, under, 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 right. pound, 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 we, we all would go under. Pound the under. I don't. Well, let's, I don't let's think not, he's got twenty nine starts coming. Let's no, not pound forget the under. this That's, year was voluntary for the Cubs. They voluntarily picked up the year. They got to figure out something to do because. So I didn't decisions think, like that when you spend sixteen on on him and. Again, Montgomery was available for twenty five. And it might you have to ask. And Julio Tehran, you signed for what four? Well, it, okay then. And it might have been a mistake by council to send him back out there yesterday. Like that might have been the mistake. You have the big inning where you take the lead and the ball's bouncing around the outfield, and you might have made a mistake in putting him back out yeah, there. Yeah, you say count this as as a positive coming back and, and take your shoes off. Mm-hmm. And this isn't – it's difficult because this is not somebody who played themselves out. Like This isn't Jake Arrieta leaving. This isn't Jason Hayward for, for all the vitriol that he faced. And, by the way, what did he do the first thing he came back to town with the Dodgers? Was – was uh. Go yeah. to his facility yes. out and, out and west. Give MLB Network the uh, access to, to and the bring facility. and bring a whole and bunch of the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bring that up, but in this case, like it's it's hard. Who doesn't like Kyle Hendricks? We all do, but but us liking him has nothing to do with looking at his performance, and his performance has been bad. No, I mean 
I, I'm aware of that part. It's I mean, just a difficult discussion sometimes. It's not that difficult for me. When we come back, let's hear what the Cubs pitching coach had to say about an important charge of his going forward because few people know him better than Tommy Hadovy. So let's listen to that when we return. The Bernstein at Home Show, Layla Rahimi here on this cloudy Wednesday on The Score. Bears fans, the countdown continues. We're now eight days away from what could be the most important draft in franchise history. Okay, here we go with the first pick in the NFL draft. The Chicago Bears select. What will Ryan Poles do with the number one overall pick? We'll be covering it all now through draft weekend, April 25th through 27th on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. And always live on the free Odyssey app. Draft coverage on the scores presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. This segment is brought to you by Grand Appliance. Shop Grand Appliance for unbeatable deals like Whirlpool top load washers starting at just $4.99. Need it fast? Grand can deliver and install faster than those other guys. Learn more. GrandAppliance.com. Speaking of the um, the cameras, Marquis caught you singing along to the walk-up song. Sing it along. No, they did Oh, no, they, they did. Didn't. Oh, they <laughs> did. Oh, they did. <laughs> and it looked good, man. Pat, no, Patrick, don't worry about it. Like, you're singing along to Whitney. First of all, that song bangs, and everybody knows it. I mean, that's just hot, and you can't <laughs> deny it. And and the other thing is that you, when you're going well, the music is in you. We've seen the viral dancing videos, and now this oh, singing yeah. video. It's like <laughs> you, you need the music pulsing through you to be at your best, it seems. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Uh, definitely, definitely helps. And yeah, I mean, it's hard not to sing to that song, right? Like, you hear it blaring, and you just want to, you just want to start singing. Like, and then it cuts off. You know, I'm standing in the box, and I know it should be focused on the pitcher and what he's going to throw. But sometimes I catch myself hearing the crowd just continuing to sing the song. I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm going for. That's what I'm. That's what I love. <laughs> yes, yes, that is tremendous, Patrick. One time I was in a cab like years ago and that song was blaring and the cabbie turned it up and we're all just jamming and she goes she goes she goes don't you want to dance say you want to dance don't you want to dance and the cabbie goes i want to dance <laughs> and, oh my god and i just i think of it every time so you oh, know epic. i'll start to throw that in there when you're when you're rocking out to it love that you feel the oh, crowd you. you feel the crowd jamming you see it yeah i'm uh, getting a lot of love on it and you know that's what i was going for when i picked it i was like you know i I want a song that everyone loves and like, you know, like if you're going to the bar and you're going to play a song on a jukebox just to get everybody going, like that's definitely a top five song that you're playing. Um, so I was like, yeah, I want to do that. I want to get the crowd going, you know, just just create some uh, good energy, good vibes out there. These 26 players got here because of the will to win. The fact is that they never gave up on anything. And if they take that attitude each and every day, you can't erase an eight-game deficit. You can't erase 9-21 and 21 in one game. But you don't have to do that. All they have to do is win today. And to a man, they have to go out with the idea of winning today. If they can do that. Did he just give us both TWTW TW and, and Wint? Let's go! White Sox! Yeah! That was the moment that it all came together. TW, TW, and, and win. win. Yeah, let's bring that back. I got I, I, I to gotta make sure that we got Our models win. win, and that is whatever is win. necessary today. Today! Right now. Win! Whatever is necessary today. <laughs>
Smart models win, and that is whatever is necessary today. No, that'd be wind. That, that, that's not win, Coach. That may be one of my favorites. Like, of the oldies, that is my favorite goodie. Let's go! We are joined in studio by Illinois football coach Tim Beckman. What is an Illini fan? What is it fair to expect? Short-term, well, long-term? To, uh, I, you'll never say uh, or ever get a number. I mean, this is the game of college football, and there's so much that's what? involved in each and every every football game. But I want to see consistency. We were not that at all last year on the football field. Let's get better every game, and our our models win. And that is whatever is necessary today. And we're taking one day at a time to get ourselves better. How have you been received with be the culture? Wouldn't it Yeah. Win. W I N. But the today whatever makes it is wind. necessary. <laughs> How have you oh, been okay. received see, by, yeah. the, okay. by these coaches in Illinois? <laughs> I just love the fact that you called him out on it. You're such a penis. <laughs> well, and his boss is sitting next to him. Mike wouldn't Thomas, it, the wouldn't AD. Wouldn't it be was, Wint? Well, because I mean, he, he was saying whatever is necessary to, today. today. No, but, but not he, whatever is necessary today. <laughs> but it's, he, it's didn't, it didn't work for me. Wint, none of, none of the stuff that he did worked for anybody. That's why he's not going to be here anymore. On the air. This is trouble. Deep left all the way back, and it's a home run. And the pitch on the way. Drill to deep right. If it's fair, it's going to leave the yard, and that is a fair ball. A line drive home run by Jock Peterson. His first as a Diamondback. That ball was destroyed. That, that was like an old hairy-chested slugger. Bah! Oh, God. That one hurt to watch, and it just started to look like batting practice from Kyle Hendricks, who has never had a, a margin for error like other pitchers who are throwing at an actual major league velocity. He has to be perfect, and he has been anything but. You start looking at the, the miles per hour. It wasn't terrible last night. The four-seamer got up to 89 miles an hour yesterday which is the pocket for him this is where he's usually maxing out it's just no one seems fooled and the changeup doesn't seem to be able to fool people people seem to be sitting on it almost as if he's tipping it but the other thing is you could sit on the changeup and and then catch up to the fastball because it's not 97 98 that's one of the luxuries where if he's not he if he's missing spots, it's going to cost him. I also feel like the ball he's throwing right now is spending way too much time over the best part of the strike zone. And it's not just necessarily vertical break, it's horizontal as well. Like it's just spending way too much time in the exact place you need to see it as a hitter. His pitching coach had thoughts this morning on the Mully and Haw show about where he is, where he will be, and what to do. I think number one, I think, you know, we saw a guy kind of early in the year that was trying to find some mechanical things and, and also try to call his pitches at the same time. And, and he's so smart and studious of what he wants to do and knows how he wants to track attack hitters. And, and sometimes you get a little one dimensional, you kind of fall into patterns. And, and what I thought Kyle actually did really well yesterday working with Miggy is, is he did let Miggy call more of the game, and it kind of had more of an interaction of how things went. You saw how the curveball usage went up yesterday. I think he did 10 curveballs, which he, he threw, I think, seven in the first three starts combined. So, um, you know, he was able to mix a little bit more. The, the big thing is just when he, when he makes a mistake right now, he's paying for it. You know, and I think he gave up five hits last night, and two of them were homers. And, and, you know, one of them was just on a, a middle end fastball to, to Guriel, another one on an 0-2 fastball to Jock that you did, that Kyle just didn't execute. And that's just not something we're used to seeing with Kyle. You know, when, when he's ahead, you know, you, he's usually getting guys out at a high clip. And, and, and then the other part that stood out from yesterday was just the, you know, going out for the fifth and those, those two walks, you know, that kind of put us in a tough spot there. You just, it's just uncharacteristic of Kyle. And I think, 
you know, when you're lacking confidence early in the year, you see guys tend to, to be a little bit more fine with how they attack hitters, maybe fall behind more often. And, and, you know, for Kyle, he's so good when he attacks a strike zone early and gets ahead and, and can just stay on the attack and be aggressive. I, I know there were some – it was still a tough – outing for Kyle, there's still some positives to take out of it and the way he's feeling, the way he's moving, he's starting to get better. But like you said, you know, you get to a point where you need to make, you know, just results need to happen. And and I know Kyle knows that and he feels that, but he's it's not gonna change his approach. He's gonna continue to work, be the be the, you know, steady guy that he is. And that's what you appreciate with guys going through this. And you know he's gonna come out of it. Nothing he said is wrong. But I want to deal in the the negative space that is painted by his words there. Every, everything he says is there. But let's think about how he describes the issue. When he talks about you know, he's at his best, when he's attacking guys in the zone, not walking guys and not, not uh, nibbling to the point where he's not getting the calls that he needs to get, bringing the strike zone into play when it shouldn't. Not making mistakes when he's ahead. But the problem is he's he's living around the edges because he knows when he is throwing strikes, he's wild in the strike zone, just like Layla said. Just like you said, about too much of the plate, and he's terrified. Oh yeah, you're not he's not walking anybody. It's just, you know, you're but, you're the stuff that is supposed to paint corners or the slide slider that isn't sliding, it's just Stuff isn't getting that extra torque that but he guys needs. are spitting on it. He, right, of he course. is falling behind. He is giving up walks, and it is killing him because it seems to, where he's pitching defensively. Like, boy, I, I can't throw this over the plate, or it, it's going to be 114 miles an hour back over my head. So, where Hadavi's correct in his assessment, I don't see how you get there. How do you go? How do you bring back the old Kyle Hendricks when? Either the, some combination of stuff and movement and pitch sequencing isn't doing the work it used to do. Well, I didn't like what Jed was saying where Jed was making excuses about the lineups that Hendricks has faced. This is the schedule. He He's supposed to be the pitcher that can handle those lineups. That's why he's still here. So I, I, I'm trying to look for soft spots for him in the schedule. Look, this is who you played. But if you're already you're willing, doing that, what does that tell you? You're willingly extending someone who you're saying in April, mid-April, that you need to find soft spots in the schedule, but you're also saying that you, you don't want to go over the CBT? Yep. Confused. It's very confusing. It's it's why a lot of people, and you were on the forefront of it, Layla, were asking questions about did they do enough? Did they do enough for, for their pitching staff? And Early on, some of it not their fault because it's injuries. They're not. This is why I keep coming back but to everybody's asking. Everybody's getting injured. That's the point. Yeah, but I, I keep coming back to this question, and I asked Dan and Parkins and Spiegel. I don't see a reason to take Ben Brown out of the rotation. Nope. Just because. Just because you need a bulk guy. Like, no, I, I actually do value starters more. And when you're not getting good starts, so – You've got one guy in the rotation that's struggling through his his first four starts. And sure, there's time to turn that stuff around. But these are the types of games where when you go back and you're like, well, how did they fall behind? Well, there, there were those games in April and May where they couldn't make up their minds on what to do in their rotation, and they lost them. All right, I'm calling it. I, I would today. Place him on the injured list. Phantom injury. I would whether it's fan, or 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 whether a pitcher of a certain age is always legitimately hurt to to some extent. Where like pinched thing. What old arm? I got a pinched thing. What I do here is today. That's that shoulder soreness. That's enough already. And he can all these adjustments they say he can make. Let's see it in pitch lab first. When you show me, when the data shows me spin rate, whatever velocity, whatever movement. Command. Com whatever Because command show, is the biggest yeah, issue here. I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. These games matter too much. You do have some alternatives, even though your depth has been stressed. This is above and beyond 
your your range and your margin for for error of your polling. This is too much. Today, I say, Kyle, you're hurt. And we'll fa- and if in fact it doesn't get better in pitch lab and it doesn't get better in rehab starts and it doesn't get better in side sessions, we have a longer talk. Impingement would that be a thing? I, whatever you want, whatever you want to say. Shoulder soreness. Shoulder soreness. We can find that on a, is, uh, on imaging. I feel like impingement is gray enough, but it, it does stink that we're talking about this and not a Cubs win where. Cody Bellinger again, two strike approach gets you RBIs that you need, it. and it's Ian Happ. But even if they had won from the right side of the plate, you even know, if they had won, it doesn't change this issue with Hendricks. No, we'd still be discussing it, and and I firmly believe that. Like we we would still absolutely be discussing this because we have because we've had two, but at least we saw a Cubs team battle its way back offensively. And that's something that we've wanted to see. That was a change we wanted to see in the offseason. Can you get yourself back into a game? Time and time again, they did. And then, unfortunately, it comes it comes together in, in a terrible way. Bullpen walks seven people as well. But how are you preventing your bullpen from getting in the game to begin with, right? Yeah, you needed more than that yesterday. You did. That, 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 that hurt the team on a lot of levels yesterday. Being in another slugfest... And having to rely on, on, I mean, poor Mark Leiter is going to be tired by the, the middle of July. Well, and this is this is exactly what we didn't want to happen again. We all just lived this. We just watched this movie. Yep. Which is why they should have done more. And, and frankly, we had a discussion at Sluggers about what is the viability of a team whose ace gets hurt. Well, if the trends have told you bloody anything... You better learn how to figure it out because that is a preparation that you're going to have to make as a general manager, as a front office. I hope he's not actually hurt, uh, but at least it would explain something or it would explain. I mean, I I don't know if there's, there's nothing to indicate just from the stuff that we can see injury. His velocity is fine for Kyle Hendricks, but the problem is that his velocity isn't fine. That stuff has to be perfect, man. You got to paint the corners. You got to have perfect arm slot. You got to have perfect replication. When we return, we had uh, an interesting day looking at uh, what is happening in the news of the Chicago Bears. In the world of the Chicago Bears, something seemingly aligned to produce a a headline that is uh, worth questioning how and why and, and what we're doing. In my head, I'm listening to the Super Bowl shuffle. Hey, uh, caller six to the score contest line right now. 312-540-0670. Wins a pair of tickets to see the Cubs take on the Marlins at Wrigley Field this Sunday, April 21st, one twenty first pitch. We're going to give away another pair later in the show, but that is your first cue to call. Some Friday at 120 when the Sunday, temperature Sunday, is decent? Sunday at 120. Sunday at 120 when the temperature is decent? Yeah, be a lovely oh. day. Bears talk next on the score. We're closing in on the NFL Draft with the Bears holding the number one overall pick. Will Caleb Williams finally be the franchise quarterback that Bears fans have been waiting for all these decades? And now a touchdown throw. Fourth touchdown throw for Caleb Williams. What a display. And what will the Bears decide to do with the number nine overall pick? And the traffic with Lincoln. Oh, Dante, what a reaction. Keep listening to the scores team of draft experts leading up to Thursday, April 25th and throughout draft weekend. When it comes to a draft like this, Chicago knows where to go. Only Sports Radio 670 The Score. Always live on the free Odyssey app. Draft coverage on the scores presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. This segment is sponsored by Audi Exchange Highland Park. He wanted to go be out in these streets. And as a grown man, he should be able to go be out in these streets. But he went out in these streets. Some woman attacked him. And I mean that in the best possible way. Like, she didn't, like, he wasn't getting robbed. Like, this nice lady was like, hey, you know what happened, like, yesterday when you were watching Christopher Morell and he saw Wilson Contreras and he jumped on Wilson Contreras? That's that's what happened to me. Mm-hmm. That's what happened to Ray. And then he was Koch. And, and then yes. he was Koch Dicka, Koch Dicka, and he fell off a riser. That's right. So is it a fractured elbow that we're talking about, Okay, Ray? so it, it was dislocated here for Twitch since uh, I, I get to hide it under the desk, but here. 
for Twitch. There you go. You got to see the, the little rap. It's uh, it was dislocated because when I hit the floor after this uh, young lady jumped on me and she was a little taller than me, I don't know, she wasn't really thinking about the logistics of that, uh, and we fell forward. I hit my elbow, elbow first on the floor, and it popped out the socket. So, so that sucked. So it was dislocated. They popped it back in, and it's fractured. So that's the di the diagnosis for now. Ugh. And I'm going to see a bone specialist on Saturday. Exciting! Let's see a bone specialist. Yeah. So, so they haven't decided yet whether it's just casting or a surgery? Correct. Okay. Did they give you happy things they to did. make you feel better? They did. They next, did. Next time, go to an accredited hospital, yeah, please. Man. Instead of like... <laughs> I will... <laughs> I'm gonna. Seriously? I'm just gonna have to put this out there on, on these some, airwaves right now. This back place, alley hospital. Yes. It's like he has to. He has to knock on a yes. door. He has to bang on this storm door. And a guy and slides to, open a, a well, peephole. What you, do you want? And Ray, did you tell them about the first place you went to? You got rejected. I got rejected. Because you weren't hurt enough. I wasn't hurt enough. Says he man. wasn't a gunshot victim. That's went right. Some place owned by like the Bulgarian mob. That's right. <laughs> what the hell, man? Oh yeah. wait, I forgot the best part of the story. What was the name of the place that you were at? The Slippery Slope. There it is. Appropriately named. The so, Slippery Slope and takes another victim. That's right. And then and then Ray went to Kmart to get, get Basically, his elbow. Because, yeah. because, the hospital. because this wrap I have in my arm right now, this is the third version of this thing. The, the first time they put it on, it was like too tight and my, my arm was swelling up. And I could tell it was too tight, so I went back the next day, and I said, hey, you gotta fix this thing. And you then must they... place your arm in the body of live sheep. <laughs> right, so then they kind of straightened it out a little bit, and put it in the sling in a different way. And then, as, as I was the here old towards- country style. <laughs> right. And then as, as I was here towards the end of the day, it was swelling up again, so I went back like, what the hell is going on here? So, th this is the third version of this rap. And the young lady that put this thing on didn't know how to put the sling on. Oh, notice I had he, notice he, didn't say, he didn't say nurse. <laughs> I didn't. Hi, everybody! I didn't, put, I didn't put any respect on that title. I'm sorry. No hello, nurse. That I had to explain to her how to put the sling on. She was putting it on the wrong way. I was like, where the hell am I? <laughs> she, was, she was wearing nothing but head-to-toe camo and Kevlar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ray. so, so Poor Ray. was there a doctor there called Dr. Nick? Yes, uh, that yes. was him. <laughs> you have bone failure. We're popping it back in, everybody. <laughs> He's like a balloon.
draft coverage on the score is presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. Well, Kevin Warren has been on the job now for a year. So now apparently there's some agreement that both the Tribune and the Sun-Times will send scribes out to document the fact that Kevin Warren has been on the job for a year, which means we get the imperious pictures of Kevin Warren. Did they also include the file photos of him? Imperious Rex! Of him waking up without the use of an alarm clock and then standing in front of the George Hallis statue after he has consulted his personal Bible and then getting on with all of Bear's business as only he can. But I did okay, learn I do he wake had blackened up. shrimp. I do wake up before my alarm, though. It's anxiety. I just don't get out of bed. I'm like, ah. Uh. You know why Kevin Warren wakes up without an alarm clock? Motivation. Or he's like the rest of us old men and he has to pee three times a night. That is a reasonable answer. Because we're we're all on diuretics for for whatever reason, and you get up. No, you, no we all and, aren't. And, and, and old people are because and you and you get up because you're in pain and you need to use the bathroom. Yeah, but that's not no, your that's not your wake up time, Dan. But there's no glory in that. You see, sometimes you, it's your wake up time, and it's not you. You're not intending it to be. What's more <laughs> insulting, waking up ten minutes before your alarm or an hour before your he, alarm? He's not planning his day beyond like. To empty his bladder, like that's not how it goes. Sometimes that some that of us might does. that might happen, yep. but that's not his intended wake up time. My body knows when to wake me up, and then it tells me, and then I get on with everything. And the oh. George Halla statue says, "You need to use the bathroom." I was just going to say that typical I think Broadway comedy. <laughs> you got your our production budget is getting larger. We got two of them now. Yes, Adam. I think it's the. <laughs> I think I was going to say, I think it's the spirit of George Hallis that's waking him up. <laughs> like Marley's ghost? <laughs> it's time to wake up. Wake up. Make my franchise not suck. Come see Bears past, present, and future. Rise and grind. The when only way this gets any more ridiculous is if he's actually woken up by a live bear. That would be cool. When does the Scared ghost of Sid Luckman visit him? And he holds the football and he points at it and goes, this this is a football. Please confirm. How do we explain all of this to Caleb Williams? <laughs> has anybody <laughs> thought? Here has in, anybody thought about that? And I don't want to. Can see, we just not? That's like embarrassing. You thought that you were going to talk about deep dish and stuff, man. Herein lies the problem. <laughs> the, the herein are the issues. Yes, <laughs> Sid. Is that you, Sid? Yes. I'm holding a football in this hand and pointing to where I'm going to throw it. Doesn't that tell defensive backs where you're going to go? It might! But we don't care about interceptions at this point in history. It don't matter. We just sling the prolate spheroid down the gridiron. Dude, I loved it when Mike Tirico made a Sid Luckman joke. Like, he's in on the bit. Everybody's in on the bit. Because it's not a bit. It's all we have. Yes. Caleb, save us from all of this. But what... <sighs> Sorry, Caleb. It's going to be... It's going to be a lot. No pressure. Yeah, I just I all the pressure. Why is Kevin Warren so needy when it comes to coverage of him? Wait, wait, why wait. Do you think well, he, why why do why? you make the assumption that it's him? Yeah, that's that's a stretch to me. Well, who's in charge of it then? Who's in charge? The Sun Times and the Tribune are the ones that commission the story they on have the same to, day. They have to agree. They they I, ha the Sun Times editor and the Tribune editors have to agree to publish and run the story. It's well, a two way street. So yeah. It's probably a deposit in the favor bank. And you get this larger body of work. We know the larger body of work when it comes to the Bears publications. He's got his, his personal Boswell that, that walks around with him. And, but and that was, that was months ago. And isn't it I'm, because I, this, it it's seems the pretty, year anniversary yes, of his hiring? It's pretty clear what happened, Dan. The, the people, someone in the football consortium of the Sun-Times and at the Tribune was like, hey, it's been a year since Kevin Warren was hired. We should write a story about it. And I think that the reason the Bears have facilitated, frankly, they have facilitated these articles and this access is because we talked about Ted Phillips in a way that wasn't favorable for the team. This is a guy asking for public money for a stadium or asking for tax, tax breaks at least, and he's gonna. they're telling you who he is. We didn't know the other guy well enough, frankly. We knew his opinions on Mitch Trubisky, 
But we didn't know I the knew other a, stuff I knew that was lot, necessary. I knew a lot more about Ted Phillips than I know about Kevin Warren. But that's the you point. You covered so like, Ted Phillips every day, Dan. It's so not the same that's thing. That's what we're saying. It's like, hey, public, here are these articles about him so you get to know him. Mm, I, I think it's there's something else going on with this. Have we gotten the quarterback situation completely right? No. I appreciated that, that viewpoint. I felt like that was fair. Do you want enough games? No. no. Everything else is there. No, it wasn't. I had issue with that part. They seem to be trending in that direction now, though. Yeah, they I have thought a lot. about that. They have a lot of stuff. I thought about how that quote might actually mm-hmm. be coming to, to fruition. Drop the quarterback in now and see what happens. I... But I don't think I don't think this is Kevin Warren going to the the Sun Times or the Tribune and going. I've been here me. a year. You need to do a feature. I think it's everyone's trying to figure out Bears content, and the Tribune and the Sun Times are like, "Oh well, here's a here's a tent pole. It's been a year. What do we know about Kevin Warren?" And then you kind of write the same piece because you have the same idea, and there's there's no real news. And I will say that he's been more forward facing than you would expect for a team president, but it might be for the reasons that Layla pointed out. He wants to be that so that he can get what he wants from a stadium deal. You're more likely to get what you want when people know you. I think people. Will it's not get, if they held up a graphic of Bear. I don't think people would just give Bear money. Yeah, the people. I I don't like to get to know people Bear. through through published puff pieces. I like to get to know people. How? But how, how, how would you? How would you suggest that you get, fans, get to know think, Kevin how are Warren? Bears fans uh, what, supposed to know I don't him? need to know Kevin Warren. The people who are making the decisions on the money need to know Kevin Warren. But how are Bears fans supposed to know who? He I is? think Bears fans only care if the team wins or not. I don't. I don't think Bears fans need to know when he you know when he wakes up or if he's eating blackened shrimp. Are you going to win 10 games and make the playoffs next year? Now, what's the ultimate effect of this? Where am I watching games? How much do tickets cost? So, so here's, my, here's my question. Why is your ire for Kevin Warren then? It's it's more concerned than I'm not mad at him. I just find it weird. I just think, right. But what I'm saying, I'm your reaction to it is weird. Well, I just that, think- that, that you seem to want to center Kevin Warren as this is this I, is him when it was clearly both of the publications' choices to do the right, same story. But the larger body of work suggests that he is in Kevin Warren is in charge of Bears.com. Kevin Warren is in charge of everything that comes is from the Is he in team. charge of the Sun Times, Dan? No, but is he in charge of the Tribune? Then, I just, then what are you talking about? I think it is an oddly coincidental that both papers wrote profiles I, of him I don't, Dan, that were similar Dan, on the very it, same day. It's it's a year since he took the job. So why they it makes sense that they would do that. You're putting that on him. That's that's on the choices that the newspapers made. They're which are not made in a vacuum. So you, what are you saying? I don't know. Cuz you're being super cryptic and weird right now. I I I get think, to the point. What I, are you saying? Who who's pulling the strings here as far as you're concerned? I'm wondering what the deposit in the bank is. Why why publications and it's not just newspapers. All the coverage of Kevin has been this supplicating coverage that has been led by the team rather than asking what's what's actually happening? What's getting done? So this what, quote, when he says to the Sun-Times, Warren said, this is the year to agree on a stadium plan. He expects to release stadium rendering soon. That's valid. For which stadium? That's newsworthy. For which stadium? It said a stadium plan. Okay. Well, we know there's two stadium plans, at least two at the moment. We know that this is a leverage play for the one. I just, I'm always concerned by... With every when when somebody when somebody seems like they always need to have coverage reflect who who they are and what they're doing and this cult of personality and frankly it goes back to some of what I heard from people who worked at the Big Ten. All right, we don't have time to figure this out or walk I, around inside I just, your mind. I, I just I'm just not I don't I don't I don't trust somebody who. All, I, I, I'm always going to look askance at someone who constantly needs public reinforcement of their power and their image and their greatness. Great. We do a talk show every day for four hours. Yep. Great. Let's table this so that we can talk with Dawn Staley. She's going to join us to talk about 
basketball. Winning. And Camilla Cardoso and Angel Reese next here on The Score. The Parkinson Spiegel Show on your ride home. Afternoons 2 to 6 on The Score. Chicago Cub Nico Horner. What's it like in that dugout? When Michael Bush homers again. It's cool to see teammates do, you know, incredible things like that. I feel like like, he's just super steady in how he handles just everything from never seeing him, like, worked up or on edge about anything. And it's so it kind of makes it, honestly, even easier to believe in him. Danny Parkins, Matt Spiegel, afternoons 2 to 6 on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Always live on the free Odyssey app. This segment is sponsored by Champion Roofing when it comes to roofing. You know, I'm, 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 I'm waking up, I'm hitting the Peloton at like 4.30 in the morning Colorado time, and I've got people real mad at me in Chicago that, how dare you? The crosser was open. And I'm like, bud, the crosser was not open when he hits the top of his drop, so he moves on to the cop route, but there's a radio guy up there, Mike North. He was real mad, and oh, I tried God. to handle it gently. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I tried oh, to no. handle it gently because, like, listen, the first thing in his bio oh, was no. he was born in 1952, and if my grandpappy's on Twitter roasting somebody, I hope they handle him gently. And I tried to. He got real mad about it. Dan, I'm, 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 I'm going to make this bigger than it is, but also I feel like it's completely accurate. That, that, that is the universe harmonizing with itself. What just happened? was i think the evolution of this radio station we're not the only show that has a tape guy because we have a better sense of all of the things that are connected to a quarterback's performance and to have and the listener has a desire yes, to go to that level to, to, now to, to, to now really know to, why what how yes and so for those two things to meet on social media <laughs> Where our tape guy is getting screamed at <laughs> on Twitter because he, from the guy who used to host in this he's time, he's a running slot. back. That and he called him Grandpappy yes. too. Yes, like that part of it. Like he was, yes, like some, somebody somebody give Papa his his tea and tell him it's nap time. That is <laughs> someone isolate that part and send it to Terry. Because I would love to know. T- like, I would love for him to react to that. And the 708 texter who immediately snapped into action by saying, does Tim Jennings ever try eating jardinera off his shoes? <laughs> <laughs> that was an amazing moment in score history.
Hour is brought to you by Team Hochberg. Visit their website, 56david.com. That's 56david.com. Six seconds to go. Perfection with a touch of sweet redemption. Undefeated South Carolina has won its third national championship. With the third pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Chicago Sky select Camilla Cardoso, University of South Carolina. Thanks to ESPN for those highlights. And uh, we have the pleasure now of welcoming to the score on the Circa Sports Illinois Hotline. Download the Circa Sports app today. Hall of Famer, three-time national champion coach and reigning national champion coach Don Staley. Don, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for going on my walk with me. I'm sorry we got to we got to get our walks in early in South Carolina because it's going to go up to ninety. Okay, so <laughs> so so this adds to a question I was going to say for later, but I might as well ask it now. Is there going to be another dog since there was another championship? You know, somebody asked me that because I said every time we want we want a national championship that I would get a dog, but my my one and only dog champ said. He's an only child, so no. <laughs> That's okay with being front and center. Coach, how do you describe the buildup from the beginning of this past season and what we saw? It was really fun to watch your your game be broadcast in the lead up to it be on national TV and have the special and then have it play out the way it did, undefeated, yet another title, and see all the eyes who watched this final four and watched the championship game culminate like this. And then even going into the NBA WNBA draft and seeing your players succeed like they did as well. You know, we, you, you, when you, when you've been around a game, as long as I've been around a game, it, it doesn't happen very often like this, or it probably never happens to a lot of people. Um, we just really got lucky. We got lucky. We lost all of our starters and we, 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 we've returned some talent, no doubt about it. Um, talent doesn't always say you're going to win the last game of the season, but what our talent was able to do is create some chemistry. Like, it was inner chemistry. It... Oh, no. Cylon's got Dawn? Man. If we, if we are in trouble because we were the ones who – that uh, to happen. On the walk on a lovely South Carolina morning. Can't have that. Getting out there, getting the getting the steps in and all that. So we will <laughs> we will reestablish contact. Maybe she uh walked into a low service area. It happens. It bees like that sometimes. Isn't it called the low country there? It depending, yeah. Closer to where the the water is. Yep. Well. Low country. Sounds Cylon to me. Yep. Could be that's that that's where they they start in like the, the old Gullah Geechee territory there, they where the Calabash seafood is. All right, now we got Dawn back. Thank you, Dawn. You were saying about the, the this run that you guys had that it wasn't easy. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I, I think our, our players decided that um, they wanted to win for each other, and we didn't we didn't do any like team bonding or life skills or anything like that. We did some life skill stuff, but it was more of just them. We wanted them to spend some time with each other. But just when the season started, I, I do think our our game in Paris against Notre Dame really gave our players some confidence to know that they're really good. And it was it was all all of, all on their doing too. Like once they saw that they were good, they didn't want to be anything but good, but great. So I think, you know, when you're when you when you've been around a game as long as I've been around a game, it just doesn't happen this way. You in, you put the hard work into it, and we did. Uh, we really got lucky. We got lucky. We got lucky throughout the season, um, but we we prepared to be lucky because <laughs> you can just be lucky, but you can also prepare to be lucky because there were some games in which, you know, it took some heroics by. You're you're now your number three pick in the WNBA draft. Camila Cardoso hit a three, and the SEC semifinals in a tournament, and you know the 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 claws of defeat were were grabbing around our team, and somehow we got lucky enough to 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 hit a miracle shot, and and 
from there, it, it continued to give us the boost to just take that confidence throughout the rest of the season, knowing that we were going to be up against some great competition. Um, but again, when you have someone like Camilla Cardoso, she gives you a really good shot at winning because you can control the paint with a player like, like Camilla. Well, I loved what she said immediately after the sky drafted her. I know we're excited to see her play in Chicago, but when she said nobody's out, out rebounding us with Angel Reese and her, that, that's <laughs> such a great team. I, I hear you laughing. I know that that's something that she prioritizes. It, it certainly shows. Look, Camilla's a, the ultimate competitor. Um, Angel Reese, ultimate com- competitor. We we had we had a lot of battles uh, last year and this year, this season. Um, we were the top two teams in the SEC, so you know they are they <laughs> they are enemies by by nature because of of rivalries. But now they're joining hands in in hopefully bringing a na- sorry not a national but a WNBA championship to Chicago. So I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna get me some season tickets. I know I won't be there the entire season, but somebody's gonna be sitting in my seats cheering Camilla Cardozo on. And the fact that you're a fan also comes through in the level of diplomacy, Don, that you've shown regarding Caitlin Clark. And there are other people, other people with resumes. You know, you're talking about some Hall of Fame levels, some OGs in the basketball business that can't quite seem to bring themselves to say all of the nice things that would seem to come so easily. Does that surprise you? And why have you been simply just more comfortable in acknowledging how special and awesome Caitlin Clark has been. No way. Cylon's got her again. I wonder if the, um, if she's walking, like if her cheek is on the phone <laughs> and it accidentally hangs it up. <laughs> Put a man on the moon, but. <laughs> and you know, she stayed after the game and went back out after post game to talk to any reporter who needed an interview from her. Yeah, that's the that's how Dawn rolls. Like that's that's a big Dan. Do you want to ask the question again, or do you want to try, try something else? I'm back. All right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how much you heard of the question, but essentially, I heard it. Oh, you did hear it. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I did. I got you. Good. Let, let, let me let me let me say this. I don't think uh, other people are hating on Caitlin Clark. I think it was more respect for the history of the game. So I think it, it comes from that perspective because when you when you think of some of the greats, because you know, when you throw around the greatest um, college basketball player ever, um, I, I think of Brianna Stewart who won four championships. I do. Like I'm never going to forget that because she 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 banged it on our head all you know all four years. And then when I think about Caitlin Clark, I, I do think she's one of the greatest. Like, she's the greatest of her time. That's how she's the greatest of her time. And I, I want basketball, women's basketball to grow. And I'm not too shy about saying why it grows. She's made it grow over the past two years. And, I, and I'm actually going to go back to her freshman year when she was killing then, when nobody wanted to talk about Caitlin Clark because – you know, Paige Beckers was was all of that, deserving so. But I saw, I saw Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark won my Dawn Staley Award in her freshman year, when everything was about Paige Becker. And it's nothing to take away from Paige Becker, but it's everything to say that we we need to make sure that we're telling the stories of of our entire game. So sometimes you have to go against the masses, against the masses to really cut down and say what's happening, you know, in, in real time. Caitlin Clark is the sole reason why viewership has has shot through the roof for our game. Sole reason. Sole reason. And I think the decision makers are following suit in making sure that other other games are being played besides Caitlin Clark because because if you play Caitlin Clark, you're gonna run up against somebody that you might find as as that's pretty good. You know, we, we were pretty good. Like we eighteen over eighteen million people saw our national championship game. They they tuned in to see Caitlin Clark, but what did they get? They got Caitlin Clark and they got South Carolina. They got Camilla Cardoso. 
They got Ashton Watkins. They got Malaysia Fuwali. They got Tessa Johnson. They got a number of players that they can now cheer for. Let's not act like you're not on that list too, Dawn, mm-hmm. and we start talking about greatest college players of all time. But I wanted to ask you, how did you develop your coaching style? Because when when I see how other players react to you, players from other teams, how they react to you, I'm going, wow, there's a, there's a great balance of respect and love that seems to come to you and from you. How did you figure out how to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't care. Like, I don't. I don't, I I care about our game. I care about the people in our game. I don't, I really, I do. I I want our game to grow. So I just, I'll compliment players if if, in a game. If a player, you know, hell, Kaylin Clark hit a three right in front of me. She did push off my player. (laughs) Right in front of me. (laughs) Bang the three right in front of me. And I'm like, damn, like, okay. Like, good shot. Like, I mean, it's all of that. Like, I am, I'm impressed with our our young talent. I'm impressed with the coaching. I'm impressed with seeing great basketball. Like, like I've watched so much basketball this year because I had access to it. It was on ESPN. It was on ESPN two. I had my, my, my iPad going. I had my laptop going. I'm a, I'm a woman of many TVs in my house and cable boxes and all of that. So I, I was stimulated so much this season that, that, um, it it was really hard for me to prepare for our opponents because there was so much good great basketball. Like I had to get my stuff in by five PM Eastern time because that's when games are gonna be starting to play on, on, on national television and in streaming services. So I, I just want everybody to win. I truly and I'm not being facetious when I say that. This game has been so good to me, like personally good to me that I, I feel like I owe basketball. Like, I'm forever indebted to basketball, and I got to do it in this way, is to show love. There's no doubt that you come from a place of service. It shows, you know, in the in the game you coach or whether you're talking to reporters. I thought it was so kind of you to wait after the national title game, after you were on the podium, and then come back and talk to reporters. But I also appreciate what you say about the important part about other schools investing. And you bring up how South Carolina has invested in women's basketball and how that needs to happen in more schools in the NCAA. What is your thought on that? It's just my thought. Like, like I, you know, we, we do the same things. Like if you, if you really look across uh, colleges and universities, you'll see that the, the, the women's sports programs are killing it in the space, killing it. Um, And I don't think we get enough credit. I don't. Um, people will say because we're not revenue producing. I, I think we are revenue producing. I think the fact that we get 16,000 people in our in our arena every game. We have, you know, five sellouts per, per season every year. Um, concession stands open. Okay, people are coming from, from near and far to have lunch and dinner, to stay in hotels. We are revenue producing. But – it's because our athletic department and our university, they have poured into our program and they pour into women's programs. I mean, I make a lot of money. They, they pour into me um, because I'm a representative of our, our, our athletics department, our university, our city, our state, and they pay me well for it because we've been successful. And that is the way it's supposed to be. When you're successful, we need to find the money to pay the successful people. And if it's women, it's women. If it's men, it's men. I, I really I really try to get to that place of understanding why we we cheapen it if it's women. Why we cheapen our salaries, why we why we have an excuse for why we shouldn't pay. And it's 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 revenue producing, but what sport besides power five football produces revenue everybody's in the red (laughs) is everybody's in the red but it's about how you value what's your value system and i do think at south carolina they value um me being an asset uh to our to our university and there are others across the country that are assets to the community to the university to the city and their state 
and they should be paid accordingly. Don, let's that's go back to the, that's investing. Let's go back to the SEC tournament because that shot that Camilla hit was in front of her family. And I remember that being like a big yeah. deal that her her family had made it in from Brazil. How how were you able to make that happen, number one? And why was it important to you to make that happen? Yeah. Um, Camilla sacrificed so much, you know, as a young person to come over here in the eighth grade and spend your high school years um, in someone else's home. Um and then spend another four years in college away from her from her family. Like there was like a there was like four years before she even actually was able to go home after coming to the states. And then um, we we uh, we we Camilla didn't even know we were trying to get her sister and her mom here. They they took a bus twelve hours from their hometown um, to I think it was Sao Paulo where they needed no Rio. I don't I, I don't know what city they had to go to, but they were they they got interviewed for like two seconds and the and the the counselor people said no. They just said no. They got denied a visa to come to the States to to see their daughters, their their daughter and sister. And then we're like, Okay, well well we only got a month left before before, you know, her senior night. So I said we got to call the con- we got to call Congressman Congressman uh, Clyburn, um, the everybody at the top level of our university, our president. You know we we got everybody involved to make it happen, and, and, and somehow the next time they went that that twelve hour bus ride, <laughs> just as quickly as they got turned away, is they got the stamp of approval because they really understood what they were trying to do. And who they're trying to do it for. So sometimes it takes some political people to make things happen. And I'm just so very happy that a magical moment happened while they were here. It was magical regardless. But for Camilla to make that shot and that time to, to, to continue our undefeated season, it will be etched in their hearts and their minds and their souls um, that they that they got a chance to, to witness that. We're talking oh. with Hall of Famer and three-time national champion, reigning national champion, Don Staley. And Don, I, I know you have to get rolling soon. But the I, I also I wanted to thank you for the answer you gave that 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 rodent troll of a reporter when it came to the theoretical question about trans athletes. I thought what you said mm -hmm. was significant. It will be remembered, and I thought it took a great deal of courage for you to, to say something that sounded so simple, but meant so much to so many people. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a human being. We're, we're talking about human beings, human beings, human beings. So I, I always speak from my heart, whether people believe it or not. Um, I know that I know the God I serve is, is, uh, is, has blessed me. He's blessed me. Whether you agree or disagree, um, that's on you. Everybody, everybody has an opportunity to speak what they believe in. It's just so somebody threw a mic in front of me, and they caught me off guard with the question. Um, and I didn't even know what the question, the first question was. I had to ask myself the question to answer my own question uh, because I really didn't understand it. So I, I appreciate you. I've gotten so much um, incredible letters, emails from um, the transgender community that it does my heart good knowing that that somebody speaks up for them. And lastly, I, I've always been wondering, and you're the perfect person to ask, what's the deal with Kim Mulkey? Like, why why is she seemingly so unhappy, defensive, and 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 just kind of mean? Like, what's what's her deal? I mean, I, Kim, Kim Kim Mulkey, she's a competitor. Like, she's not gonna she's not gonna allow people to to speak out of term. Um, she's not going to allow people to speak out a term uh, regarding her players. That's just the way she is. I mean, is I mean, you either love her or you hate her. Um, she's a competitor. You know, I I think I I think. Listen, I think the world's a better place because we have a Kim Mulkey, because she's going to push conversations that that nobody else would like to talk about, good, bad, or indifferent. I think she's good for our sport because. We're treated as a sport. 
because they somewhat look at her as a villain, and they love villains. We love villains. Every sport loves villains. It makes our sport go uh, go to another place. And, you know, she's Kim Mulkey. I, I can't I can't speak out of term with her. I mean, she's been nothing but kind to me, congratulatory, and and I've been nothing but welcoming her into uh, the SEC. So, you know, different strokes for different folks. You know, I don't. Mm-hmm. That's, that's well, I, I, well I love competing compete against her. I, I really do. I love competing against her because I know, you know, if you if you beat a, a, a Kim Mulkey's team, you know she's prepped well for you. And she, she's not going to like it. Well, Don, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, for being on with us. And we look forward to seeing you in Chicago at a Sky game. And I can't wait because I got to ask you the question about crossing over Martin Lawrence. But that's another story <laughs> for another time. Don, thanks so much. Oh, no, we lost her again. It's fine. That was great. She had to go anyway. That the great, great Don Staley. That was great. We, got, we all got to hang out with her on her morning walk. I mean, walking champ. I just, I don't know how you top that season, man. Like that, that would be my question. 70, you, 74 and one in the last two seasons. How do you how draw that? up? And how many, how do you draw you up a more, a better season than that? And, and to see all of your players succeed the way they did. And we get to talk about Camila Cardoso on the sky, like to see it all the way through to well, the WNBA. And even like a player like Raven Johnson, who was embarrassed last year by Caitlin Clark embarrassed to I dare you to shoot I dare you to shoot we're gonna sag off of her because she can't shoot and then Raven Johnson worked really hard Dawn went out and got a bunch of shooters to add to what her dominance was inside it's great coaching like really incredible coaching and there are so many people in that sport coaches who that's that's what they want to do. Like that, there's an authenticity. There is a true love for the game in general and wanting to support it. And that means all facets. I just, man, I could listen to that woman cook for hours. Me too. She's truly greatness. I think I'm going to try to find a time to go down there. Like I, I think I want to experience like a a dawn press conference. And also just to work with with politicians who understand sports, man. And hopefully we get a chance to see her. Like I, I, <laughs> I love that. Who wouldn't? I love that idea of her just being in the city, hanging out. And Camila Cardoso seems so happy to be here. Well, the first yeah. thing she talked about is rebounding. Well, good. And we're going to talk to the Sky General Manager in the 1 o'clock hour, Jeff Pagliaca. And I, I'll ask him the question, the stuff we were talking about yesterday, about how the organization is going to meet this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity where it needs to be met with investment and effort and not presuming everything is going to be done for you. She speaks out about that for a reason, Tom Staley. She speaks out about, about the importance resources. of resources. Yes, they and, matter. And with star power, you know, you want to make sure that people also have the ability to focus too, because it's such an accessible sport. And I loved what she said about uh, her, her competitor and who's wearing the black hats and the white hats and the whole thing. I'll just, I'll say this. I know where I would send my daughter. And I think it's an easy choice. And if I had asked you that question so years ago before, <laughs> but if I had asked you that question years ago, a school in the SEC, in the American South, which was an entrant in the Tournament of Bad. I I know the, the camp, the, the person that I would like having that much of an outsized impact on someone important to me. And I think that decision is very easy. And she makes a huge difference for everybody there, too. It, it's, we need her. Let's talk a little more basketball when we come back. I did watch the NBA stuff last night, and there was stuff. There was a lot going on. You had you know Kevin Harlan and Reggie Miller making that early game feel very, very big. And there was a very, very big person out there running into some, uh, some habitual issues. And are the Warriors over? Probably. Yeah, Nick, kind of. Nick- Nick Friedel covered them for years on a, a network we can't mention. He's next on the score. No, he's not. He's coming up actually in the oh, next he's not. hour. Yeah, we're just going to talk about the play-in games next. Yeah, the I, three I was, of us. I was on Eastern Time. I'm sorry. It's all good. I forgot time and space because Don Staley's cool. She is cool. Talk more buckets next here on the score. Bucket. This is Chicago's number one and most listened to sports station. We're live from Chicago, talking Chicago sports. Listen on your radio or through the Odyssey app. A U D A C Y. We are 670 the score. Always live on the free Odyssey app. 
This segment is sponsored by... A morning TV show out of Calgary where a woman named Leslie Horton just wins at the game. And you can take part in our morning of giving today. Our Leslie Horton... We got Leslie's name too, did we not? Peaches Cookie Fingers. Peaches Cookie Finger. Down in the parking lot. What? <laughs> that's your elf. Okay, what? Yeah, Is that elf. my stripper name? It's elf. elf. Christmas elf. Oh! Christmas elf, <laughs> Christmas elf name. <laughs> Peaches Sticky Fingers? Cookie Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> because Peaches Sticky Fingers is a better stripper name <laughs> than elf name is what I'm thinking. <laughs> Everything is fine. Everything oh is God. fine here. Man, wow. if that's not the best audio I've heard recently. Wow. What were okay, what were they <laughs> were they using some sort of calculator to come up with the elf name? You know how they just have those fun like, yeah, like just, infographics that roll around. Infographic is a real complimentary term. Yeah, I would like to see Where it. I'd like, just, to, like, I'd like to judge know what based on your the first letter of your first name and like what month you were born or something. Leslie's Twitter bio says, TV host, mom, cancer warrior, sometimes I make artichoke dip. I would she like just to, sounds entertaining. I want to know what my elf name would be. I don't think it would be that one. Uh, who knows? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I like how she repeated it and it got even worse. And you can take part in our morning of giving today. Our Leslie Hort we got Leslie's name too, did we not? Peaches Cookie Fingers. Peaches Cookie Finger. Down in the parking lot. <laughs> that's your elf. Okay, what? Yeah, that's Is that elf. my stripper name? It's elf. elf. Christmas Elf. Oh! Christmas Elf, <laughs> Christmas elf name. Ah, ah, ah. Peaches Sticky Fingers? <laughs> Cookie Fingers. <laughs> because Peaches Sticky Fingers is a better stripper name than Elf name. It's what I I, I I love that so much. I'm like, best morning show ever. Okay, guys, I just went to yourelfname.com. Oh, okay. there's a website? Yourelfname.com, and I entered in Dan Bernstein. And Dan, your elf name is Floppy Angel Lips. Whoa. That's your, el your elf name, Dan. That is inappropriate. Yes, it is. Floppy Angel Lips? <laughs> that's, that's what the elf generator came up with for you. <laughs> Sweet. And All right, you're next, Layla. Give me a minute. No, I don't want the Doing minute. This live on radio. I don't want to be floppy angel lips. <laughs> Too bad, you are. <laughs>
two great friends, Mike Brown and Steve Kerr, an embrace, largest margin of victory since 2006 for Sacramento over Golden State and Keegan Murray was brilliant here tonight with 32 points. Well, that was a no-doubter. The early game got exciting and was at the moment that Zion left, you just thought, ah, because there were, there were so many moments, so many exchanges of haymakers being thrown and big threes and big rebounds. Anthony Davis had an unbelievable rebound. I don't know if you saw it, but he reached up with his right hand against his body and over a defender and scooped the rebound with one hand on the back sweep. That's remarkable. Remarkable to be able, I've seen a one-handed rebound where you kind of pull it down like like a football catch. He did oppositely. It was in a really important time. And to see LeBron at his age doing what he's doing and going up against and Zion, I just I felt a little cheated that, that Zion left, but it was it was fun stuff. Well, and what was compelling too was what happened on Sunday leading up to the games to yesterday and today. Like that to me also gave it so much context. And that Lakers Pelicans game on Sunday that was in New Orleans, I felt I was like, oh, is this a preview of what we're gonna see? And yeah, there's something about these these players, this generation of players, and how they're programmed. Where if you say tournament, everybody everybody gets a little more hype. Whether it's in season, whether it's play in, whether it's the playoffs, it does take it up a level. And I appreciate that when we get to watch it and enjoy. I felt like, man, you're watching full strength Zion. He was going at AD. He was going at LeBron. He was getting the ball in the front court and just going to the basket. And how just, about the rejumps? How about when he was re- rebounding his own miss and like popping back up multiple times and then getting fouled? Yeah, like seeing him, all that potential that all of us believe he has was on display last night. And then you go, oh, man, really? Like, this is the way that it ends? Like it, it it ends like this, where now they're probably not going to have him available for for their game. Physics doesn't care. Physics doesn't care about basketball, and it's just the the force. It the, all that force has to go somewhere. We watch some people defy it, though. We're in a city where people seemingly defied it, but not at that size. No one's ever been like that. No one's ever been three hundred pounds and six ten. And been and been that explosive that I can remember. Not like that. Where? Well, it makes it, it makes it so sad because you're like, okay, like this this could have been like one of those changing of the guard moments, and it wasn't. And LeBron was amazing last night too. Like he his ability to find his teammates, his willingness to find his teammates. And it was on on display. It was it was great. Alvarado was out there playing his ass off. Everyone adores Alvarado. Not a true point guard. No, and, but, but a pest. But an yeah. athlete and somebody you're happy you got in watching early. He blocked AD. Like he's like you're proud. You're proud to have the knowledge of him. It's a real pest. And whenever he would play the Bulls, he was always a pest. Oh my word, yes. So now we'll see if they can survive their matchup without Zion against Sacramento. And the the thing about the and we can talk with Nick about this at twelve twenty five, like seeing hearing the the quotes from the locker room of Golden State and seeing the way that that game went down last night, it does feel like you know what what really cemented it for me? There was this great video a couple days ago of Steph and Riley Curry. And Steph, uh, Riley's like 13 now. And I think she's playing volleyball. So Steph got the ball and he set it. And then she bumped it. He caught it and he shot it and made it. And I was sitting there going, look at how much time has gone by. Where now Riley Curry is a young lady. And, And here we are with this thing being so dominant for as long as it's been that you know you're close to the end because 
soon we're going to be talking about Riley Curry's recruitment. You know what I mean? Yeah. And th- that's how far down the road this thing has gone. And Clay's not the same player anymore. And Draymond can't stop kicking people in the ding ding. And <laughs> All of the other Draymond, stuff, it just stop doing that. It just feels like the, nope. the end of something. But I don't want to. I don't want to not watch Steph Curry because he's still playing at a really high level, and he can probably still do it for a couple more years. But it's it with the way that they're they're in salary hell too. I don't know how you're going to be able to get out of this. Just reading the post game quotes from Steve Kerr. Knowing that you can read them with his voice in your head, but just simply reading them, you could tell there's an element of finality here. Yes. And we've been asking that question for a long time. We have. We asked when they when they won their most recent title, was that the end of the run? Is this the end of the run? Is this I, the end of the run? I wonder if Steve Kerr is going to return. I was just going to say, he. you talk about aging like a president, a guy who has... Who was always you know alongside and and being coached by Phil Jackson for that long? He really is whether he wanted to or not. He's be and I hope he doesn't keep becoming Phil Jackson. Well, and I, he's got the bad I, back. Yeah, and- it's been rough on him. It really has. And and you can hear he sounds tired. I guess is what it is. He just he sounds weary. Well, last night, I mean, I've talked to him before games here, and he didn't sound tired recently this season. But I think. Last night, when when you're trying to put all that together, and you know, here we are being a little hot takey instead of talking as much about the game, we're talking about whether or not this is the end of the Warriors' run. But when he says we need Clay back, he still has good years left. We desperately want him back. And it's not so much him using the word desperately; it was the phrase "he still has good years left" that got to me. It, it's hard when you have a player that was a top five two way player. In, in Clay, and now he's relegated to maybe he can help us coming off the bench. I don't even know if that's satisfying for Clay. Because well, I don't know that it, hurt, it helps his game either. No. I think he needs minutes to be out there to miss the shots, to make the shots. To, to be in the rhythm yes. of it? Yeah, because if, if he's going to be streaky like that, like we saw it against the Bulls, where if you have a sleepy half and then you have a hot half, you got to be out there for both. Between the Jordan Poole stuff that happened the Draymond stuff that keeps happening and a decline in clay. I'm not sure what else Steve Kerr has to prove. So I don't know. Like, I wonder if he, he takes some time and thinks about what happens next. Cause he doesn't, he's one of the brightest guys in the NBA. I felt this way about pop when the Spurs came to their conclusion. And then he got Victor Wimbanyama. Like, I felt the same way. Well, I mean, if you get Victor, then yeah, you definitely want to keep coaching. But even with Pop, like, how many more losing seasons does he want to endure? And he even th- with a great player. And he thought he was retiring when Tim retired. Yep. Tim Duncan. And here Maybe we are. remember him. From Star Wars. From Star Wars. We have High Noon and coming chicken. up next. Oh, Chicken's here? Mm-hmm. And you know what? Thanks to my friends at Jewel who know that I give them a lot of my money because those wings are boneless. Let's go! These are actually Jewel Osco honey chicken tenders. Hot, boneless, the same sweet breading that made their honey wings so popular. And they're part of Jewel Osco's Love My Tender Tuesday promotion. As opposed to Cheap Chicken Monday? Uh, or all the fresh fried tenders are only $5 per pound every Tuesday. You know where See? my money goes, Jewel. Making you friends. You saucy, saucy geniuses. Uh, I, I I guess I'm, I'm a born-again... A koala truther. So I've been accused so far on the show of being a Ron Jeremy truther. Well, but but you owe five dollars. But I am five dollars every time Dan kills somebody. No, but he's I I I I'm with studs on the koala thing now, and and koalas are coming here. So now it's it's acute and urgent. I want to talk about Cleveland again. I'm listening. I had to save mine because I know this is going to go in, in places we needed to go. You think Cleveland's cool? I I liked their hip hop station when I passed through. All right. Does that count? We'll talk about that next here on the score. Mullen Hawk, Chicago's number one most listened to sports morning show, five thirty till ten a.m. There's three of them in the top ten that are potentially franchise caliber wide receivers. If one of those three wide receivers sitting there at nine, the added benefit of grabbing a guy like that is that. 
My favorite studs <laughs> drop in of the day is when Dan was going to break. And you guys were, I assume, already late for break if your guys' clock is on anything like ours. And then Studs goes, and another thing about koalas. Yes! <laughs> if Stephen A. Smith would have said what you would have said, it would have had two million views on Instagram. <laughs> to me, koalas are preposterous. <laughs> there is no explanation for the koala having survived as long as they have. I'm looking right into the camera and I'm saying to you, koala, you do not want to make an enemy out of me. It was unbelievable. You eat nothing but eucalyptus, which is poison to you, and yet you eat it anyway and make yourself sick. The koala makes no sense. It was the best executed take of the day. It was fantastic. There was no doubt about it. It was flawless. And, like and, in a just world, it would be made as a promo that Ru Russ would have running on an endless loop was, on the stream. Was that? Were you talking about how chlamydia is taking out the koalas? Was that the story? Uh, we no. learned that after. <laughs> okay, because chlamydia is apparently killing Australian koalas. Uh, good. Do All over. <laughs> Studs wishing it's chlamydia. No, it's about time something caught up with them. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it was a great take, Studs. Honestly, top notch. I, I have no doubt. Why are they evil? For some Why reason, I thought evil? you would not, appreciate it. Oh, no. It was amazing. started, Speaks. Okay. Get, right. You've gotten him upset about a few things, but it was like retroactive and things that happened to him, like the Ashton Kutcher incident. Oh, well. Oh, I yeah. mean, that'll always be my favorite contribution what? that he's made to the no, score so, airways. Studs, studs but I, I feel like that left a mark, don't you? I feel like that damaged He studs. definitely likes me less because of it. Well, <laughs> because, I mean, get, I, get in line. I know, really. but I just encourage it to be played at all times. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, think, I wonder if it's made him gun shy at all as, a, as a producer. I don't think so. Mm -mm. Yeah, right, good. But, but his, I his, mean, if the koala take is any indication. His take was that they've cheated the evolutionary process. Oh. That somehow they've slipped through the cracks because n they have nothing that preys on them. So they they because they, they're always sick. Right, they live a life where they eat something that poisons them, mm. but nothing eats them because they've become poisonous, and yet they're always sick. So they really shouldn't exist. I gotcha. And and Burnsy, I could tell, didn't want to agree with a stud's take. <laughs> And then he was like, "I yeah, he's boxed me in," uh, and it was just. I'm telling you, there's it, no way to argue against this point other than they're cute. It, it yeah, bugs me. All right, hey man, it's a lot of us. Have, a lot of things have gotten by on being cute. That's right. Getting through life on charm is a real thing, even though you can't do it. All right, studs. <laughs> is it your take? Or has, so have you heard this from someone else? Be honest. Uh -oh. I, develop, uh -oh. I developed this take because I read about koalas. Oh, I, well, that's what they, I just so yes, really is random. I, yeah, I read. No, I just I read about their life cycle on some random post that came across my way like years ago. All right, and I just like think to myself, I'm like, so why do they exist? All right, that's your take then. That's great. Dan, I'll, I'll I'll remember it forever. Danny, wondering if it's his take is also. <laughs> yeah, so, I can like, see that's it not, being, not a way to get him to like you that's more. So like, 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 he, like he took it from Bill Hicks. Or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just curious. Like this was on the take sort of was so good. Was, Danny had to know where it came. I wanted to I'm know going, the source material of the take. Good.
High Noon. Your Wednesday High Noon marks the middle of your work week, and we have reached it after talking about the Cubs and the underperformance of Kyle Hendricks at varying degrees of alarm. Jed Hoyer, Tommy Hadovy weighed in. I would declare a an IL stint for him right now. I just don't think you can run him out there as a member of your active roster with the way he's pitching and the strains that he puts on the rest of your team. We also talked about the coincidence that today marked a year of Kevin Warren on the job with the Bears and in came the pieces that we've come to expect when Kevin Warren is a headline where it's more sort of about him and his presence and his power as much as it is what's actually gotten done. And I, I'm, I'm just, my, my antenna is always up to something that has felt like a media plan for a political campaign more than a sports executive. Hear me out. Kevin Warren, the musical. I'm listening. It, it is a political campaign. We want a stadium. Maybe we bought the land too early. Exactly. But now we got to get our taxes lowered. Act two. We discussed the NBA last night and getting ready for the NBA tonight. And we had a lovely conversation with the always candid and opinionated Don Staley. Um, so you like Cleveland? You think Cleveland's cool? I've never had a problem with Cleveland. <laughs> Should well, I? Am I supposed was, to? That was a famous quote, Dan. That's yeah, but that's Joakim Noah. Yeah, I, right. I, I've never had a problem. And with Joakim him. went on and said more things about Cleveland. Have you and LBJ worked things out yet? Uh, nope, we haven't. But I, I played in Cleveland. I enjoyed my time in Cleveland. Yeah, you not so much. Go ahead. But what people have to understand that it had nothing to do with Cleveland. Mm -hmm. It had everything to do with that. Month. LeBron James, <laughs> like, yo, every year you're losing, you know you have to get through him. That's where it came from. Like, LeBron was so good, he was stunting on us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was stunting on us. Like, he over here dancing before the game. I see this <laughs> This drove me nuts. Yeah. So I had to let him know. But because it's LeBron James and all this now people think it's like, I, there's other cities that are just as whack as Cleveland. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jokey Noah on the OG show. So he's, it sounded like he was going to kind of defend Cleveland. I was like, no. No, it's whack. <laughs> oh my God, up, it's when amazing. When you grow up in Paris, uh, you know. <laughs> Did you guys ever, uh, it reminds me of Vernon Maxwell when he, Vernon Maxwell's Twitter is hilarious. His uh -huh. pinned tweet that said, I'd like to apologize, jazz fans that were offended by my tweets. If I knew you guys had internet in Utah, I would have never made those tweets. That's right. <laughs> so now shout out to Joe Keen. Now they got hockey in Utah. Visitors to the Brookfield Zoo will soon be able to say good eye to a couple of two year old koalas. For the first time in the zoo's 90-year history, two koalas, Brumby and Willem, will take up residency at the zoo. Now, we know that there is, uh, famously, Adam Studzinski hates the very idea of the existence of koalas. And we, there's, there was a famous rant in that regard. And I have to say that this, this seeing this story prompted me to do my own research. Oh, no. I don't trust the experts here. I don't trust, you know, what, what goes on in the social media space. I've well, got to didn't trust you my want, tirade. I've if got you to want do my an own expert, research. you can't ask a koala, and apparently. I, I, well, they're too busy eating poison and falling on their heads. I I am a, a born-again koala... Uh, and I don't, I don't want to say hater, because it's not really their fault, but... There's no reason for koalas. There's no reason. They 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 have and reading Stunt's just <laughs> nodding emphatically. I've been on here. this for a decade. You've been, you've been on this for a decade. They they don't they don't contribute anything. They eat poison on purpose. And because the eucalyptus that they eat is so low in, in nutrition 
their brains can't develop properly, so their skulls are mostly filled with cerebrospinal fluid and incredibly smooth cortexes that don't allow them to adapt any complex tasks. Not only that, they fall out of trees so regularly. They live in trees. And they fall out of their own home so regularly that the extra cushioning of their stupid brains has selected out. So the dumb ones are more likely to pass on their genes because they're protected from falling out of the trees because all the fluid in their heads that's keeping them stupid because they eat poison and have viruses and chlamydia. And by I the swear way, I know these people. Wait, koalas? <laughs> Wait. I thought you were talking about people. No, this is, I've never, they, they've evolved wrong. They, they, somehow they've evolved wrong to reward the smaller brains for their stupidity because it's presumed that they're going to fall on their heads because they can't stay in their own homes. We're still talking about bears and not people? They're not bears. I swear That's I think we're talking thing. about people. They're not yeah. bears. They, they didn't have anything to do with that. With what? But not being with They didn't classify. They didn't go, we of the koala contingent declare that we are bears. None of it's really their fault. They just suck. Actually, it's a good uh, example of evolution in general. Is it not? It has nothing to do with reason or your personality. It has to do with what genes you Survival. have that are least susceptible to fail. Right. And and, and they, they don't have any known predators because people the predators don't even bother being around them. And I swear I know these people. And they and they, they, they've, they've adapted for being dumb and eating poison. I swear I know these people. And this is why we shouldn't be saving them. Let them die. It should have happened hundreds of years ago. But when there was those fires in Australia, like, if they're getting any other animals, fine. Just let, it, let them take the koalas. All right, Thanos. But it sounds like they're going to be here no matter what, because they figured it out. Because they have no natural predators, because they smell. And not, only and they like smell, nutrition. not only do they smell, the males have glands on their chest that they use to make other things smell. Also people. Like, ugh. They're, they're all, and they're not they're Wait, not wait till Dan finds out about skunks. <laughs> but, but they're not cockroaches. But they're not cuddly either. The pair of their fur is is not soft. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's wiry and gross. And do people want to like, oh, show this adorable koala? Ugh. Yeah, it's the, those types of people are like the koalas. So let them have each other. <laughs> if only it were that simple. Studs was right. Don't ever say that again. Mike Florio is going to join us to talk all things NFL next. Bernstein, Holmes, Rahimi here with you until Cubs baseball on the score. We are Chicago's number one and most listened to sports station. We're live from Chicago, talking Chicago sports. Listen on your radio, your laptop, your mobile device through the Odyssey app. We were talking about um, a, a really good Bulls team earlier in the decade that did not win a title because Joakim Noah was honored last night. And every time we talk about a great team that didn't win at all, we think of the Buffalo wow. Bills. Well, Damn. but here's the thing. Wow. Hey, yeah. but, no, you have to. <laughs> no, you have to. You have to. So, but offer the perspective as a lifelong Bills fan, here we are decades later. You look back on that group. Did they underachieve? Did they achieve just right? Where do they sit in your sports heart? You know, listen, for a fan, I, I don't care how many people will, will say to me, and it's happened over time, people will go, Come on, man, you guys were losers, man. That must have been horrible. Hey, listen, as a fan, you want your team to win. You got a whole season. I mean, those four years, yeah, we didn't win that game at the end. And that was a heartbreak, especially the first one. Because, you know, Belichick was the defensive coordinator, and he, he figured something out that nobody else did. We only had the ball 19 minutes in that game. But, you know, you look back and you go through the season and you go through the playoffs. They brought us so much joy back then. Yeah, we didn't win that final game. But the following year, what was I going to say? Hey, I hope you guys don't win this year so we don't have to go through that again. No, you want to go through that again. You know, listen, there's no mistake about it. Hopefully, God willing, in the next couple of years, that tune changes. Super Bowl 25, 19 minutes and 27 seconds, time of possession. Bill Fickner off the top of his head. That's pretty remarkable, Bill. Yeah. 
Yep, there we go. There we go. You I brought it back to the worst life. sports moment of his life again? <laughs> well, <laughs> just, I, I was giving him the, the props. What's the matter with you? Giving him the props <laughs> for being the fan. No, no, no. I'm glad, you, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, this will be the last time I ever talk to you guys. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, Jim, Jim, <laughs> a pet that died or something, Bill? We can talk about your pet dying. Would that be, would that be easier? <sighs> no, no, no. It, it probably would. Um <laughs> I, hey, listen, listen, you know. We, we did want to talk to fan, you. What are you going to do? Hey, no, we're, we're, gonna, we're apparently going to keep bringing it up. Uh, like Speaks will keep bringing yeah. up the 90s bills. I'll keep bringing up Armageddon, <laughs> and we'll keep talking yeah, to you. Yeah, it's our hook. And most listened to sports station. 670 The Score is Chicago Sports. Chicago Sports is The Score. WSCR Chicago. WBMX HD2 Chicago. Always live on the free Odyssey app. The Score! This hour is brought to you by Menards. Save big money at Menards. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now is a man who's got a massive, massive brain. brain. Mike Florio. He used to be a lawyer, then he decided to take his talents to the internet. NBC Sports. I'm sorry I'm late, I was talking to Robert Kraft. That isn't the time for an airing of grievances. Pro football talk. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now, you're gonna hear about it. Mike Florio with Bernstein, Holmes, and Rahimi on Chicago Sports Radio, 670 The Score. Let's talk some NFL with Mike Florio on the Cirque Resort and Casino Hotline, CircaLasVegas.com. You can find Mike on Twitter at ProFootballTalk, Twitch.tv slash Chicago670, the score. 
Hey, Mike, what's going on? Hey, how are you? Mike, we're good, man. Thank you so much for joining us. We've been talking a little bit about the, the quarterback class and how there's always someone who rises because people get desperate. What's going on with Drake May, though? Well, what's happening with Drake May, and this is one of the realities of legalized betting on topics that are completely unrelated to performance on the field. Because there's always a possibility someone knows things and that inside information then gets misused for betting purposes. So DraftKings has taken May off the board as to any specific bets linking him to a team. But you can still bet on him going second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. He's the overwhelming favorite to go fifth, which implies the Chargers will trade down with someone. But you can't bet on the someone he may end up with. And the concern, as I understand it, is you get a lot of volatility in the market and the sports book becomes exposed if someone does have inside information and load up at favorable odds that he's going to go to a specific team. They just said, time out, no team-specific bets, although they still are taking action on the number, the slot that he'll go in. So it it's strange, but there has to be some reason that – any sports book would turn off the faucet of cash that otherwise flows in because the house always wins, except when they're afraid they're going to lose. And when they're afraid they're going to lose, that's when they that's when they shut off the cash. Draft coverage on the score is presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. With all of these mentions of the legal sports betting ramifications, what have been the shockwaves through the NFL with the announcement that the NBA, Adam Silver, has banned John Tay Porter permanently with no chance of reinstatement for the betting, the, the prop bet fixing, we'll call it what it is, that was going on. What does this mean for the NFL and whatever guardrails have to be in place there? Well, and apparently there was more than just betting on prop bets. I saw a report that he bet on the Raptors to lose at least once. So this is cardinal sin type stuff. That's what Adam Silver, the NBA commissioner, called it before this announcement came today. And look, the prop bets are problematic. The NCAA has called for all states with legalized betting to get rid of prop bets. A few states already have. The thing about the prop bet is, you know, one individual player, especially in football, how much can you affect the outcome of a game? Not a whole lot directly. But you can affect your own prop bets. If you're a running back and you've got yardage and reception and touchdown over-unders and you just are injured on the first drive and you can't continue, all the unders hit. So that's the problem with the prop bet. The other problem with the prop bet too, and I've seen this concern raised as it relates to college athletes, you get a bunch of guys who are constantly harangued and hassled because they're not hitting their overs. How dare you not hit the over? You're my basis for my bet. I need you to get 20.5 points or more. How dare you not do it? So I just think it's too individualized and it's too problematic and it's too tempting for guys to, you know, be involved in whatever scam might come up for them to make a little extra money by, you know, being injured or sick early in a game. Mike, a little bit of a different discussion when it comes to uh, my question, but it's uh, it's about the Bears. And they're being applauded today for hiring Ted Cruz as a special advisor to the president and CEO. And he's also the chief administrative officer. That was the title they gave. But Cruz has a positive reputation in the league. What do you know about him and, and what do you think this means for the team? Well, uh when you say Ted Cruz, I think of the senator from Texas. Not so, Ted Cruz, no. So not that I, Ted I Cruz. Will, Ted Cruz from the Chiefs? Yes. Is that who you're talking yes. about? Yes. Yes. Holy crap! Oh, good. You you that. like this? I I'm I'm stunned because Ted Cruz has been a longtime member of the PR staff with the Kansas City Chiefs, and he is a great guy. He is excellent, and you know we see this from time to time where someone from PR, by virtue of being in that job and in the proximity of things that happen in the football operation and the business side, and look, he's been right there with 
one of the great teams in the NFL the past five years. I, I think that that's great. I, I love Ted. I it's funny you say Ted Cruz, and I didn't I, I never thought of Ted Cruz as a football guy, but he could be, and he wouldn't be the first one to cross over from PR into doing special things. So I think that's great for the Bears. I love Ted. I had no idea. You, yeah, that's news to me, as Jerry Jones would say. Since- yeah, the, the official title special advisor, but I I'm sure I would think that he would have a hand in some sort of PR strategy for the team. Considering I think some all of the sorts changes, of stuff. advisor, you advise on all sorts of stuff. You advise on all sorts of stuff, just like Lloyd Braun to Mayor Dinkins, the big advisor. Mike, since we're kind of talking about Sorry, politics, Mike. what's up with your man, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers? <laughs> God, where can we, where can we start? I, I, uh, I don't know. And the podcast that he was on last week, where he had some all-time great, over-the-top conspiracy theory stuff and and the thing about rogers you know everything can't be a conspiracy theory it's it's impossible for everything to be something out of the x-files and that's not what it seems and there's lizard people or there's this or there's that it can't all be a conspiracy and his approach is i believe based upon everything i've ever heard him say is nothing is what it seems and there's always a conspiracy hiding behind it. And my experience is it's just too hard to hold a conspiracy together. It takes a high degree of confidence to hold a conspiracy together. And and I think that he just assumes everything is BS. And if he's right once or twice in his lifetime, then he can bump his chest and claim that he 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 was, you know, right all along. But there's some other stuff too. There's some stuff from a podcast a few months ago that that had gone largely overlooked about HIV being created by the government. I mean, just weird. He said created by, by Anthony Fauci. Yeah. We weird stuff. And, um, I, I hope he doesn't get involved in politics when he retires, but I think this whole thing with RFK jr. From a few weeks ago, the, the quid pro quo was it gave RFK's candidacy a little bit of a boost from a PR standpoint at a time when nobody was talking about it. And I also think it makes it less jarring when Rogers makes his inevitable pivot into politics, I just hope that it's with some fringe party and that his thoughts, if his thoughts ever become mainstream, I, I just say this, I hope I'm dead by then. If his thoughts ever become mainstream. But Mike, there is a practical question as well. And we can easily say, Oh, it's just Aaron Rodgers says silly things about lizard people and about governmental con- lab conspiracies. And I totally agree with you. I know you've invoked Hanlon's razor before, where it says never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. I think it's a a great thing to hold close in the way you think about the world. But in a locker room, I know Woody Johnson's the owner, but if he's really going to be the most important player on a professional football team and in a locker room, at what point does it matter if he's a complete nutter? Well, it should matter in New York. Don't we hear all the time about that? rough and tumble New York media. I mean, they had treated him with kid gloves from the moment he showed up until the moment his Achilles popped. He never got asked a tough question. For example, are you a 9-11 truther? Because at one point, Deshaun Kaiser said when he met Aaron Rodgers, it was the first thing he said to him. One of the first things, do you believe 9-11 actually happened? Well, you should go read up on that. So he's never been asked any tough questions. And he's the guy who, in his last interview with the press, his last media availability of the 2023 season, went off on this rant about how it has to be all about winning and only focused on winning. Mm -hmm. And we're only going to talk about winning. And it has to be everything about winning and winning and winning. And I know it's the offseason and he's on his own time. But what other quarterback is out there spewing this kind of crap that could create distractions and divisions and issues and something that would take away from this overwhelming and overarching desire to win. So I I, I just, I don't get it. And I I don't want to try to psychoanalyze the guy, but I mean, there's just some stuff there that I can't begin to comprehend. And I don't see how it helps the Jets in any way, shape or form. But can you imagine if somebody else said that in say a pre-draft interview? The consequence that would occur? Well, and you wonder how long he's been this open with his views and where it all came from and how it all started. On on that 
podcast he did most recently, he spent some time talking about when he was young, he had this intense fear of death because he thought Y2K was going to end the world. So maybe that was in some way the seeds of this, you know, constant mistrust of anything and everything that is under some official shield of governmental action or governmental policy. I don't know, but it it's just a hell of a way to live. If you're constantly, you know, there, there's some, there's a certain amount, what well, ignorance is bliss. There's a certain amount of comfort that comes from being gullible. You just live your life. If you're constantly looking for every single thing you encounter, I mean, I think I have a pretty good crap filter when someone's trying to feed me a line of BS. I don't assume everything is BS. I assume it is when there are certain things that make that filter activate and make the the you know the the lights start flashing in my brain that this might be BS. He just thinks everything is. It's just an exhausting way to live. Mike, how do you think Detroit's going to handle being the home of the draft? I think it'll be great. I think it'd be great. You know, this is the the discovery of plutonium by accident that happened a decade ago when the NFL, which had the draft every year forever at Radio City Music Hall, there was a conflict. So they said, well, the hell with you, Radio City Music Hall. We'll, we'll take it on the road. And they go to Chicago and it's great. They go to Philadelphia and it's even better. And now it's every year, every year, every year. And every city is eventually going to get its opportunity because it's, you know, at a time of the year where you don't have to worry about weather. And I think Detroit's going to be great. And the next one will be great. And the next one will be great. And th this is one of the reasons why the draft is never going away. As much as I don't like the concept of telling a 22-year-old professional you don't get to pick where you work you don't get to pick where you live you don't get to pick who you work for you're going to be drafted into this industry that has 32 distinct companies it's never going away because this thing that's happening next week is its own reality apart from football season and it's amazing it's the selling of hope and it's completely disconnected from the playing of games and it's that one massive thing that happens in the non-playing season that that can never change and will never change as far as the NFL's around in our sports consciousness. It's kind of cool too, because there are clearly going to be some cities that will never get a chance to host the Super Bowl, but they'll get a chance to host the draft. So it allows a big NFL event in cities where maybe an NFL event only would happen if your team is that good. Oh, absolutely. Pittsburgh, case in point. Every once in a while, there's noise about Pittsburgh trying to host a Super Bowl. They don't have the infrastructure to absorb the number of people that show up for Super Bowl week. Las and Vegas that field is trash, too. That infrastructure. What's that? And that field is trash. Well, that, that that's part of it, too. And you, you're running the risk of, of weather. And you know, they, they, they got very lucky with Super Bowl 48. They're just a day later or a day or two earlier, and they would have been dealing with snow. But uh, but yeah, you can host the draft and Pittsburgh will. They've put in an application to host it, I think, in 27 or 28. And my guess is they're going to get it. And every city eventually will host it. And that that takes three decades. And then you start it all over again. You could do Nashville, Tennessee. You could do Jacksonville. And I'm, I'm trying to remember some of the Super Bowl experience that we've had. And actually, they did Nashville, right? Isn't that why everyone oh, yeah, was really, the yeah, right, right, really right, right. upset? When we did the Super Bowl <laughs> and covered the Super Bowl in Detroit, a lot of people were having fun with the easy jokes about it and about the weather. I thought they did a great job. I really did. And, and I thought the idea of, of a Super Bowl there, people found sort of strange. But when the NFL gets involved, it's whatever they want to make it. Indianapolis was awesome, too. You know, it's part of the, it's part of the deal for giving public money to build a stadium as long as it's enclosed in one of these cold weather cities. You've never heard of Indianapolis being back in the rotation, but that that will continue. You'll have that new stadium. You get a Super Bowl. We'll carve it out one year. But the draft, every city at some point, it's coming, and and it's it's going to be a huge deal everywhere it goes. And I think it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Mike Florio, thank you. We'll talk next week. See you. Thanks, Mike. That's Mike Florio. We will turn our attention to the NBA next with Odyssey NBA insider Nick Friedel. Oh, now. Yes. Okay, not last hour. Correct. Oh, Time hmm. zones. I see. Reading. One of the texters referred to you as Layla Schlereth. East Coast time. Just trying to figure out. He's on mountain. Time do you know, zone. Do you know what happened? I got confused because I saw Florio's name and then Friedel on our rundown. And I was like, oh, 1125. No. This Dawn threw everything off, but it was worth it. 
I could listen to that woman talk for hours. Yeah, and if you want to go back and listen to that, you really should because we don't get opportunities to talk to legends all the time. Don so Staley. Use the Odyssey app to go back and use the rewind feature to enjoy all that she had. We can we can actually take out the Cylon interruptions on the the uh, rewind. Yeah, but we as found well. out that it wasn't the Cylon. No, the it, cheek. It was face. I hate that. Like, I I hold my phone up to my head, and I hate that. I can't ever listen to a flipping voicemail anymore because you can't hold the speaker up to your ear. It stops playing because you've held the speaker up to your ear. Make it make sense, engineers. That's Layla Rahimi in on the Bernstein and Holmes show here on this Wednesday. Nick Friedle next on The Score. Chicago football fans, tune in every weekday at 3 for Poles Position, where Parkins and Spiegel cover the latest on Ryan Poles' historic offseason decisions. Peter Schrager, he has them trading down from 9 with Malik Neighbors on. You guys have talked about this on the show many times in the last couple of months. And I can confirm that not many people have this piece of baseball memorabilia that you guys have talked about a lot uh, here and there over the last couple of months. There was a certain giveaway in Oakland. Come on! Yes! No way! I emailed the Oakland A's PR department and asked, do you guys happen to have any extra Tony Kemp poster day giveaways? And sure enough, a month later, they mailed it in. Get out of here. Let's go. Put that thing up. We're putting so, it right here, right, right, right? there. Yeah. Here is the official Tony Kemp poster day giveaway poster, poster for everyone watching on Twitch. Holy it is, crap. It is the official Tony Kemp poster that you guys have been marveling at. Yes. And was, uh, was promoted right behind home plate when the Cubs were playing in Oakland back in April. It is, and it's emblematic, real. And Tony Kemp is a terrific guy, a former Cub. Yeah, and a good player, good guy, adorable family. But the fact that that's the giveaway is emblematic of what is is what is going to be remembered as one of the worst teams in baseball history. There you go. Now Our guy official. Tony Kemp. Yep. Right here for you. Now all we need is the the next the, the next goal is to get him at some point in studio to sign it. Also, make sure you go to twitch.tv slash Chicago670 to score because what Connor O'Donnell is doing is a split screen, sometimes with Dan, sometimes with, well, it has to only be Dan, but it's split screen with Dan and the Tony Kemp poster instead of Lawrence. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. I think the Tony Kemp poster should always be on the screen on Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> it should just be always up I, there. I think that it should be like the Florio head. That's it. Yes, that's, exactly. that's the, Where it's our screensaver? Yeah, it should be bouncing up and around and people be like, oh when it almost makes it to the corner and then it doesn't quite make it to the corner. That's what it should be.
win or go home. That's our mentality. That's the mentality we have to have. Um, being at home, we're going to have our fans behind us. We got to just go out there and just take it every possession at a time. And like I said, not being afraid of the fact that it's win or go home, not being timid, but really just embracing it, embracing it, having fun, like putting it all out there. Everything you have, 48 minutes, collectively, together, on both ends of the floor, and then live the results. Ayo Desumu, we presume he's giving it a go at shoot-around, trying to see if he can sprint full-on with that bruised quad that has him missing the last four games. He's been limited in practice. A little video of him yesterday, but he has been the Trey Young stopper, and you'd love to have him do that while deploying Alex Caruso to try to stop somebody else. On the line now is Odyssey NBA insider Nick Friedel. Insider calls are brought to you by the all-new Hyundai 2024 Santa Fe, equipped for adventure. He's on Twitter, at Nick Friedel. He joins us on the Circa Resort and Casino Hotline, CircaLasVegas.com, Twitch TV, slash Chicago 670 to score. What's up, Nick? Oh, guys, it's Bulls, Hawks, and a play, and let's get excited. <laughs> Trying. Well, I get, knew you were going to pumped up. <laughs> I knew you were going to have that attitude. And I, I don't quite know how to classify all of this except for a couple of truths, Nick. Number one, players get hyped for tournaments. We see it. We see it happen all the time. I loved the play in games last year because I also get hyped for tournaments. But the other thing is part of the reason I think the NBA is doing this, maybe it's not for the Eastern Conference team so much given their records that got them in. But the West, you have so much talent. I think it's also why they, they decided to expand the postseason awards. It's because you have so much talent, you should acknowledge it somehow. And and last night was a great example of how cruel it could be. Layla, I'm with you, but it's, a, it's something that I feel even stronger about now that I am not day-to-day -day around the games the way I, I used to this year. When Steph and LeBron finally leave, I think the NBA is going to have a real problem because we can get hyped up to see the Lakers in a play-in. Hey, LeBron's into it. Zion was playing great before he got hurt right at the end there. And then we saw the Kings just dominate Steph and the Warriors. But I don't think a lot of people outside of the markets in which those teams exist are going to care nearly as much about a play-in if Steph and LeBron aren't involved. I mean, let's take Bulls Hawks. I don't even know how many people in Chicago are really that invested into what's going on. And certainly in Atlanta, I mean, they've been trying to fill that arena for years. Trey Young is not the guy that is going to help elevate them to some next level. But the point on a larger scale for the league is the play-in looks very good when you have your forward-facing stars that everybody's known for almost two decades at this point. The play-in play is not going to be as great down the line if you're looking at somebody like uh, the Utah Jazz uh, playing the Kings. People are going to go, ah, it's nice. And to your point, the players are going to get hyped up uh, a little bit, but is that going to draw in the casual fan who may not pick up basketball the same way? As someone who was around a lot of winning with Golden State, what was it like? What feelings do you have right now watching what's happened over the last two years and how it seemingly feels like that was the end of it last night? Lawrence, the truth is the team we saw last year uh, and, and the team that we saw last night, that's the team I thought I was leaving – three years ago when I went from San Francisco to Brooklyn to cover the Nets with KD and Harden and Kyrie because I didn't think the Warriors had it in them in any way to go and win that bonus title the way they did a few years ago when Steph went crazy and and he beat the Celtics in the finals. Andrew Wiggins was playing the best basketball of his career. I say all that in context because I know a lot of people are now saying, ah, it's over for the Warriors. I, I don't see it happening for them. I actually think that they still have a chance and a chance maybe not to get to uh, a finals again, but a chance to be really, really good still because Steph is still at that level. And we know that he takes care of his body. He's going to still have a year, maybe two left at close to the level he's at. So if you have Steph 
and you have Draymond. We'll see what happens with Clay. I would think that Wiggins would be one of the first guys that they're looking to move, depending on what they can get back. I don't think the window has closed on the Warriors as a team that you're really going to focus on. I just don't believe that they're going to reach back up to the top. And when you miss on James Wiseman as the number two pick, that takes years for teams to get over. And I think they're just starting to feel that now. I laughed last night when I saw the screenshot of the TNT graphic upcoming national TV schedule. And there's LeBron on one side and the two box on the left is what they put as tomorrow on ESPN. They've got the seven o'clock game and there you see Joel Embiid and the nine thirty game. And there's Trey young and Zach Levine. They put a picture of Zach Levine <laughs> up as representing the bulls. And you talk about, you the, won't be playing. You talk about the relative difference in these play-ins and you talk about who the forward facing stars are like, how can that happen? Dan, what's worse is not only did they do it in the beginning, I guess in the first half, I saw uh, Will Gottlieb had tweeted out the, the graphic that you're describing. There's like a minute left in Lakers Pelicans, and here comes Zach Levine again. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, there isn't one person who saw this in the truck who could throw a DeMar DeRozan picture up there. I mean, really? There's nobody else that you could put up as as that star of the Bulls? But to me, on top of, ha-ha, you know, it was a, a laughable mistake, it's another reminder of, of truly how far away the Bulls are. Because you cannot be a serious franchise with a team that is – uh, discussing, ah, we can we can get right back up there and, and we can make a push in the East uh, with no face star that people care about night to night. And it was my biggest knock on uh, acquiring Levine in the first place, then re-signing him, then re-signing him again to this ridiculous max deal that they, they have him on. It's why I laugh when people say, oh, you've got to sign – Resigned to Rosen for what? <laughs> like you're I, I in wouldn't. the nine ten game. Like what difference is Demar Derozan going to make on a team that's going nowhere already? You desperately need to find a star and or draft a star and develop them. The Bulls haven't done that. They haven't been able to do that for years. There are all kinds of reasons why they are where they're at. But if you're the Chicago Bulls, you should always have that name brand star that you can count on. And when I saw that graphic that you mentioned, that's all I kept thinking. They still don't even have that guy that they can start to build around. Well, Nick, you bring up other points. To me, the the huge direction symbol of how you knew this team was going to go was when Vooch got resigned because everything revolves around him. And then you see for the third year in a row, the Bulls didn't make a trade at the deadline. And they're the only team three years running that hasn't done that. When you saw that, what did you think? Because we were talking to you then at the time, but I know you you made an observation and probably had an opinion because they seem very confident in this group being this group. Well, it's laughable. I mean, the Bulls right now within the NBA are Ill irrelevant. They are completely irrelevant. I wouldn't go as far to say... They're a joke because uh, there are plenty of teams that would like to have uh, the, the big playoff gate that I know Bulls fans have laughed about going into tonight. But, I mean, that's another problem. You've got a, a game that a lot of fans just don't even care about. As of a few days ago, I know that game wasn't sold out. I figured they'd be comping a lot more tickets to get butts in the seats. But the reality is when you make decisions – that people aren't that excited about to begin with, and then you're running back the same players to keep that team intact, you get what you get. And the Bulls, for years now, have always made these decisions where they're just good enough to get on the same level where they're at. And that's the part that just stuns me, having covered that team from so long and now watching it from more of a distance. This is what they wanted to avoid. They didn't want to be the team that was right there in the middle and just stuck. And guess what? <laughs> they are completely stuck. I mean, I, I I laugh when people say, "Oh, well, if you just if you just fired Karnasovas and Eversley, 
and you bring in somebody else. I've heard Bob Myers' name popped out from some of the fan base. Bob Myers isn't a miracle worker. I mean, look at this team. Look at the contracts that are on the books. Look at the draft decisions that have been made. They are years away from getting back to a point where they are respectable and pushing towards something in the Eastern Conference. They're just poorly constructed. And when that happens and you allow it to fester, and that's why if you're a Bulls fan, I'd be so angry at Mike Reinsdorf and the decisions that led to this point because you're allowing mediocrity to reign. And this team is stuck in the middle of mediocrity and they're going nowhere very fast and watching the same product and the same result year after year is like watching a bad rerun of Groundhog Day. Insider calls are brought to you by the all-new Hyundai 2024 Santa Fe, equipped for adventure with capable features like available H-Track all-wheel drive and standard third-row seating. We're talking with Nick Ferdell, Odyssey NBA insider. You know, the other aspect of this that you didn't even mention, the more I'm looking at this year's draft and the more I'm hearing people talk about it, it kind of sucks. And you can take kind out of that sentence. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really bad. When, when you start talking to the people that cover the draft and the people that are not only covering the college game, but as we know, there's so many prospects, whether it's internationally or, or coming from these different leagues that have popped up over the last few years, it's awful. So to think that you're going to get some sort of prospect that's going to come in and, and, and make a big difference right away, that's not going to happen. What you have to hope is that you you pick up a, a prospect or two and you're able to develop them over the next few years. But any Bulls fan listening to that sentence is going to sit there and shake their head and laugh. I mean, that is where the Bulls have had uh, their their biggest issues recently. You 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 can get all the picks you want and you can draft whomever you'd like. But if you're not getting them to a point where they're feeling comfortable in your system and they're providing the dividends that you'd like to see, it doesn't really matter. And and that's, of course, on the coaching staff, uh, but even more certainly with the Bulls in this recent iteration, that's on the front office. You, you're not taking the right guys, and those guys aren't becoming the players that you need. And you back a few years, I mean, Markkanen is the perfect example. The Bulls thought he was the guy. They were committed to him. They believed in him. They couldn't get it to work in Chicago. He goes to Cleveland, then he goes to Utah. Now he's an all-star. I mean, there are plenty of examples of of what's gone on. You look at uh, Wagner in, in Orlando. I mean, they could have had him. He looks like he's going to be a hell of a player, but they wanted a veteran in Vucevic. I, that was not the right move. <laughs> and, Dan, this goes back to what we were just saying. Wasn't the right move to re-sign him either. So it's not hard to figure out where they're at because of the choices that they made. But to the point about the draft, I, I don't think, again, the casual NBA fans are are understanding just how bad it is supposed to be in the next couple months here. This is an awful, awful draft. And there are not a lot of ready-made prospects available. Nick, as always, man, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. You got it, guys. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Nick. That was Odyssey NBA insider Nick Friedel. Insider calls are brought to you by the all-new Hyundai 2024 Santa Fe, equipped for adventure. I don't know what's happening outside. Lawrence looked, and I'm scared, and I Yeah, you both walk. looked, and then I thought I'm missing something, and I thought not dead guy was out there. No, again. I just keep watching for rain, but... There is no just rain windy. in the forecast. Just windy. Oh, yeah. There's a, a there's enough of a window, I guess, to decide on a White Sox doubleheader today. They probably should have played yesterday. No, because there were oh. a bunch of bands coming through. It yeah, did, but, but it didn't. Okay, here's a funny story is that I was didn't. In, I was intending on doing some yard work yesterday. I was intending yard. to be, and weeding and you know, getting ready to plant the basil and some stuff like that. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. And then I get home and, and I took a, an hour long nap and then it's raining. I'm like, damn it. Now it throws everything off and I can't do the stuff I want to do. And I just when I got the alert that the White Sox game was canceled, the sun came out. Yes. And I looked at the radar. I got a I, rainbow yesterday. I looked at the radar and I said, oh, what does it mean? Rainbow. And I said, this this might work out just fine. 
Yeah, I was I was driving around at seven there o'clock, was and I was like, "Oh, there!" And I did. They could have played. I went yeah. outside between like six thirty and seven fifteen. I did the yard work I needed to do, and everything was fine. And then it started raining. But later. maybe they looked at it and said, "Field condition, There's perhaps." A- no, because that feels There's fine. And there coming. was and there wasn't a lot of water. Maybe like, they that's ran out the of milkshakes. Maybe they looked at it and said. Percentage wise, there's a better chance of us winning a game in the doubleheader than it, it's true. It, it, I and know Kansas it is. City's like it's dead. true. It, it is because most doubleheaders are split. Right. Oh, also, uh, guys, uh, did you see the Cubs lineup? No, I saw Master Bonies and left. Yeah, that that was my thought. Was that's interesting. Interesting. Ian Happ is DH. Meaning... It's, it's the decision that was made. Maybe he just needed a day off his feet. Like that's that's usually how I look at DH. Like. Day game after a night game that went long, travel day, get off your feet and just hit four So times. you have Master Boney and Talkman as your corner outfielder? Yeah, I just wish. Talkman's been pretty good out oh, there I, and right. Yeah, yeah it I, I, it's just the combination that cracks me up. Well, it's just that Master Boney's not a major league player. That's the problem I have, is that he's not good. But I guess you got to play, guys. Today, the Cubs finished their road trip against the Diamondbacks. Pre-game coverage, 205. First pitch, 240. Then later, the Bulls take on the Hawks at United Center in the NBA play-in tournament. You know you're going to like it and watch it. Of course I'm going to watch it. Okay, we already got plans. to. we got a whole setup, everything. Pre-game coverage begins at 815, tip-off 830. The only local broadcast of the game can be heard on 670 The Score and in Chicagoland on the free odyssey app when we come back you will be amazed to hear the number of sets of eyes that were on the wnba draft and then the response that some people had when it was publicized what wnba players actually make there were people who were new to all of this excitement and thinking wait (gasps) what that can't be right that's missing a zero no it's uh, it's not we'll discuss next on the score the score is Chicago sports. Chicago sports is the score. Thanks for keeping us the number one and most listened to sports station in Chicago. Listen on your radio, laptop, mobile device through the Odyssey app, A-U-D-A-C-Y. Or tell your smart speaker to play 670 The Score. We're live and we're local. 670 The Score. Always live on the free Odyssey app. This segment is sponsored by... Then I talked to Mike Talkman. Who I, was oh. ex- I was excited to talk to Mike. Well, J.D., I think you nicknamed him the Palatine Pounder. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, well, so that's exciting. So then you talked to, to Mike Talkman, the Palatine you, Pounder. On the way in, on the way into the interview, I'm thinking, man, I'm so psyched for this. Yeah. Palatine's own. I wonder if he was a scorehead. I, I, I wonder if he likes the Pounder. Interesting he, career. Yeah, a lot of things to talk about with him. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, okay. Some time in New York with the Yankees. Does he think of Top Golf? <laughs> exactly. Where should the Bears go? You know, who's your favorite score host and why isn't it me? Just yeah. like all kinds of stuff. Quarter was, draft. Yeah, <laughs> super excited. I got Southport round one. Oh, yeah. Nice job. <laughs> yep. Nice value. Then I made the decision mm-hmm. to lead with the Pounder. Okay. I would have done the same. Right. Get the man's thought. You got He's got a nickname. You gotta break. warm them up first, Speaks. Everyone knows that. You gotta just a little bit of, you I know, don't know, rub it around. Break and... the ice. Yeah, I'm like loosen them up first. Yeah, yeah. Lo- I, loosen them up. Also, my guy Sean Sears is like, you know, hustling, thinking about an open because we weren't sure we were gonna get him. It's like, oh yeah, we get the Palatine Pounder. It's oh, perfect. Man, you never go in first with the Pounder. Oh, so you pl- you played it for him? Did he Boy, hear man. it? I, I think I think Tanny grabbed it. Okay. And Mike Talkman, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Doing well. Thanks for having me. You got it. Are you okay with the Palatine Pounder? Have you heard that? Are you all right with that as a possible nickname? That's from Jim Deshays. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know about that one. But, uh... I know. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You're not necessarily a pounder as a hitter, but it's just, it's alliteration, right? What I didn't know yes. is if other people in Palatine would, you, would be okay with you being the official pounder of Palatine. Like, there's probably somebody else. Who, who might yeah, work. yeah. There's, there's probably someone else that, that that's heard that one before. It's not bad though. Not, not bad, dude. That is not your fault. That's, that's uh, he hated it. That is not your fault. You don't think so? He did not come to play. No. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, I asked him um, what it was like playing in Japan last year. He played in Korea last year. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> We just re air this entire thing at five o'clock.
for Chicago Sports Talk on 670 The Score and 670thescore.com in Odyssey Station. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA Draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. That's a shock. Who saw that coming? So we'll see if the WNBA can invest, if individual teams can invest, and if at some point these shockingly low salaries will be at the point where actual livings can be made without, I don't know, having to go to Russia to supplement one's income, for example. There it is. That's why... I'm so surprised by this. Do you think that players would go play in other leagues in their off seasons when they're supposed to be resting because they want to? I mean, I'm sure there's probably a couple that are like, oh, well, this is a fun experience and I get to live in Spain. Like, for example, Caribbean League, you know, in baseball, but But winter leagues. But in this case? But in Russia, and part of the draw to Russia is how much money they pay. Like it's it's not just an extra paycheck that's similar. Brittany Griner got offered a ton of money to go over to Russia and play. You have to pick your spots on where you're gonna go, but you can live an awesome life playing overseas in conjunction with playing in the WNBA. But as Layla says, for those athletes that don't want to do that. Here's hoping that the growth of women's basketball overall allows for there to be higher salaries and they can take advantage of that. And and sure, it's I mean, we we do have to look at it like the WNBA season is only what, two and a half months. So if you look at it from that perspective, you go, well, making seventy five thousand dollars in a couple of months is not terrible. But compared to other sports, the gap is so wide that maybe what we'll see is a, a a lifting a high tide lifting all boats as far as salary goes. Not well, to mention people- that you incur risk in some of these overseas contracts, just like the men do, but more so the women who can get preyed on yes. by fly by night ownerships, by corrupt Russian ownerships, and you've got Putin connected oligarchs. Well, well, I would say probably. I, I would imagine that there's probably a State Department edict now saying don't go there. Right, well now, they, but even even in countries outside of well, Russia, like the Turkish league, sure, there are you know, there, there are all kinds of leagues where you. That's not you, exactly a stability filled place. No, you cash your check. Your check comes, you cash it. If this is not a, a, a country whose economy is run in quite the same way or regulated, but, in but quite if the you're same playing in a women's league in France or Spain or Italy or Argentina, like there, there's still money to be had. I imagine if, if Camila Cardoso wanted to go home and play in Brazil, that she would get broke off a piece going home. Russia for sure should be off of everybody's list. Well, and we bring this up because of not just the salaries, but also what is the proven way to increase player salary? It is a TV contract. It's TV rights. For everybody who's like, oh, if you like women's basketball, that's so much. Why don't you go to the games, buy tickets? People buy tickets. People go to the games. The attendance is not the major driver of player salary. You're seeing that with the ratings. And we saw it with the ratings for the WNBA draft. The NFL got 6 million viewers for their draft last year. The NBA had 3.74. A lot of people speculate it's going to be worse this year because of what we just talked about with Nick Friedel. It's not as good of a draft. The WNBA had 2.5 million. There's a reason I asked Don Staley about the importance of investing in your players and your coaches. The first salary that Caitlin Clark is going to make, you probably know the number. Do you know what? Do you know it's what it is? 73-something? 76000 change. $76,000. And we always talk about, well, these, these athletes make too much money. And I would say, look, no, they don't. They're the best in the world at what they do. And they and should it, be grateful. There's a, there's a premium paid when you are one of the best in the world at what you do. And that goes the same for an eye surgeon or for an actor or for a singer or a dancer. 
And then you look. I, I just did a Google search for jobs that pay seventy six thousand dollars. You're talking about Caitlin Clark, who is one of the best in the world, okay, at what she does, and she makes the same as this job. For example, a CDLA truck driver would earn that working in Faison, North Carolina, a gutter cleaning tech in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm not going to name the company, but would be able to earn that. And the disparity, working year round, though, and work sure working year round, and still working in the top league for what you do to be one of the best in the world at what you do. There's there's a massive discrepancy. So maybe we will see. That's what's going to be interesting because I do think that Caitlin Clark is going to bring numbers, like like Dawn was talking about. She's going to bring numbers. Obviously, the arenas are going to be filled every time that she plays. Home or away. Now it's a matter of can that momentum carry into the summer? Will people choose to watch a couple more Sky games this year than they did last year? Or maybe even go to a couple of Sky games because they're interested in Camila Cardoso and Angel Reese. The television contract is huge. And if they can sustain a larger number of view viewership, then they're going to get more money. It's going to be revenue shared and salaries will hopefully go up. That's the type of growth that Dawn's talking about, that Caitlin Clark's talking about, that anyone who is invested, whether we mean figuratively or literally, in the WNBA is hoping happens so that there isn't this rush to, I've got to go overseas just to kind of make ends meet. And then you put, in, in the case of Russia and maybe China, like you're putting yourself in, you're taking a risk that you don't necessarily have to take. You should want to play in another league because it's a cool experience. Like guys who play winter ball, guys, who, guys baseball players, like yeah, I'm going to go home either to my home country or I'm going to go with a buddy and experience, go play in the Dominican Republic. Yeah, that is way like it's supposed to be fun. And there's a bunch of international players that got drafted in the W this year that have opportunities to whether it's, it's go back home or wherever and go play. It should be a, a globally celebrated thing. And if you could go make your money in, in Costa Rica or wherever, go make it. And, and frankly, the reason we're bringing this up is because we are used to talking about hundreds of million dollar contracts, except the White Sox. We are used to talking about max deals for players. We consume it the same. We take it seriously in the same way. And that's where the disconnect, I think, really shows. Well, the, the, also, the, the, the part is that I found really interesting is that there were so many new people involved in this that when they got to the breakdown, I saw a breakdown on, on Instagram yesterday where this one was like, wait, she's going to make how much? And people don't know because they haven't been following. So it was a rude awakening for them. It was a... In some cases, like a call to action. And well, why is there this injustice? Well, then the economic explainers come out and say, well, they don't make money and not enough people are interested and you don't know economics. And a lot of it is it, it's a, a leading indicator, not a lagging indicator. And that's why what my what I've been pounding on this whole thing is the amount of money that needs to be invested because of the money to be made. And they've got to do that. You, it, the chance is here to strike. And, and without that understanding, without the, the infrastructure and the, the public relations, the, the, the fan recruiting to explain to them what's going on right now in the basketball culture, the overlap between WNBA and NBA, what's going on with apparel and shoes and everything, tell people. Let people, like, the, the, everybody is waiting at the doorstep for the first time in a long time. Me included. I never liked watching women's basketball until I started understanding it a little better and appreciating it and, and being able to, to calibrate what my expectations were. It's also about corporate money, too. Let's face it. It's corporate money. It's sponsoring the leagues. It's But your kids, your kids care about Caitlin Clark. Absolutely. And, and they don't and, and necessarily, and, they're, and they're not necessarily watching baseball. I never seen my 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 wife sit down and sit in front of the TV and and scream at the TV for a whole pro basket or a whole college basketball. Have game. you seen her scream about a Billy Donovan press conference? Because that, that's mean, what I, we're going to do next. I that was just not. me here on the score. 
Mully and Haw, mornings on Sports Radio 670, The Score. Take them with you wherever you go on the free Odyssey app. It is funny, and it's so absurd. Oh. Where's the fly swatter? Miss something on the show? Use the rewind feature within the Odyssey app, or subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you both. I start work at 5.30 in the morning, and you guys are always there to entertain me throughout my morning. Mully and Haw, mornings 5.30 to 10, always live on the free Odyssey app. This segment is sponsored by Champion Roofing. When it comes to roofing, trust Champion Roofing, your go-to experts for quality roofs. The right path to what? (laughs) And if so, the stated goal of this season has moved again. It started out when he sat down with media before the season. It was improve on last year's performance. And that meant win a playoff series. And then it crept, and it crept, and it crept, and it kept on creeping on until it ended up, well, the play-in is kind of like the playoffs, and we got into that. Did I hear the goal was to be a tough out? Like, they're going to hang a banner? The 22-23 Chicago Bulls, the first game of the 23-24 season. They're going to stand there, and they're going to pull that imaginary rope, and up's going to go that banner. And it's going to say, tough out. (laughs) My ass. It should say, my ass. (laughs) Now that's better. That would be fun. You're reminding me of when the Capitals, before they eventually broke through and won, had a President's Trophy banner that they raised one year. The goalposts you, often I, I don't want to hear it. You put away those six trophies and get it off your letterhead. Uh-huh. And I've said this multiple times for this team. If you want to, if you want to have those gleaming Larry O'Brien trophies, act like they matter. And I know there's going to be all kinds of ways to be successful in the NBA. There's going to be in-season tournaments, and there's going to be... But but at least for now, in the world in which we live, you owe it to us. Not the blandishments, not the platitudes, not how competitive you were after you went into the buyout market to get a 34-year-old guard who can't shoot. (laughs) Show me what the plan is to be relevant. I turned on my TV this weekend, and I saw kick-ass basketball. I saw hellacious competition. Are you you kidding? I I saw star players being like, all right, this matters now. Watch this.
Chicago sports. Chicago sports is the score. WSCR Chicago. WBMX HD2 Chicago. Always live on the free Odyssey app. The score. This hour is brought to you by Jewel Osco. Check the For You app for more deals. Different way of eating. You know, like I had to I had to work to get here. There's certain things that if I was seven foot and could shoot threes and shoot turn turnarounds and play off the dribble, score 30 a night for 15 years. I would do that, and I probably wouldn't be as good at defense. Um, that's probably just the, the, the reality of it. But for me, you know, it's it's a different path. It was a different way of me to figure out how to get in the league. And for me to get on the court in the beginning, I had to guard. I had to use my four to eight minutes a night and turn that into 10 to 12 and then turn that into 20 and that turned into, you know, having a really good couple of years here in Chicago. So uh, I think for me, it's just about the path and, and just facing reality of what I was given with. And, and you know, obviously I've worked to become somewhat of a threat on the offensive end, but the defensive end is where I kind of had to find my niche to get into the league. He did, man. Alex Caruso, he was asking, uh, Sam Smith, rather, was asking Caruso that question. You can tell Sam's cooking up an Alex Caruso feature, and I like where his head was at because Sam Smith just facilitates conversation, and there was a lot of that going on at Bulls practice yesterday. I love hearing Caruso talk about what he did to have to stay employed in the NBA. What did he have to do? Well, he talks about it there a little mm-hmm. bit. But also just, if you're not going to have the elite 1% of talent in the NBA, then you're going to have to figure out how to make a living. And, and he's done that with uh, with working on his defense and doing the things that a lot of people don't want to do. And getting way better at his three-point shot. Yeah, and he was practicing that, I, I would say, for at least 15 minutes from what we saw it, at yesterday, and I know he's he's probably worked on it even more than that in practice all day yesterday, but that was definitely something that he was specifically repeating over and over yesterday at practice. What else did you see while you were there? Well, we know Billy Donovan loves to talk. So do we. That's why we're on from 10 to 2. Yep. On the score. But Middays. The thing is, I think there's not a lot of places for, for Billy's observations that breathe, except here. You know, TV pre and post game show, you only get half an hour. Radio pre and post game show can be quick. You want to take calls. And in various column inches formats like newspaper or the athletic, maybe you've got a certain amount of words you have to stick to. But we have time for when Billy Donovan wants to talk about things like supporting Dan's theories about clutch statistics. Some of that, you know to me gets gets a little bit misleading you know in some ways because you, you think about sacramento you're down by 22 points and you're fighting your way back to get into the game right well you have to have that plus minus margin to overcome that you know we've had some situations where we've come back from pretty big deficits um but i, I get what you're saying like it's it's within that range but if you have a possession it's a five point game and then someone makes a three and it turns to eight well that possession doesn't count so you're just looking at the possessions that are there, and sometimes those possessions aren't always consecutive, you know, over the five or six minutes. Um, I think DeMar has been really, really good closing games, quite honestly. You know, I think that's been good. I think that I feel like we've generated some good shots, and I think Kobe and the emergence of Kobe and Io in some of those situations, even Gooch. Uh, you know, Alex made a big three against Toronto early in the year. But we've had other guys other than DeMar, and I think we've made some pretty – key shots in, in crucial situations. Uh, I think we've been able to get some stops. You know, that, that's, that always helps when you can get some stops um, and not foul and give up offensive rebounds. Um, I mean, I think it was, we tried to make it a point of emphasis this year because I think that the year before last, we were pretty good at it. And last year, we weren't quite as good. You know, we really had so many games. I think it was 19 games where it was either overtime, last minute, or, or last possession, you know, that we lost of, of, of all those games. So I think there's something we tried to focus on and be better at. But sometimes you can be better in those situations. And there, there are margins of um, do you get breaks? You know, like we, I think last year we ended up beating New York. We were dead in the water. and. Brunson and Julius Randle just forced consecutive free throws, right? Like that's luck that works out your way. You know, 0.5 seconds, they throw it up to, uh, you know, Griffin in Atlanta, 360 turns and throws it in with 0.5. Like, you know, that's, you can't sit there and say like that's, you know, you're necessarily always, it was a great play by him, but sometimes things, you know, just don't go your way in those moments. I mean, being up by, you know, Vooch's, 
against Orlando last year. I think we're up by uh, two. Get a chance to go up four. Miss both free throws. Suggs comes down and wants the three at the buzzer, and we lose. You know, so those things happen. Some of that stuff's kind of gone happen positively for us, where we've made some of those plays. Uh, and I think the guys, to be honest, with you, I feel like they've done a good job executing in those moments on both ends of the floor. To their credit, I knew you'd love it. He's talking about tonight's game when he's when he's talking about how the margin for error is slim. We've got to get some stops and, and not allow offensive rebounds in critical situations. He's talking specific. I mean, he, I know he wasn't, but I can I can infer what is not being implied. That sounds like my notes for tonight. I mean, he did also say they were bad at those games last year, which we knew. We knew that, and he said we made it a point to work on. <laughs> close games and they played 11 overtime games in the regular season. So I feel like that part of it was valid. But when he talks about how you get into a, a clutch situation, I knew you would appreciate his answer, Dan. I, I just know that when I'm listening to the game and I hear that, I just often will roll my eyes because of everything that Billy's saying. Like, yeah, I, it, it, I don't think that it proves anything. And if anything, it proves that, that if you are searching for clutch, like if you're grabbing for it and you're trying to look at, at the Bulls and say, well, they're, they're a clutch team, it doesn't even prove that. I think it does at times when they say, we want to win close games that we lost last year. We need better plays drawn up to free up our better shooters. But, like, I but feel they that. haven't won them. Right. And, and if, they, if, if they simply made more three-pointers – they wouldn't be in those situations. They're not like to me. I don't know. Like it's, it's always hard to define. And the NBA is trying to give you a definition of clutch. It's it's just that when when I looked at their record, I can look at their record and go, oh, you guys are not clutch, right? And they're not. I mean, we've been hoping they would get to five hundred all season too, and that didn't happen. I also did some research on the narrative because we noticed it was around the middle of the season when we began hearing about the idea of clutch games. And my first thought was, okay, this is the team building out a talking point, trying to come up with something they can put high no, in their but notes. They weren't, but they weren't building it out. Like it was discussed last year where they were struggling. But he, and so I asked, it, it wasn't the team. It has not been team driven. It, this has been broadcast driven. And it's not just broadcast. But it's, it's been the, primarily it's the but it's primarily through the broadcast that has leaned on the clutch thing. I thought it was top down. And I thought, well, this is the broadcast simply responding to the team like, hey, we're pushing this, you know, make sure you mention this. And it ha it has not been from a team level. I could have told you that. I thought I did. But I'm just saying when it comes it's just as a measurement. And in the NBA, they love to find measurements for things that we would like to explain with a pattern. And last year is when we start talking about this, because the year before, you know, DeMar was on that incredible run. At one point, the Bulls were in first place in the East. Everything was wonderful. And then we saw them deteriorate in these late game close situations. Or was that two years ago? Two years ago, they won them because yeah. DeMar made the shots. And the Billy year before, but I'm saying the year before. It was two years ago, and Billy said it. But I'm Remember, saying, he said that too. Billy said we, got a, he said we got a lot of luck in, in a lot of these wins. I was saying the year before, the year they started talking about losing in clutch situations. The Bulls were losing. There was a measurement there that actually made sense. They were the least clutch team in the NBA. But there's a way to apply it that makes logical sense, and that's what Billy was talking about. This year, they made it a point of focus, but it was really more about winning in the games that they know they should win. Like last year, you remember they lost off of that baseline set that just wasn't covered defensively. Those are the things that shouldn't happen. Right. But to me, it's not a it's not a great measurement because of the stuff that Billy was saying. Right. That you can. It's silly. That if you were more clutch, you wouldn't play yourself into clutch situations where you're up. So like if you're a more clutch Team, then when you are up 20 points, then you're supposed to step on the other team. And rest your starters. There, That's the real concern. And if I had had more time at practice, I would have asked about, to a guy like Alex Caruso, like, are, are you okay? Like, you've been playing no, a lot of minutes. he's not okay. He's very far from okay. He's in horrible pain. 
Watch him. He's not Marcellus Wallace. He's well. I'm not saying that's what happened. I, I Isn't that what he said? I'm very far from being okay. <laughs> yes, but I'm not implying. <laughs> <not, laughs> I'm not implying <laughs> that's what happened to <laughs> Alex Caruso. <laughs> but he's the, the guy's beat up every single night, and he's questionable for the moment the All Star break hits. He's questionable for the rest of the year. Yeah. he's on fumes. His California privileges the have whole, been revoked. The whole team is on fumes. I will say this. I talked earlier about Sam cooking up a uh, Alex Caruso feature, and we did just talk about how Alex basically gets in where he fits in. Shout out to Sam Cook. <laughs> I say, is he, uh, he's dead. Let no, we're not doing this. We're, their work is alive. Whoa. The Wait. work is alive. No, Sam, Sam, Sam's been dead for like fifty years. I know, but the work wasn't there. Wasn't there some stuff too? Sam Cook slept with somebody's uh-huh. wife. Yeah, or... yeah. There were, it, it was Marvin Gaye that was killed by his own dad, right? See, this is why I wanted to keep it. About I, but the there work was being there was alive, something. Guys. Yes, I don't know exactly what it is, but you're right about Sam Cook. Point being, Sam Smith was cooking oh, up that, a feature. That's what it is. Bobby Womack wrote a song, Layla, called "I Wish He Didn't Trust Me So Much." Oh, what the hell? That's like that new Spooky Robinson album. No, it's Mm-mm. worse. Mm-mm. Descriptive so, titles so, eating the things you don't need to know about. So Bobby Womack was sleeping with Sam Cook's wife. It's up. And then wrote the song. I, I w- wish he didn't. That's messed but, up. But That's you betrayal. know, S- Sam Cook wasn't wasn't no punk. And so at I want to say at the funeral, if I'm I'm remembering all this is like rushing back. After the funeral, Bobby Womack got his ass whooped by Sam Cook's people because of that song. It's messed up. Just the saying. song was m- more of a betrayal than the the act. Sam Cooke was shot and killed by Bertha Franklin, who the manager of a motel, who said she shot him in self-defense. And the police record states she shot Cooke. Franklin said he banged on the door of her office shouting, where's the girl? Whoa. In reference to Elisa Boyer, a woman who'd accompanied him to the motel and who called the police from a telephone booth. And then an enraged cook forced the way into her office, naked except for one shoe and a sport jacket, and he grabbed her and she shot him. You guys wanted to talk about this instead of actual practical things for a playing game tonight? I just wanted to get to the bottom of this. You should hear the song, though. I wish Is it you as didn't good trust as- me so much. Like, <laughs> it's... And you talk about... I bought you things you couldn't even pronounce. Yeah, Orange Juice Jones. <laughs> the, you talk about beef. Like this stuff that's going on with with Drake and J Cole and Kendrick Lamar, and you were talking about beef. This dude wrote a whole song about you sleeping with this guy's wife. Why, why act guilty? Why broadcast that? Oh, that's right. And then, like, I want to say, then Bobby ended up dating Sam Cooke's daughter. What? Oh. It's so gross, guys. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Don't know much about his Well, story. we don't have time for the other piece of audio that I yeah, thought we was do. pretty compelling. No? no, it's four minutes. Damn it. That's Sorry. why I was trying to get us back on topic, but neither this one of you guys is, cares. This is interesting stuff, though. No, because I used to, because this. No, but, Dan's just trying to get his $5 out of the mythical death jar. Well, I he, knew he was dead. I don't get $5 back. Yeah, he, he killed Ron Jeremy. <laughs> name, somebody, name somebody you know is dead so you get $5 out of the mythical Until death the jar. Hun. I can't right? <laughs> I don't, I don't get to return the money in the, in the wrong, the wrongful death jar. Egyptian pharaohs, Tut, all of them Tut died at like fifteen, right? I think. Why don't we 13. talk some sky? Let's yes. let's get some answers to some questions about some things. Their general manager, Jeff Pagliaca, will join us next on the score. Cubs fans, every week, The Score offers you exclusive access into the Cubs dugout with an all-star lineup featuring Cubs manager Craig Council every other Thursday with Parkinson Spiegel. Do we have disagreements? Yeah, we, we absolutely have and should. Ian Happ joins Bernstein and Holmes every Tuesday at 1125. My ability to touch the high heater and foul it off is something that has let me get deeper into counts. And Nico Horner talks Cubs every Tuesday at 230 with is there a scenario where Jimmy turns into this guy and never leaves the Bulls? Or did he need everything that happened in between? I think it's a little bit of both. I think there needed to be some upheaval. But I don't know if that would have happened with uh, Gar and Pax running the show. 
You know what I mean? Like, I think that was the biggest thing. And Fred Hoiberg on the sidelines. And no Jim Boylan wouldn't have brought this out of Jimmy Butler. <laughs> you got Pat Riley over there. You got Spolster. That's, an, those are, that's institutional knowledge. That's stability. And I don't know if the Bulls necessarily would have had that, you know what I mean, given where they were in 2017. They were trying to put things together and say, hey, maybe we can make a run with the three alphas and figure stuff out. But if you're telling me, do I trade Jimmy Butler in 2017? I told y'all then. I told y'all back in 2017 that it was it would come back to haunt the franchise and tell me I'm wrong. You don't appease the least talented amongst you. God bless them. They had they had a, some pretty good years there where they found the Luol Dangs. And, you, of course, you strike gold with Derrick Rose, and you find Jimmy Butler. But I felt like that time was up, and I felt like for an organization like the Bulls, we're talking about what they consider to be a golden standard. It's only a handful of franchises that won a bunch of championships during a modern NBA, and the Bulls are one of them, a worldwide franchise, which they, tell, which they used to tell us all the time, right? They used to say that. And my thing was, if you're like that, behave like that. You don't have to give in to the whims of people who can't deal with ego. Every player worth a damn has an ego, and especially if he's been grown inside your building. I know that he came with a headache. I know that he's an a-hole. I completely get that. <laughs> but you find a way, in my opinion, you find a way to grow with that, to, to give someone the real estate, to grow, mature, develop. You don't, you know, there's a saying that my parents have with each other. They've been married for like 40 years. And I asked my dad, how do you deal with my mother? so to speak. What's the key? And he said, sometimes you got to be a little bit blind and a little bit deaf. And I think that's how you have to behave when you have someone like that. You can't hear everything. You can't see everything, but you keep the task on winning with this player because this player is special.
Radio Station. With the seventh pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Chicago Sky select Angel Reese. So uh, just from a surface level standpoint, shout out all the fashion on not only the WNBA draftees, but the executives. That was fun. And Don Staley had on like this really cool uh, Louis Vuitton jacket. What well, that was the championship. Well, they outfit they call her Louis Vuitton Don, right? Like, I, can we just call her back? I, I want to go on the walk with her. I'll walk champ. I'll walk her dog champ. It's good. Yesterday we had a conversation with Annie about the fashion about the fashion at the WNBA draft and how the women are so far ahead of the men from a fashion standpoint. And one thing I learned yesterday, I learned that Prada had never outfit an NBA player before. And the fact that they outfit Caitlin Clark yesterday was a, was a certainly a, a very public choice on their part, and we detail the reasons why. Time for us to talk about one of the teams abuzz in this city, the Chicago Sky, with their general manager, Jeff Pagliaca. He is on Twitter, at Jeff Pagliaca, and he joins us on the Score Hotline, presented by Circus Sports Illinois. Download the Circus Sports app today, twitch.tv slash Chicago 670. The Score. Jeff, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show. Considering what's happened over the last couple of years where the Sky go from being a championship team to kind of restarting things, when you came in, how big of a job was this to try and get things corrected? Well, uh, as soon as free agency started, uh, you know, we realized we had to to pivot and uh, trade Kalia Copper. So, you know, once that happened um, and we were able to rebuild some draft capital from that trade and get some young players in, um, that was kind of the start of a, you know, a few moves that we made that put us in position, you know, for the draft a couple days ago. How competitive do you expect to be this season? We uh, plan on being extremely competitive. We have an extremely competitive coach. Uh, we have a core full of uh, competitive players, and we're bringing in, obviously, uh, quite a few that had a lot of success in the NCAA tournament and uh, kind of hangs their hat on being defensive players. I know we can at least ask you some questions now because when you were on NBC5 on Sports Sunday, you weren't able to answer. But trading up the day before the draft from 8 to 7 – there was a huge amount of people who wondered if that was to get Angel Reese. So now that it happened, what was the thought process? Were you ultimately drafted Angel Reese and you got the spot you wanted? Yeah, I think uh, our thought process was we wanted to be sure that we were in that top seven. Um, and there's a lot of good players there, but we, we got the target we were hoping for. I, I think uh, we know how fortunate we are that we had three players up on that board and making that move to seven, having three, seven, and 13, and landing everybody that we had hoped for, that we were, we were beyond thrilled and still are. What was it about Camilla that convinced you that she should be your first pick? I think um, to go along with the six, seven, uh, the athleticism and the speed, and the fact that she's been very successful against pros already, you know, playing overseas and a, a lot of the Brazilian stuff. Um, she's just, uh, she's a winner. She comes from a winning program, you know, looking at, you know, her characteristics as, as a basketball player, you know, she has great hands. She finishes a lot. She's a great defensive anchor, but just the fact that she can outrun players at her position, you know, you can, you can work with, with that very easily. And she, she has an amazing story. You know, we're, we're looking for people with real toughness here in Chicago and, and, you know, coming over to this country at, you know, 14, 15 years old without her family and getting to where she is today is that that's our type of person. Dan, Layla, and I have been talking about this as it pertains to Camilla, that one of the things that she does well as a big is she doesn't make herself small. When you see her in games in South Carolina, when she gets the ball in the post, the ball is held high. And I don't know, I mean, with your experience in basketball for all these years, if that's something that is innate to, to, to great bigs or is that something that can be taught? Because it's such an advantage, especially when you're six foot seven. 
Yeah, she doesn't play small, and I think that'll be one less thing for uh, Coach Spoon to yell at her about. She doesn't bring the ball down. You know, she turns with intention, and that's why I think she's such a great passer. I mean, and I think that's going to help us out a ton, too, having a big at that size uh, as a traditional five that can turn and find shooters. So her vision is good along with everything else. I know this is probably more of a question for ownership or upper upper management but considering the position that you're in and the fact that you happen to be the person we're interviewing how can the sky ensure that they are doing the same pro basketball business as the example setters right now in the WNBA when it comes to the quality of practice facilities when it comes to travel when it comes to accommodations and all the extra things how important is it to you that whether it's to free agents or anyone else, that you are selling a top-of-the-line, first-class WNBA experience? Yeah, it's super important to me, and it's super important to them. They went and got a, a Hall of Fame player as a coach. We built an incredible staff, uh, got everybody that we wanted. Um, we were in daily conversations about practice facilities. Uh, since I've taken the job, uh, I, I can tell you there, there's nothing that I've asked for that I haven't gotten for these players. So, you know, nothing from me on that end, but uh, positivity. You're known for being an established trainer of professional athletes, namely, namely basketball players. Is there something that you believe in on that side of it that you've seen really pay off? Maybe something that you really believe in, whether it's doing more cardio or preventing injuries. There's something that, that you think that uh, stands out to you as something that has really helped players that you've seen or is successful. Yeah, my background is in player development, and um, as a staff, uh, even as, with our head coach, you know, that is a majority of our backgrounds, and, you know, Coach and I came from, spent a lot of time with NBA players, so the details uh, and, the, and the player development and the intentionality that, that how we're going to grow their games and, and develop them and the speed that we think we can do that uh, versus maybe some other places is why we think we have a real weapon here in Chicago now. What what made you say I want to partner with Spoon? Um, well, I think we are fully aligned, you know, on a lot of things, and uh, you know, we are very attuned to uh, the importance of relationships, culture, uh, toughness. I, I think we both put uh, behavior and people in front of the basketball. And after our first conversation, when we met six months ago, I realized this is exactly who I wanted to work with because we, we saw people the same way, we saw basketball the same way, and uh, it's all about toughness and, and culture out here first, and she's driving that one. I heard her say it yesterday, and I heard her say that when asked about X's and O's and are they going to incorporate uh, some plays that are, are sets for the two bigs, whether it's high-low stuff or or, or side-to-side -side stuff, she said there will be time for that. The, the relationships are more important to her right now, and I'm, I'm still thinking X's and O's. And I'm wondering to the extent that when – as from a, through a development lens – do you mm -hmm. similarly look at the game as becoming positionless and the way the game is being spaced right now, the understanding of how three is more than two and, and coming to grips with it? Maybe you don't need a traditional point guard. You don't have the one through five positions as we currently know. Is that also an important part of envisioning where the women's game is going if it's not there already? Yeah, I think uh, we're looking for basketball players here. So, you know, depending on the situation, we want you to use your instincts and, and your common sense. Uh, you get a rebound and you could beat somebody, make a play for somebody else. We, we want you to do that. Uh, you want to be as positionless as possible because at any time, depending on where the, the, the clock is, you know, you want to be able to make a play. So, you know, we're going to give our players a ton of confidence and uh Spoon's the one for the job, for sure. How do you go about developing? Like, I saw Angel Reese taking NBA three-pointers, and her and Camilla combined for, what, five in, in college. How do you take what she already is, is a great player, a great pl a creator, and someone who can bang down low versus extending her out and finding out if she's going to be able to develop a three-point game? Yeah, I won't be surprised if uh, they, they both become good shooters over time. When, when you're at programs like they both came from, you know, you're, you're sacrificing 
every single day to, to win championships and to make it to final fours. And I think that's what we saw from them. They were, they were playing their roles. And as a professional, that's what you come and do. You know, you come in and, and you play your role. And now we want them to evolve in those roles. And we want them, the better shooters they become, you know, the better team will be. We, we want them to, to become good shooters. So those are things that we're going to hit immediately, you know, when they get into Chicago. I saw your quote about Brenda Maxwell, who you guys picked at 13th overall out of Gonzaga, that you believe she's the best shooter in the nation. Why do you believe that? And what more can you tell us about why you wanted her on the sky? Yeah, I'm, I'm sticking to that one. Um, we, we've been watching her for, for a long time. Um, there's not a lot of players that can shoot the ball as quickly as she can shoot it um, under as much stress as she shot it. Uh, Long closeouts uh, and one threes on the move. She has a lot of creativity as a shooter. She's not just a catch and shoot. Um, and she hunts shots. You know, she wants to take big ones. She helped her team go very far in the NCAA tournament. And, you know, look, shooting will always be at a premium, especially, you know, where we're at right now with basketball. So, you know, drafting, you know, two front court players, you know, the, the need became making sure we had a specialist. And uh, I feel very strongly that that we got somebody very, very special there. Jeff, as much as you're willing to share, how hard has the road been back for Diamond the Shields? I think Diamond has been through a ton, uh, even before, right, these these last couple seasons with, with some injuries. Obviously, she went through a lot, you know, during her tenure with the Sky initially here. I saw her an hour ago. Uh, she was moving great. Um She's always in good spirits. Uh, she's she's kind of reborn now. And, uh, you know, after uh, the draft, you know, we went downstairs to meet with the fans. And uh, when they saw her, uh, I mean, you, you, you couldn't hear a thing because of the applause, you know. Yeah, I, I was trying to get some words out, but they were screaming and clapping for diamonds. So, you know, it's just an unbelievable, inspirational story. And uh, she's somebody we want here, you know, to, to make sure she can keep mentoring a lot of the new ones coming in about, uh, look, the game could be taken away from you and, and you could still fight back and be great again. Well, one of the things about her that was so special is obviously coming from the, 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 a great athletic family, but she was one of those players that you go, she's got crazy athleticism. Is she close to being back to that or, or does she have to change the player that she is now because of everything she's gone through? That's a great question. Um, you'll see uh, probably even a better athletic version of uh, Diamond the Shields. She's stronger. She's faster now. You know, her body is healthy. And we're moving her along very slowly. You know, she is uh, in a great place right now. But, you know, we're, we're in no rush because uh, we want her to be very, very comfortable, you know, when, when the games start. What was that conversation like trying to – recruit Diamond back and, and the discussion about her finding a place that she's she's familiar with and, and you have that role idea for her? Well, you know, I, I started here in my role. Um, they, they hired me to train Diamond. And, you know, now that I came back and, you know, accepted the role as general manager, that was one of the first players I went to go get. You know, when I when I knew she was a free agent, you know, she's a big part of my story. And uh, I, I just know how inspirational she is to this city. And she kind of fits the culture, you know, of, of what we're trying to do here. Super tough and uh, just relentless fight. Lastly, for me, when you talk from a developmental perspective, and I know this is now a player on another team, and I'm not asking for a, a specific opinion about Caitlin sure. Clark, but we talk about the influence and the impact that she's going to have. That when we talk about six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds, like when at some point we are going to get the next wave of young players who want to be like what the the next Steph Curry and that idea was of being, hey, I'm going to shoot it from anywhere because that's what I can do. I've seen somebody do it and I can do it. What would you advise somebody who is maybe coaching a young player at this point? Is like, I want to be like this and I'm going to pull up from the logo and I'm going to learn how to shoot it. Is that something you want to encourage a young player to do and say, well, if you can do it, do it? Or do you want to wait until there's certain physical development where you don't learn bad habits trying to, to, to launch some of those shots? Yeah, I think Steph Curry started a few years ago. Um, I, I I don't know what to say on this one. I think you got to listen to your coach. You know, I know we're going to listen to ours, 
But at, at that young age, I mean, it's just, uh, the Caitlin Clarks, the world are inspiring, uh, incredible, you know, amounts of, of young boys, young girls, you know, to go chase their dreams. And to me, you know, that's the much bigger point is that you're going to get some people that really want to cultivate their games and, and try to get to where she is, you know, because the visibility is, is, has shown that, you know, you work really hard and, and you can be really good. You know, so to me, like I watch as a fan. You know, I know, you know, a lot of people I know watch as fans. I mean, she's done incredible things for the game. Um, we're moving into this moment right now in, uh, in women's basketball, you know, especially in the WNBA. And it's driven by people like Angel, by people like Caitlin Clark. And uh, I think it's just going to keep opening doors for, for kids to want to wanna be great basketball players. Well, speaking of open doors and whatnot, it seems like the, the game on June 23rd is already sold out. I know some people were petitioning you guys to move it to the United Center, but logistics matter. There might be concerts or whatever at the UC. Right. Is something like that even possible for you guys to do? I'm not sure if it's possible this year, but yes, I've uh, gotten a few of those emails as well. You know, I, I, I think it's going to be uh, quite a year, you know, for, for the sky, for the whole WNBA. We can't wait. All right. That's outstanding. Jeff, thanks for your time, man. We appreciate it. Guys, the best. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Jeff Pagliaca, general manager of the Chicago Sky. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of concerts at the United Center when the winter tenants are gone. I think there is one that day. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised. They do a lot of country music stuff over there. Like, you never know when, you know, who, whoever's going to be in town. But I'm looking it up to see. What, what it tells you is that there is a demand for this. And it's like, how do you leave that money on the table? And Wintrust isn't a small venue. It holds 10,000. I thought it's, it's, that's about perfect for generally what you need. A hundred percent. It's just right. Yeah. And it doesn't. What does the pavilion hold? Eight? Yeah. Eight and a half? I think maybe seven. Because they redid it. I don't know if they lost seats. And, and like the college venues in town, you, you, they're way too small. That weekend, it's Justin Timberlake on Friday yeah. and Saturday, and then Russ on the 23rd. Yeah, so. So that's kind of a hopping weekend there at the old UC. Yeah, so you can't move the game Jada there. Jackson is Wednesday, June 19th. I mean, you could get creative. They're probably not using Soldier Field on June 23rd. You can't play an outdoor. Why can't you? Caitlin already played an outdoor game. Yeah, you'd rather not with the wind and everything. You know, I understand that, but they had 60,000 show for Iowa DePaul earlier this year. And Usher is three nights at the UC, October 28th, Usher, 29th, Usher, and 31st. Usher, Usher. That's all. So I think we actually have a, a regular-ass segment next because Usher, of Usher. the baseball coming up, correct? Yeah, I have to go, though. Okay, well, you have a job. That's okay. Bye. 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 See you Friday. This is Mark Grody with your draft spotlight on the score. The Bears are pretty set at safety with Jaquan Brisker and Kevin Byer, but Miami's Cam Kitchens has had his eye on the Bears since the combine because of his relationship with the departed Eddie Jackson. Asked him all the details, you know, loopholes to the NFL, so great player. Kitchens is mostly projected as a second rounder, which the Bears do not have as of now. This draft spotlight is presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago. Chicago Bears. We ask you. We have a caller, and then I'll introduce him. And then whenever you find anything that this caller says to maybe be objectionable, mm. we want you to just insult them and yell at them and get him off the air as quickly as you All can. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know if I can do that as well as my dad because I'm not that mean. It, it's, well, that's fine. <laughs> it's your, but it's your, it's your first time. All right. Now, the caller's name is Tom in Orland Park, but for the purposes okay. of this conversation, it's Bob in Orland Park. Okay. Bob. We're gonna, so, so Bob in Orland Park, you're on the score. Yeah, guys, uh, with this Bears uh, getting the number two pick, they need to hear, – hear me out. They need to keep Justin Field, but then they need to also get this C.J. Stroud kid and you load up the quarterback to have two of them. You need two quarterbacks no. in the NFL. No, so no. Have Field no, you and don't. Stroud. No, and first of all, his name is C.J. Stroud. I don't know. It's not like a strudel. Stroud. Um. <laughs> Uh, it's, C it's CJ. It's CJ Stroud. Mm. Second of all, that I feel like that's implying that you want Justin Fields to be a running back, and um, they don't need two quarterbacks. Actually, Trevor Simeon is a serviceable backup. 
you don't need two quarterbacks. Get if Will if you trade down one and get a bunch of capital, even even if you don't, and you get Will Anderson, who is basically Miles Garrett. Now insult take, Bob. Take him. <laughs> insult take him. him. Meaner. 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 Insult him. <laughs> say something don't, about his kids. Don't ever say that again. Yeah, uh, there we go. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Sports Radio, 670 The Score. You want some Cubs tickets? You can have them. If you're caller six to the contest line, 312-540-0670, right now you'll win a pair of tickets to see the Cubs take on the Marlins at Wrigley Field this Sunday, April 21st, 120, first pitch. 
And join the score in Budweiser Thursday, May 2nd at Harry Carey's Tavern Navy Pier for the 26th annual Worldwide Toast to Harry Carey. Parkins and Spiegel will be there broadcasting live from 4 to 7 p.m. with actor and comedian Jason Alexander leading the toast at 5.30. The Worldwide Toast to Harry Carey is brought to you by Budweiser. This Bud's for you. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic about this, but shouldn't the Jonte Porter story be kind of leading every national sports thing? Well, what Aaron Rodgers would say, it's a conspiracy because every national sports thing knows who's paying them most of their money right now. And maybe the leagues and the gambling houses and everybody else don't want to know. The guy has just been banned from the NBA for life, for life with no chance of reinstatement. NWA? The NWO. NWO, sorry, not NWA. For life. Like this this is the thing that everyone in sports at the highest level had always feared. That you start thinking about some of the point shaving scandals that we've seen that you worry if they can crush a sport. Now it's not gonna crush the NBA. The NBA is gonna still continue to print money, but if enough of this stuff happens, and I think that's why this serves as a, I think that Adam Silver is looking at this as like, this is this is how serious it is. Like, this isn't like the guys in Detroit in the NFL where I was placing a bet on college football, but I happened to be on campus. Therefore, I have to be suspended six games. This is a guy actively shaving, actively making his trying to make his team lose and betting that his team would lose. You have to go to famous collegiate scandals. This goes all the way back to CCNY. This is what I was thinking about. This goes back to CCNY in the 50s. And off the top of my head, there were two involving Northwestern sports. There was the the fumbling on purpose by Dennis Lundy and others, and there was also the Northwestern basketball point-shaving scandal. I want to say, of, of, of coincidentally, Tulane had one in the 1980s when they were getting good with Hot Rod. John Hot Rod Williams was there, and I believe that there was there was found to be at least enough suspicion of point shaving. Uh, this is well beyond the whole Tim Donahue concern about having a dirty referee. The the NBA just banned a guy for life. Yes. Can I read you the if you let's take Adam Silver at his own words here? Yeah, yeah. The the release that was sent out by the NBA. So like. Just so you know, like I wasn't saying that anyone's trying to hide it, and the NBA clearly wasn't. They they put a full-throated statement out earlier this morning once the decision had, had been rendered. A league investigation found that Porter violated league rules by disclosing confidential information to sports bettors, limiting his own participation in one or more games for betting purposes, and betting on NBA games. The league's investigation found that prior to the Raptors' March 20th game, Porter disclosed confidential information about his own health to an individual he knew to be an NBA better. Another individual with whom Porter associated and knew to be an NBA better subsequently placed an $80,000 parlay proposition bet with an online sportsbook to win $1.1 million, wagering that Porter would underperform in that game. The league's investigation also found that Porter limited his own game participation to influence the outcome of one or more bets on his performance in at least one Raptors game. In the March 20th game, Porter played only three minutes, claiming that he felt ill. Due to the unusual betting activity wow. and actions of the player, the $80,000 proposition bet was frozen and was not paid out. In addition, from January through March 20 of 24 when traveling, or March 2024 when traveling with the Raptors or Raptors 905, the Raptors NBA G League affiliate, Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games using an associate's online betting account. The bets ranged in size from $15 to $22,000 for a total of $54,094. The total payout was $76,059, resulting in net winnings of $21,965. None of the bets involved any game in which Porter played. Three of the bets were multi-game parlay bets that included one Raptors game in which Porter bet that the Raptors would lose. All three bets lost. Wow, the suspicious bets 
were brought to the NBA's attention by licensed sports betting operators and an organization that monitors legal betting markets. Okay, so that's good. That there are some guardrails up that that went into place. Like, wait, what's going on? How much is being dropped on this guy, this fringe NBA player? Why is there so much money on his props? And these are the ones they're worried about. The incentivization for someone who doesn't make a lot of money and doesn't play very much. That's where that dangerous cohort might be. Here's the quote from Adam Silver. There's nothing more important than protecting the integrity of NBA competition for our fans, our teams, and everyone associated with our sport, which is why Jonte Porter's blatant violations of our gaming rules are being met with the most severe punishment. While legal sports betting creates transparency that helps identify suspicious or abnormal activity, this matter also raises important issues about the sufficiency of the regulatory framework currently in place, including the types of bets offered on our games and players. Working closely with all relevant stakeholders across the industry, we will continue to work diligently to safeguard our league and game. This is part of the reason why there's been a movement to get rid of props in college basketball that why don't you take some of the temptation out of it but this feels like it should be a big thing like this is a like i wonder in in pregame tonight is billy donovan asked about this like that sort of thing and other leagues, too. That's why we asked Florio and why Florio was smart enough to write about what the NFL ramifications are. All these commissioners should be on a conference call right now because the other sports are saying, glad it was the NBA. Wasn't us. As far as you know. As far as you know. Shohei. Right. Like, think the two biggest stories that we've had over the last couple of weeks have been what's going on with Shohei and this. That's terrifying. In one case, you have either a player being involved in sports betting and racking up a giant debt, or what it seems to look like is a player being taken advantage of because of sports betting. And in the case of Jonte Porter, You've got a guy whose brother is rich as hell. That's a, I was just looking up uh, Michael Porter Jr. while Mike, you were talking. Michael Porter yeah. Jr.'s made over like 120 million, right? In his career. And and you have a guy that that makes it to the league and he feels it necessary to do this. It's I don't know what they do just because and and we're involved when we do fan duel. We, we work with betting operations as well. If you're the NBA and that money is coming into your league and it's been good for your league, how do you separate that from the players? I, I don't know, but this, I hope that if there are other people around the league that are even messing around with this, that maybe it'll, I hope that they're not thinking it won't be me. Because it could definitely be you, especially if you're not doing it in a in a well-crafted way. And clearly, Jonte Porter was not. Well, what I would like to see, too, is some sort of standardization, either with FIBA as a part of it or other basketball entities, where Jonte Porter's like, fine, I can't play in the NBA. I'll go play in Greece or I'll go play in China. And there's bets taken on those games as well. 100%. Thanks, too. A great slate of guests today. Don Staley, Mike Florio, Nick Friedel, and Jeff Pagliaca. Thanks to Layla for her availability on Wednesdays. As always, Ray Diaz, Adam Studzinski, Brandon Fryer, Kevin Lapka, Connor O'Donnell for all of their help. Cubs baseball is next. Broadcasting live from the Hyundai Studios. Presented by your local Hyundai dealers. This is Chicago's number one and most listened to sports station. 670 The Score is Chicago Sports. Chicago Sports is The Score. WSCR Chicago. WBMX HD2 Chicago. Always live on the free Odyssey app. The Score! Pros save big every day when you buy in bulk at Lowe's.